Section 1 of the French Revolution, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The French Revolution, A History, Volume 2 by Thomas Carlyle. The Constitution. Mauern sich gestutzt und mauern sich errichtet. Hier Gefangene, dort auch der Gefangenen viel. Ist vielleicht nur die Welt ein großer Kerker? Und frei ist wohl der Tolle, der sich Ketten zu Grenzen erkiest? Goethe. Book 2.1 The Feast of Pikes Chapter 2.1 1 In the Tuileries The victim, having once got his stroke of grace, the catastrophe can be considered as almost come. There is small interest now in watching his long, low moans. Notable only are his sharper agonies, what convulsive struggles he may take to cast the torture off from him, and then finally the last departure of life itself, and how he lies extinct and ended either wrapped like Caesar in decorous mantle folds, or unseemly sunk together, like one that had not the force even to die. Was French royalty, when wrenched forth from its tapestries in that fashion, on that 6th of October, 1789, such a victim? Universal France and royal proclamation to all the provinces answers anxiously, no. Nevertheless, one may fear the worst. Royalty was beforehand so decrepit, moribund, that there is little life in it to heal an injury. How much of its strength, which was of the imagination merely, has fled, rascality having looked plainly in the king's face, and not died. When the assembled crows can pluck up their scarecrow and say to it, Here shalt thou stand, and not there, and can treat it and make it from an infinite and quite finite, constitutional scarecrow, what is to be looked for? Not in the finite constitutional scarecrow, but in what still unmeasured, infinite seeming force may rally round it, is there thenceforth any hope? For it is most true that all available authority is mystic in its conditions, and comes by the grace of God. Cheerfuller than watching the death struggles of royalism will it be to watch the growth and gamblings of sansculottism. For in human things, especially in human society, all death is but a death birth. Thus, if the sceptre is departing from Louis, it is only that, in other forms, other sceptres, were it even pike sceptres, may bear sway. In a prurient element, rich with nutritive influences, we shall find that sansculottism grows lustily and even frisks in not ungraceful sport, as indeed most young creatures are sportful. Nay, may it not be noted further that as the grown cat, and cat species generally, is the cruelest thing known, so the merriest is precisely the kitten, or growing cat. But fancy the royal family risen from its truckle beds on the morrow of that mad day. Fancy the municipal inquiry, how would your majesty please to lodge? And then that the king's rough answer, each may lodge as he can, I am well enough, is congeed and bowed away in expressive grins by the town hall functionaries, with obsequious upholsterers at their back. And how the chateau of the Tuileries is repainted, garnished into a golden royal residence, and Lafayette with his blue national guards lies encompassing it, as blue Neptune, in the language of poets, does an island wooingly. Thither may the wrecks of rehabilitated loyalty gather, if it will become constitutional, for constitutionalism thinks no evil. Sansculottism itself rejoices in the king's countenance, the rubbish of a monadic insurrection, as in this ever-kindly world, all rubbish can and must be, is swept aside. And so again, on clear arena, under new conditions, with something even of a new stateliness, we begin a new course of action. 
Arthur Young has witnessed the strangest scene, majesty walking unattended in the Tuileries gardens, and miscellaneous trickler crowds who cheer it and reverently make way for it. The very queen commands at lowest respectful silence, regretful avoidance. Simple ducks in those royal waters quackle for crumbs from young royal fingers. The little dauphin has a little railed garden where he is seen delving with ruddy cheeks and flaxen curled hair, also a little hutch to put his tools in and screen himself against showers. What peaceable simplicity! Is it peace of a father restored to his children, or of a taskmaster who has lost his whip? Lafayette and the municipality and universal constitutionalism assert the former, and do what is in them to realise it. Such patriotism as snarls dangerously and shows teeth, patrolitism shall suppress, or far better, royalty shall soothe down the angry hair of it by gentle pattings, and most effectual of all, by fuller diet. Yes, not only shall Paris be fed, but the king's hand be seen in that work. The household goods of the poor shall, up to a certain amount, by royal bounty, be disengaged from pawn, and that insatiable mont de piété, disgorge, rides in the city with her vive le roi, need not fail, and so, by substance and show, shall royalty, if man's art can popularise it, be popularised. Or alas, is it neither restored father nor diswhipped taskmaster that walks there, but an anomalous complex of both these? and of innumerable other heterogeneities, reducible to no rubric, if not to this newly devised one, King Louis, restorer of French liberty. Man, indeed, and King Louis, like other men, lives in this world to make rule out of the ruleless. By his living energy, he shall force the absurd itself to become less absurd. But then, if there be no living energy, Living passivity only? King Serpent, hurled into his unexpected watery dominion, did at least bite, and assert credibly that he was there. But as for the poor king Log, tumbled hither and thither as thousandfold chance and other will than his might direct, how happy for him that he was indeed wooden, and doing nothing, could also see and suffer nothing. It is a distracted business. For his French majesty, meanwhile, one of the worst things is that he can get no hunting. Alas, no hunting henceforth, only a fatal being hunted. Scarcely in the next June weeks shall he taste again the joys of the game destroyer. In next June, and never more. He sends for his smith tools, gives in the course of the day, official or ceremonial business being ended, a few strokes of the file. Coup de lime. Innocent brother mortal, why wert thou not an obscure substantial maker of locks, but doomed in that other far-seen craft to be a maker only of world follies, unrealities, things self-destructive which no mortal hammering could rivet into coherence? Poor Louis is not without insight, nor even without the elements of will, some sharpness of temper, spurting at times from a stagnating character. If harmless inertness could save him, it were well. But he will slumber and painfully dream, and to do aught is not given him. Royalist antiquarians still show the rooms where majesty and sweet, in these extraordinary circumstances, had their lodging. Here sat the queen, reading, for she had her library brought hither, though the king refused his taking vehement counsel of the vehement uncounselled, sorrowing over altered times, yet with sure hope of better, in her young rosy boy, has she not the living emblem of hope? It is a murky working sky, yet with golden gleams, of dawn or of deeper meteoric night. Here again this chamber, on the other side of the main entrance, was the king's. Here his majesty breakfasted and did official work. Here daily after breakfast he received the queen, sometimes in pathetic friendliness, sometimes in human sulkiness, for flesh is weak. 
and when questioned about business would answer, Madam, your business is with the children. Nay, sire, were it not better you, your majesty's self, took the children? So asks impartial history, scornful that the thicker vessel was not also the stronger, pity struck for the porcelain clay of humanity rather than for the tile clay, though indeed both were broken. So, however, in this Medician Tuileries shall the French king and queen now sit for one and forty months, and see a wild fermenting France work out its own destiny and theirs. Months bleak, ungenial, of rapid vicissitude, yet with a mild pale splendour here and there, as of an April that were leading to leafiest summer, as of an October that led only to everlasting frost. Medician Twillery, how changed since it was a peaceful tile field, or is the ground itself fate stricken, accursed, and Atreus's palace? For that Louvre window is still nigh, out of which a capet, whipped of the Furies, fired his signal of the Saint Bartholomew. Dark is the way of the Eternal, as mirrored in this world of time. God's way is in the sea, and his path in the great deep. End of section one. Section two of the French Revolution, volume two, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.12 In the Salle de Manege To believing patriots, however, it is now clear that the Constitution will march, marché, had it once legs to stand on. Quick then, you patriots, bestir yourselves and make it, shape legs for it. In the Archeveche, or Archbishop's Palace, his grace himself having fled, and afterwards in the riding hall, named Manege, close on the Tuileries, there does a National Assembly apply itself to the miraculous work. Successfully, had there been any heaven-scaling Prometheus among them, not successfully, since there was none. There, in noisy debate, for the sessions are occasionally scandalous, and as many as three speakers have been seen in the tribune at once, let us continue to fancy it wearing the slow months. Tough, dogmatic, long of wind is Abbe Maury. Ciceronian pathetic is Casales. Keen trenchant on the other side glitters a young Barnave, abhorrent of sophistry, shearing like keen Damascus sabre, all sophistry asunder. Reckless, what else he shear with it? Simple seemest thou, O solid Dutch-built pétion, if solid, surely dull, nor life-giving in that tone of thine, livelier polemical rabble, with ineffable serenity, sniffs great say yes, aloft, alone. His constitution ye may babble over, ye may mar, but can by no possibility mend. Is not polity a science he has exhausted? Cool, slow, Two military lamets are visible, with their quality sneer or demi-sneer. They shall gallantly refund their mother's pension when the red book is produced, gallantly be wounded in duels. A marquis to Longjean, whose pen, we yet thank, sits there, in stoical meditative humour, oftenest silent, accepts what destiny will send. Touré and parliamentary du port produce mountains of reformed law, liberal, anglomaniac, available and unavailable. Mortals rise and fall. Shall Goose Gobel, for example, or Goebel, for he is of Strasbourg German breed, be a constitutional archbishop? Alone of all men there, Mirabeau may begin to discern clearly whether all this is tending. Patriotism, accordingly, regrets that his zeal seems to be getting cool. In that famed Pentecost night of the 4th of August, when new faith rose suddenly into miraculous fire and old feudality was burnt up, men remarked that Mirabeau took no hand in it, that, in fact, he luckily happened to be absent. But did he not defend the veto, 
nay, veto absolu, and tell vehement Barnave that six hundred irresponsible senators would make of all tyrannies the insupportablest? Again, how anxious was he that the king's ministers should have seat and voice in the National Assembly, doubtless with an eye to being minister himself? Whereupon the National Assembly decides, what is very momentous, that no deputy shall be minister. He, in his haughty, stormful manner, advising us to make it no deputy called Mirabeau. A man of perhaps inveterate feudalisms, of stratagems, too often visible leanings towards the royalist side, a man suspect whom patriotism will unmask. Thus, in these June days, when the question, who shall have right to declare war, comes on, you hear hoarse hawkers sound dolefully through the streets, Grand treason of Count Mirabeau, price only one sou, because he pleads that it shall be not the assembly, but the king. Pleads, nay, prevails, for in spite of the hoarse hawkers and an endless populace raised by them to the pitch even of lanterne, he mounts the tribune next day, grim resolute, murmuring aside to his friends that speak of danger, I know it, I must come hence either in triumph or else torn in fragments. And it was in triumph that he came. A man of stout heart, whose popularity is not of the populace, pas populaciere, whom no clamour of unwashed mobs without walls, or of washed mobs within, can scarce from his way. Dumont remembered hearing him deliver a report on Marseille. Every word was interrupted on the part of the côté droit by abusive epithets. Calumniator, liar, assassin, scoundrel, scélérat. Mirabeau pauses a moment, and, in a honeyed tone, addressing the most furious, says, I wait, monsieur, till these amenities be exhausted. A man enigmatic, difficult to unmask. For example, whence comes his money? Can the profit of a newspaper, sorely eaten into by Dame Leger, can this and the eighteen francs a day your national deputy has, be supposed equal to this expenditure? House in the Chaussée d'Antin, country house at Argenteuil. Splendours, sumptuosities, orgies, living as if he had a mint. All saloons barred against adventurer Mirabeau are flung wide open to King Mirabeau, the cynosure of Europe, whom female France flutters to behold, though the man Mirabeau is one and the same. As for money, one may conjecture that royalism furnishes it which, if royalism do, will not the same be welcome, as money always is to him. Sold, whatever patriotism thinks, he cannot readily be. The spiritual fire which is in that man, which, shining through such confusions, is nevertheless conviction, and makes him strong, and without which he had no strength, is not buyable nor saleable. In such transference of barter, it would vanish and not be. Perhaps paid and not sold, payé pas vendu, as poor Rivarol, in the unhappier converse way calls himself, sold and not paid. A man travelling comet-like, in splendour and nebulosity, his wild way, whom telescopic patriotism may long watch, but without higher mathematics will not make out. A questionable, most blamable man, yet to us the far notablest of all. With rich munificence, as we often say, in a most blinkered, bespectacled, logic-chopping generation, nature has gifted this man with an eye. Welcome is his word, there where he speaks and works, and growing ever welcomer, for it alone goes to the heart of the business. Logical cobwebbery shrinks itself together, and thou seest a thing. How it is, how it may be worked with. Unhappily, our National Assembly has much to do, a France to regenerate, and France is short of so many requisites, short even of cash. These same finances give trouble enough, no choking of the deficit, which gapes ever, give, give. To appease the deficit, we venture on a hazardous step, sale of the clergy's lands, 
and superfluous edifices, most hazardous. Nay, given the sale, who is to buy them, ready money having fled? Wherefore, on the 19th day of December, a paper money of Assigna, of bonds secured or assigned, on that clerico national property, and unquestionable at least in payment of that, is decreed, the first of a long series of like financial performances which shall astonish mankind, so that now, while old rags last, there shall be no lack of circulating medium, whether of commodities to circulate thereon is another question. But after all, does not this assignat business speak volumes for modern science? Bankruptcy, we may say, was come, as the end of all delusions needs must come. Yet how gently, in softening diffusion, in mild succession, was it hereby made to fall, like no all-destroying avalanche, like gentle showers of a powdery impalpable snow, shower after shower, till all was indeed buried, and yet little was destroyed that could not be replaced, be dispensed with. To such length has modern machinery reached. Bankruptcy, we said, was great, but indeed money itself is a standing miracle. On the whole, it is a matter of endless difficulty, that of the clergy. Clerical property may be made the nations, and the clergy hired servants of the state. But if so, is it not an altered church? Adjustment enough of the most confused sort has become unavoidable. Old landmarks in any sense avail not in a new France. Nay, literally, the very ground is new divided. Your old party-coloured provinces become new uniform departments, 83 in number, whereby, as in some sudden shifting of the earth's axis, no mortal knows his new latitude at once. The twelve old parliaments, too, what is to be done with them? The old parliaments are declared to be all in permanent vacation till once the new equal justice of departmental courts, national appeal courts, of elective justices, justices of peace, and other Touré and Dupont apparatus be got ready. They have to sit there, these old parliaments, uneasily waiting, as it were, with the rope round their neck, crying as they can, Is there none to deliver us? But happily, the answer being, None, none. They are a manageable class, these parliaments. They can be bullied, even into silence. The Paris Parliament, wiser than most, has never whimpered. They will and must sit there, in such vacation as is fit. Their chamber of vacation distributes in the interim what little justice is going. With the rope round their neck, their destiny may be succinct. On the 13th of November, 1790, Mayor Bailly shall walk to the Palais de Justice, few even heeding him, and with municipal seal stamp and a little hot wax, seal up the parliamentary paper rooms, and the dread Parliament of Paris pass away into chaos, gently as does a dream. So shall the Parliaments perish, succinctly, and innumerable eyes be dry. Not so the clergy, for granting even that religion were dead, that it had died half centuries ago with unutterable Dubois, or emigrated lately to Alsace with necklace Cardinal Rolland, or that it now walked as goblin Revenant with Bishop Talleyrand of Autun. Yet does not the shadow of religion, the cant of religion, still linger? The clergy have means and material, means of number, organisation, social weight, a material at lowest of public ignorance, known to be the mother of devotion. Nay, withal, is it incredible that there might, in simple hearts, latent here and there like gold grains in the mud beach, still dwell some real faith in God, of so singular and tenacious a sort, that even a Maury or a Talleyrand could still be the symbol for it. Enough, and clergy has strength, the clergy has craft and indignation. It is a most fatal business, this of the clergy, a weltering hydrocoil, which the National Assembly has stirred up about its ears, hissing, stinging, which cannot be appeased alive, which cannot be trampled dead. Fatal from first to last, 
scarcely after fifteen months debating can a civil constitution of the clergy be so much as got to paper and then forgetting it into reality alas such civil constitution is but an agreement to disagree it divides france from end to end with a new split infinitely complicating all the other splits catholicism what of it there is left with the cant of catholicism raging on the one side and sceptic heathenism on the other both by contradiction waxing fanatic what endless jarring of refractory hated priests and constitutional despised ones of tender consciences like the king's and consciences hot seared like certain of his peoples the whole to end in feasts of reason and a war of la vendee so deep-seated is religion in the heart of man and holds of all infinite passions if the dead echo of it still did so much what could not the living voice of it once do finance and constitution law and gospel this surely were work enough yet this is not all in fact the ministry and necker himself whom a brass inscription fastened by the people over his door lintel testifies to be the ministre adoré are dwindling into clearer and clearer nullity execution or legislation arrangement or detail from their nerveless fingers all drops undone all lights at last on the toiled shoulders of an august representative body heavy laden national assembly it has to hear of innumerable fresh revolts brigand expeditions of chateau in the west especially of charter chests chartiers set on fire for there too the overloaded ass frightfully recalcitrates of cities in the south full of heats and jealousies which will end in crossed sabres marseilles against toulon and carpentras beleaguered by avignon such royalist collision in a career of freedom nay patriot collision which a mere difference of velocity will bring about of a jourdain coup de tête who has skulked thitherward from the claws of the chatelet and will raise whole scoundrel regiments also it has to hear of royalist camp of jalus jalus mountain girdled plain amid the rocks of the cevennes whence royalism as is feared and hoped may dash down like a mountain deluge and submerge france a singular thing this camp of jalus existing mostly on paper for the soldiers at jalus being peasants or national guards were in heart sworn sans culotte and all that the royalist captains could do was with false words to keep them or rather keep the report of them drawn up there visible to all imaginations for a terror and a sign if peradventure france might be reconquered by theatrical machinery by the picture of a royalist army done to the life not till the third summer was this portent burning out by fits and then fading got finally extinguished was the old castle of jalus no camp being visible to the bodily eye got blown asunder by some national guards also it has to hear not only of brissot and his friends of the blacks but by and by of a whole st domingo blazing skyward blazing in literal fire and in far worse metaphorical beaconing the nightly main also of the shipping interest and the landed interest and all manner of interests reduced to distress of industry everywhere manacled bewildered and only rebellion thriving of sub-officers soldiers and sailors in mutiny by land and water of soldiers at nancy as we shall see needing to be cannonaded by a brave bouillie of sailors nay the very galley slaves at brest needing also to be cannonaded but with no bouillie to do it for indeed to say it in a word in those days there was no king in israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes such things has an august national assembly to hear of as it goes on regenerating france sad and stern but what remedy 
Get the constitution ready, and all men will swear to it. For do not addresses of adhesion arrive by the cartload? In this manner, by heaven's blessing, and a constitution got ready, shall the bottomless fire gulf be vaulted in with rag paper, and order will wed freedom and live with her there till it grow too hot for them. O Cote Gauche, worthy are ye, as the adhesive addresses generally say, to fix the regards of the universe, the regards of this one poor planet at lowest. Nay, it must be owned, the Cote Droit makes a still madder figure, an irrational generation, irrational, imbecile, and with the vehement obstinacy characteristic of that, a generation which will not learn. Falling Bastille, insurrections of women, thousands of smoking manor houses, a country bristling with no crop but that of sans culottic steel, these were tolerably didactic lessons, but them they have not taught. There are still men of whom it was of old written, bray them in a mortar, or in milder language, they have wedded their delusions. Fire nor steel, nor any sharpness of experience, shall sever the bond, till death do us part. Of such may the heavens have mercy, for the earth, with her rigorous necessity, will have none. Admit at the same time that it was most natural. Man lives by hope. Pandora, when her box of God's gifts flew all out and became God's curses, still retained hope. How shall an irrational mortal, when his high place is never so evidently pulled down, and he, being irrational, is left resourceless, part with the belief that it will be rebuilt? It would make all so straight again. It seems so unspeakably desirable, so reasonable. Would you but look at it aright? For must not the thing that was continue to be, or else the solid world dissolve? Yes, persist, O oh infatuated sans culotte of France, revolt against constituted authorities, hunt out your rightful seigneur, who at bottom so loved you, and readily shed their blood for you, in countries' battles, as at Rosbach and elsewhere, and even in preserving game, were preserving you, could ye but have understood it. Hunt them out, as if they were wild wolves, set fire to their chateau and chatier, as to wolf dens. And what then? Why then turn every man his hand against his fellow? In confusion, famine, desolation, regret the days that are gone. Rueful recall them, recall us with them. To repentant prayers we will not be deaf. So, with dimmer or clearer consciousness, must the right side reason and act. An inevitable position, perhaps, but a most false one for them. Evil, be thou our good. This henceforth must virtually be their prayer. The fiercer the effervescence grows, the sooner will it pass. For after all, it is but some mad effervescence. The world is solid and cannot dissolve. For the rest, if they have any positive industry, it is that of plots and backstairs conclaves, plots which cannot be executed, which are mostly theoretic on their part, for which nevertheless this and the other practical Sieur Auger, Sieur Meillebois, Sieur Bon Savardin, gets into trouble, gets imprisoned, and escapes with difficulty. Nay, there is a poor practical Chevalier Favras, who, not without some passing reflex on Monsieur himself, gets hanged for them amid loud uproar of the world. Poor Favras, he keeps dictating his last will at the Hôtel de Ville through the whole remainder of the day, a weary February day, offers to reveal secrets if they will save him, handsomely declines since they will not, then dies in the flare of torchlight with politest composure remarking rather than exclaiming, with outspread hands, People, I die innocent, pray for me. Poor Favras, type of so much that has prowled indefatigable over France, in days now ending, and in freer field might have earned instead of prowling. To thee it is no theory. In the Senate House again, the attitude of the right side 
is that of calm unbelief. Let an august National Assembly make a 4th of August abolition of feudality, declare the clergy state servants who shall have wages, vote suspensive vetoes, new law courts, vote or decree what contested thing it will, have it responded to from the four corners of France, nay get king's sanction, and what other acceptance were conceivable, the right side, as we find, persists, with imperturbablest tenacity, in considering, and ever and anon shows that it still considers, all these so-called decrees as mere temporary whims, which indeed stand on paper, but in practice and fact are not, and cannot be. Figure the brass head of an Abbe Maury flooding forth Jesuitic eloquence in this strain. Dusky Despremenil, Barre, Mirabeau, probably in liquor, and enough of others cheering him from the right, and, for example, with what visage a sea-green Robespierre eyes him from the left, and how say yes ineffably sniffs on him, or does not deign to sniff, and how the galleries drone in spirit, or bark rabid on him, so that to escape the lanterne on stepping forth he needs presence of mind and a pair of pistols in his girdle, for he is one of the toughest of men. Here indeed becomes notable one great difference between our two kinds of civil war, between the modern lingual or parliamentary logical kind and the ancient or manual kind in the steel battlefield, much to the disadvantage of the former. In the manual kind, where you front your foe with drawn weapon, one right stroke is final, for, physically speaking, when the brains are out, the man does honestly die and trouble you no more. But how different when it is with arguments you fight. Here no victory yet definable can be considered as final. Beat him down with parliamentary invective till sense be fled. Cut him in two, hanging one half in this dilemma horn, the other on that. Blow the brains or thinking faculty quite out of him for the time. It skills not. He rallies and revives on the morrow. Tomorrow he repairs his golden fires. The think that will logically extinguish him is perhaps still a desideratum in constitutional civilization. For how till a man know in some measure at what point he becomes logically defunct? Can parliamentary business be carried on and talk cease or slake? Doubtless it was some feeling of this difficulty and the clear insight how little such knowledge yet existed in the French nation, new in the constitutional career, and how defunct aristocrats would continue to walk for unlimited periods, as Partridge the almanac maker did, that had sunk into the deep mind of people's friend Marat, an eminently practical mind, and had grown there in the richest, putrescent soil, into the most original plan of action ever submitted to a people, nor yet has it grown, but it has germinated. It is growing, rooting itself into Tartarus, branching towards heaven. The second season hence, we shall see it risen out of the bottomless darkness, full grown into disastrous twilight, a hemlock tree great as the world, on or under whose boughs all the people's friends of the world may lodge. Two hundred and sixty thousand aristocrat heads, that is the precisest calculation, though one would not stand on a few hundreds. Yet we never rise as high as the round three hundred thousand. Shudder at it, O oh people, but it is as true as that ye yourselves and your people's friend are alive. These prating senators of yours hover ineffectual on the barren letter and will never save the revolution. A Cassandra Marat cannot do it with his single shrunk arm but with a few determined men it were possible. Give me, says the people's friend in his cold way, when young Barbaro, once his pupil in a course of what was called optics, went to see him. Give me two hundred Naples bravos, each armed with a good dirk and a muff on his left arm by way of shield. With them I will traverse France and accomplish the revolution. Nay, be brave, young Barbaro, 
for thou seest there is no jesting in those roomy eyes in that soot bleared figure most earnest of created things neither indeed is there madness of the straight waistcoat sort such produce shall the time ripen in cavernous marin the man forbid living in paris cellars lone as fanatic anchority in his thebaid say as far-seen simon on his pillar taking peculiar views therefrom patriots may smile and using him as bandog now to be muzzled now to be let bark name him as de moulin does maximum of patriotism and cassandra marat but were it not singular if this dirk and muff plan of his with superficial modifications proved to be precisely the plan adopted after this manner in these circumstances do august senators regenerate france nay they are in very deed believed to be regenerating it on account of which great fact main fact of their history the wearied eye can never be permitted wholly to ignore them but looking away now from these precincts of the tuileries where constitutional royalty let lafayette water it as he will languishes too like a cut branch and august senators are perhaps at bottom only perfecting their theory of defective verbs how does the young reality young sans culottism thrive the attentive observer can answer it thrives bravely putting forth new buds expanding the old buds into leaves into boughs is not french existence as before most prurient all loosened most nutrient for it sans culottism has the property of growing by what other things die off by agitation contention disarrangement nay in a word by what is the symbol and fruit of all these hunger in such a france as this hunger as we have remarked can hardly fail the provinces the southern cities feel it in their turn and what it brings exasperation preternatural suspicion in paris some halcyon days of abundance followed the monadic insurrection with its versailles grain carts and recovered restorer of liberty but they could not continue the month is still october when famishing saint antoine in a moment of passion seizes a poor baker innocent francois the baker and hangs him in constantinople wise but even this singular as it may seem does not cheapen bread too clear it is no royal bounty no municipal dexterity can adequately feed a bastille destroying paris wherefore on view of the hanged baker constitutionalism in sorrow and anger demands loi martiale a kind of riot act and indeed gets it most readily almost before the sun goes down this is that famed martial law with its red flag its drapeau rouge in virtue of which mayor bailly or any mayor has but henceforth to hang out that new oriflamme of his then to read or mumble something about the king's peace and after certain pauses serve any undispersing assemblage with musket shot or whatever shot will disperse it a decisive law and most just on one proviso that all patrolitism be of god and all mob assembling be of the devil otherwise not so just mayor bailly be unwilling to use it hang not out that new oriflamme flame not of gold but of the want of gold the thrice blessed revolution is done thou thinkest if so it will be well with thee but now let no mortal say henceforth that an august national assembly wants riot all it ever wanted was riot enough to balance court plotting all it now wants of heaven or of earth is to get its theory of defective verbs perfected End of section two. Section three of the French Revolution, Volume Two by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry.
Chapter 2.13 The Muster With famine and a constitutional theory of defective verbs going on, all other excitement is conceivable. A universal shaking and sifting of French existence this is, in the course of which, for one thing, what a multitude of low-lying figures are sifted to the top and set busily to work there. Dogleach Marat, now foreseen as Simon Stylites, we already know, him and others raised aloft. The mere sample these of what is coming, of what continues coming, upwards from the realm of night. Chomet, by and by, Anaxagoras Chomet, one already descries, mellifluous in street groups, not now a sea-boy on the high and giddy mast, a mellifluous tribune of the common people with long curling locks on burnstones of the thoroughfares, able sub-editor too, who shall rise to the very gallows. Clark Tallian, he also is become sub-editor, shall become able editor, and more. Bibliopolic memoro, typographic pruom, see new trades opening. Coulot de Bois, tearing a passion to rags, pauses on the thespian boards, listens with that black bushy head to the sound of the world's drama. Shall the mimetic become real? Did ye hiss him, O men of Lyon? Better had ye clapped. Happy now, indeed, for all manner of mimetic, half-original men, tumid blustering, with more or less of sincerity, which need not be entirely sincere, yet the sincerer the better, is like to go far. Shall we say the revolution element works itself rarer and rarer, so that only lighter and lighter bodies will float in it, till at last the mere blown bladder is your only swimmer? Limitation of mind, then, vehemence, promptitude, audacity, shall all be available, to which add only these two, cunning and good lungs. Good fortune must be presupposed. Accordingly, of all classes, the rising one, we observe, is now the attorney class. Witness Bazir, Carrier, Fouquier, Tanville, Bazoche, Captain Bourdon. More than enough. Such figures shall night, from her wonder-bearing bosom, emit, swarm after swarm. Of another deeper and deepest swarm, not yet dawned on the astonished eye, of pilfering candle-snuffers, thief valets, disfrocked capuchins, and so many Hébert, Henriot, Ronsin, Rosignol, let us as long as possible forbear speaking. Thus, over France, all stirs that has what the physiologists call irritability in it. How much more all wherein irritability has perfected itself into vitality, into actual vision and force that can will. All stirs, and if not in Paris, flocks thither. Great and greater waxes President Danton in his Cordelier section. His rhetorical tropes are all gigantic. Energy flashes from his black brows, menaces in his athletic figure, rolls in the sound of his voice, reverberating from the domes. This man also, like Mirabeau, has a natural eye and begins to see whether constitutionalism is tending, though with a wish in it different from Mirabeau's. Remark, on the other hand, how General de Murier has quitted Normandy and the Cherbourg breakwater to come whither we may guess. It is his second or even third trial at Paris since this new era began, but now it is in right earnest, for he has quitted all else. Wiry, elastic, unwearied man, whose life was but a battle and a march. No, not a creature of Choiseul, the creature of God and of my sword, he fiercely answered in old days. Overfalling Corsican batteries in the deadly fire hail, wriggling invincible from under his horse at Cluster Camp of the Netherlands, though tethered with crushed stirrup iron and nineteen wounds. Tough, military, standing at bay as forlorn hope on the skirts of Poland. 
intriguing, battling in cabinet and field, roaming far out, obscure as king's spile, or sitting sealed up, enchanted in Bastille, fencing, pamphleteering, scheming and struggling from the very birth of him, the man has come thus far. How repressed, how irrepressible, like some incarnate spirit in prison, which indeed he was, hewing on granite walls for deliverance, striking fire flashes from them. And now has the general earthquake rent his cavern too? Twenty years younger, what might he not have done? But his hair has a shade of grey, his way of thought is all fixed, military. He can grow no further, and the new world is in such growth. We will name him on the whole one of heaven's Swiss, without faith, wanting above all things work, work on any side. Work also is appointed him, and he will do it. Not from over France only are the unrestful flocking towards Paris, but from all sides of Europe. Where the carcass is, thither will the eagles gather. Think how many a Spanish Guzman, Martinico Fournier, named Fournier l'Américain, Engineer Miranda from the very Andes, were flocking or had flocked. Wolun Pereira might boast of the strangest parentage, him, they say, Prince Kaunitz, the diplomatist, heedlessly dropped, like ostrich egg, to be hatched of chance into an ostrich eater. Jewish or German fries do business in the great cesspool of Agio, which cesspool this Assignat fiat has quickened into a mother of dead dogs. Swiss Clavier could found no Socinian Genovese colony in Ireland, but he paused years ago, prophetic, before the minister's hotel at Paris, and said it was borne on his mind that he one day was to be minister, and laughed. Swiss Pache, on the other hand, sits sleek-headed, frugal, the wonder of his own alley, and even of neighbouring ones, for humility of mind, and a thought deeper than most men's. Sit there, Tartuffe, till wanted. Ye Italian Dufurnies, Flemish Proles, flit hither all ye bipeds of prey. Come, whosoever head is hot, thou of mind ungoverned, be it chaos as of undevelopment, or chaos as of ruin, the man who cannot get known, the man who is too well known. If thou have any vendable faculty, nay, if thou have but audacity and loquacity, come. They come, with hot unutterabilities in their heart, as pilgrims towards a miraculous shrine. Nay, how many come as vacant strollers, aimless, of whom Europe is full, merely towards something. For benighted fowls, when you beat their bushes, rush towards any light. Thus Frederick Baron Trenck, too, is here, mazed, purblind, from the cells of Magdeburg, minotauric cells, and his Ariadne lost. Singular to say, Trenck, in these years, sells wine, not indeed in bottle, but in wood. Nor is our England without her missionaries. She has her life-saving Needham, to whom was solemnly presented a civic sword, long since rusted into nothingness. Her pain, rebellious staymaker, unkempt, who feels that he, a single needleman, did by his common-sense pamphlet free America, that he can and will free all this world, perhaps even the other. Price Stanhope Constitutional Association sends over to congratulate, welcomed by National Assembly, though they are but a London club, whom Burke and Toryism I askance. On thee too, for country's sake, O Chevalier John Paul, be a word spent, or misspent. In faded naval uniform, Paul Jones lingers visible here, like a wineskin from which the wine is all drawn like the ghost of himself. Lo is his once loud bruit, scarcely audible, save with extreme tedium in ministerial antechambers, in this or the other charitable dining-room, mindful of the past. What changes, culminatings and declinings? 
not now poor paul thou lookest wistful over the solway brine by the foot of native criffle into blue mountainous cumberland into blue infinitude environed with thrift with humble friendliness thyself young fool longing to be aloft from it or even to be away from it yes beyond that sapphire promontory which men name st bees which is not sapphire either but dull sandstone when one gets close to it there is a world which world thou too shalt taste of from yonder white haven rise his smoke clouds ominous though ineffectual proud forth quakes at his bellying sails had not the wind suddenly shifted flamborough reapers home-going pause on the hillside for what sulphur cloud is that that defaces the sleek sea sulphur cloud spitting streaks of fire a sea cock-fight it is and of the hottest where british serapis and french american bonhomme richard do lash and throttle each other in their fashion and lo the desperate valour has suffocated the deliberate and paul jones too is of the kings of the sea the euxine the meotian waters felt thee next and long-skirted turks o paul and thy fiery soul has wasted itself in thousand contradictions to no purpose for in far lands with scarlet nassau segans with sinful imperial catherines is not the heart broken even as at home with the mean poor paul hunger and dispiritment track thy sinking footsteps once or at most twice in this revolution tumult the figure of thee emerges mute ghost-like as with stars dim twinkling through and then when the light is gone quite out a national legislature grants ceremonial funeral as good had been the natural presbyterian kirk-bell and six feet of scottish earth among the dust of thy loved ones such world lay beyond the promontory of st bees such is the life of sinful mankind here below but of all strangers far the notablest for us is baron jean baptiste de clutz or dropping baptisms and feudalisms world citizen anacharsis clutz from cleves him mark judicious reader thou hast known his uncle sharp-sighted thorough-going cornelius de po who mercilessly cuts down cherished illusions and of the finest antique spartans will make mere modern cut-throat menos the like stuff is in anacharsis hot metal full of scoriae which should and could have been smelted out but which will not he has wandered over this terraqueous planet seeking one may say the paradise we lost long ago he has seen english burke has been seen of the portugal inquisition has roamed and fought and written is writing among other things evidences of the mahometan religion but now like his scythian adoptive godfather he finds himself in the paris athens surely at last the haven of his soul a dashing man beloved at patriotic dinner-tables with gaiety nay with humour headlong trenchant of free purse in suitable costume though what mortal ever more despised costumes under all costumes anacharsis seeks the man not stylites mara will more freely trample costumes if they hold no man this is the faith of anacharsis that there is a paradise discoverable that all costumes ought to hold men o oh, anacharsis it is a headlong swift-going faith mounted thereon meseems thou art bound hastily for the city of nowhere and wilt arrive at best we may say arrive in good riding attitude which indeed is something so many new persons and new things have come to occupy this france her old speech and thought and activity which springs from those are all changing fermenting towards unknown issues to the dullest peasant as he sits sluggish overtoiled by his evening hearth one idea has come that of chateaux burnt of chateaux combustible how altered all coffee-houses in province or capital the entre de procope 
has now other questions than the three stagiarite unities to settle. Not theatre controversies, but a world controversy. There, in the ancient pigtail mode, or with modern Brutus heads, do well-frizzed logicians hold hubbub, and chaos umpire sits. The ever-enduring melody of Paris saloons has got a new ground tone, ever-enduring, which has been heard, and by the listening heaven too, since Julian the Apostate's time and earlier, mad now as formerly. Ex censor sua, ex censor, for we have freedom of the press. He may be seen there, impartial, even neutral. Tyrant Grimm rolls large eyes over a questionable coming time. Atheist Nejon, beloved disciple of Diderot, crows in his small difficult way, heralding glad dawn. But on the other hand, how many Mollerays, Marmontels, who had sat all their life hatching philosoph eggs, cackle now in a state bordering on distraction at the brood they have brought out. It was so delightful to have one's philosoph theorem demonstrated, crowned in the saloons, and now an infatuated people will not continue speculative, but have practice. There also observe preceptress Jeanly, or Sillery, or Sillery Jeanly, for our husband is both Count and Marquis, and we have more than one title. Pretentious, frothy, a Puritan, yet creedless, darkening counsel by words without wisdom, for it is in that thin element of the sentimentalist and distinguished female that Sillery Jeanly works. She would gladly be sincere, yet can grow no sincerer than sincere cant, sincere cant of many forms, ending in the devotional form. For the present, on a neck still of moderate whiteness, she wears as jewel a miniature Bastille, cut on mere sandstone, but then actual Bastille sandstone. Monsieur le Marquis is one of d'Orléans, errand man, in National Assembly and elsewhere. Madame, for her part, trains up a youthful d'Orléans generation in what superfinest morality one can. Gives, meanwhile, rather enigmatic account of fair Mademoiselle Pamela, the daughter whom she has adopted. Thus she, in Palais Royal Saloon, whither we remark d'Orléans himself, spite of Lafayette, has returned from that English mission of his. Surely no pleasant mission, for the English would not speak to him and St. Hannah Moore of England, so unlike St. Sillery jean Lee of France, saw him shunned in Vauxhall Gardens, like one pest-struck, and his red-blue impassive visage waxing hardly a shade bluer. End of section 3 Section 4 of The French Revolution, Volume 2 by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.14 Journalism. As for constitutionalism, with its national guards, it is doing what it can, and has enough to do. It must, as ever, with one hand wave persuasively, repressing patriotism, and keep the other clenched to menace royalty plotters, a most delicate task requiring tact. Thus, if people's friend Marat has today his writ of prise de corps, or seizure of body, served on him, and dives out of sight, tomorrow he is left at large, or is even encouraged as a sort of bandog whose being may be useful. President Danton in open hall, with reverberating voice, declares that, in a case like Marat's, force may be resisted by force. Whereupon the Châtelet serves Danton also with a writ, which, however, as the whole Cordelier district responds to it, what constable will be prompt to execute? Twice more, on new occasions, does the Châtelet launch its writ, and twice more in vain. The body of Danton cannot be seized by Châtelet, he unseized, should he even fly for a season, shall behold the Châtelet itself flung into limbo. Municipality and Brissot, meanwhile, 
are far on with their municipal constitution. The 60 districts shall become 48 sections. Much shall be adjusted, and Paris have its constitution, a constitution wholly elective, as indeed all French government shall and must be. And yet one fatal element has been introduced, that of citoyen actif. No man who does not pay the marque d'argent, or yearly tax, equal to three days' labour, shall be other than a passive citizen. Not the slightest vote for him. Were he acting all the year round with sledgehammer, with forest levelling axe? Unheard of, cry patriot journals. Yes, truly, my patriot friends, if liberty, the passion and prayer of all men's souls, means liberty to send your fifty thousandth part of a new tongue fencer into national debating club, then be the God's witness. Ye are hardly entreated. Oh, if in national palaver, as the Africans name it, such blessedness is verily found, what tyrant would deny it to son of Adam? Nay, might there not be a female parliament too, with screams from the opposition benches and the honourable member borne out in hysterics? To a children's parliament would I gladly consent, or even lower, if you wished it. Beloved brothers, liberty, one might fear, is actually, as the ancient wise men said, of heaven. On this earth, where, thinks the enlightened public, did a brave little dame de Stal, not Necker's daughter, but a far shrewder than she, find the nearest approach to liberty? After mature computation, cool as Dilworth's, her answer is, in the Bastille. Of heaven, answer many, asking. Woe that they should ask, for that is the very misery. Of heaven means much. Share in the national palaver it may, or may as probably not mean. One sans culottic bow that cannot fail to flourish is journalism. The voice of the people being the voice of God, shall not such divine voice make itself heard? To the ends of France, and in as many dialects as when the first great Babel was to be built, some loud as the lion, some small as the sucking dove. Mirabeau himself has his instructive journal or journals with Geneva Hodman working in them, and withal has quarrels enough with Dame Leger, his female bookseller, so ultra-compliant otherwise. King's friend, Royou, still prints himself. Barrère sheds tears of loyal sensibility in Break of Day journal, though with declining sale. But why is Fréron so hot, democratic? Fréron, the king's friend's nephew. He has it by kind, that heat of his. Wasp, Fréron, begot him. Voltaire's Frélon, who fought stinging, while sting and poison bag were left, were it only as reviewer and over printed waste paper. Constant, illuminative, as the nightly lamplighter issues the useful moniteur, for it has now become diurnal. With facts and few commentaries, official, safe in the middle, its able editors sunk long since, recoverably or irrecoverably, in deep darkness. Acid Lustalo, with his vigour, as of young slows, shall never ripen, but die untimely. His prud'homme, however, will not let that Révolution de Paris die, but edit it himself, with much else, dull blustering printer though he be. Of Cassandra Marat we have spoken often, yet the most surprising truth remains to be spoken, that he actually does not want sense, but with croaking, gelid throat, croaks out masses of the truth on several things. Nay, sometimes one might almost fancy he had a perception of humour, and were laughing a little, far down in his inner man. Camille is wittier than ever, and more outspoken, cynical, yet sunny as ever, a light melodious creature, born, as he shall yet say with bitter tears, to write verses. Light Apollo, so clear, soft lucent, in this war of the titans, wherein he shall not conquer. Folded and hawked newspapers exist in all countries, 
but in such a journalistic element as this of france other and stranger sorts are to be anticipated what says the English reader to a journal affiche, placard journal, legible to him that has no halfpenny, in bright prismatic colours calling the eye from afar? Such in the coming months as patriot associations, public and private, advance and can subscribe funds, shall plenteously hang themselves out, leaves, limed leaves, to catch what they can, the very government shall have its pasted journal. Louvet, busy yet with a new charming romance, shall write Sentinelle, and post them with effect. Nay, Bertrand de Molleville, in his extremity, shall still more cunningly try it. Great is journalism. Is not every able editor a ruler of the world, being a persuader of it, though self-elected, yet sanctioned by the sale of his numbers? whom indeed the world has the readiest method of deposing, should need be, that of merely doing nothing to him, which ends in starvation. Nor esteem it small what those bill-stickers had to do in Paris, above three score of them, all with their cross-poles, haversacks, paste-pots, nay, with leaden badges, for the municipality licenses them, a sacred college, properly of world rulers heralds, though not respected as such, in an era still incipient and raw. They made the walls of Paris didactic, suasive, with an ever-fresh periodical literature, wherein he that ran might read, placard journals, placard lampoons, municipal ordinances, royal proclamations, the whole other, or vulgar, placard department superadded, or omitted from contempt. What unutterable things the stone walls spoke during these five years! But it is all gone, today swallowing yesterday, and then being in its turn swallowed of tomorrow, even as speech ever is. Nay, what, O thou immortal man of letters, is writing itself, but speech conserved for a time? The placard journal conserved it for one day, some books conserve it for the matter of ten years, nay, some for three thousand. But what then? Why then, the years being all run, it also dies, and the world is rid of it. Oh, were there not a spirit in the word of man, as in man himself, that survived the audible-bodied word, and tended either Godward or else divilward for evermore? Why should he trouble himself much with the truth of it, or the falsehood of it, except for commercial purposes? His immortality, indeed, and whether it shall last half a lifetime, or a lifetime and a half, is not that a very considerable thing? As mortality was to the runaway, whom great Fritz bullied back into the battle with a R blank, what ear ewig leben, unprintable off-scouring of scoundrels, would you live for ever? This is the communication of thought. How happy when there is any thought to communicate! Neither let the simpler old methods be neglected in their sphere. The Palais Royal tent, a tyrannous patrolatism, has removed. But can it remove the lungs of man? An Oxagoras Chomet we saw mounted on burnstones, while Talia worked sedentary at the sub editorial desk. In any corner of the civilised world, a tub can be inverted, and an articulate-speaking biped mount thereon. Nay, with contrivance, a portable trestle or folding-stool can be procured for love or money. This the peripatetic orator can take in his hand, and, driven out here, set it up again there, saying mildly, with a sage bias, Omnia mea me comporto. Such is journalism, hawked, pasted, spoken. How changed since one old Metra walked the same Tuileries garden in gilt-cocked hat, with journal at his nose, or held loose-folded behind his back, and was a notability of Paris, Metra the newsman, and Louis himself was wont to say, Condi Metra. Since the first Venetian news-sheet was sold for a Gaza, or farthing, and named Gazette, we live in a fertile world.
End of section 4section 5 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.15 clubism where the heart is full it seeks for a thousand reasons in a thousand ways to impart itself how sweet indispensable in such cases is fellowship soul mystically strengthening soul the meditative germans some think have been of opinion that enthusiasm in the general means simply excessive congregating schwärmerei or swarming at any rate do we not see glimmering half-red embers if laid together get into the brightest white glow in such a france gregarious reunions will needs multiply intensify French life will step out of doors and from domestic become a public club life. Old clubs, which already germinated, grow and flourish. New everywhere bud forth. It is the sure symptom of social unrest. In such way, most infallibly of all, does social unrest exhibit itself, find solacement and also nutriment. In every French head there hangs now, whether for terror or for hope, some prophetic picture of a new France, prophecy which brings, nay, which almost is, its own fulfilment, and in all ways, consciously and unconsciously, works towards that. Observe, moreover, how the aggregative principle, let it be but deep enough, goes on aggregating, and this even in a geometrical progression, how, when the whole world, in such a plastic time, is forming itself into clubs, some one club, the strongest or luckiest, shall, by friendly attracting, by victorious compelling, grow ever stronger, till it become immeasurably strong, and all the others, with their strength, be either lovingly absorbed into it, or hostilely abolished by it. This, if the club spirit is universal, if the time is plastic. Plastic enough is the time, universal the club spirit. Such an all-absorbing paramount one club cannot be wanting. What a progress since the first salient point of the Breton Committee. It worked long in secret, not languidly. It has come with the National Assembly to Paris, calls itself in imitation, as is thought, of those generous Price Stanhope English French Revolution Club, but soon, with more originality, Club of Friends of the Constitution. Moreover, it has leased for itself, at a fair rent, the hall of the Jacobins Convent, one of our superfluous edifices, and does therefrom now, in these spring months, begin shining out on an admiring Paris. And so, by degrees, under the shorter, popular title of Jacobin's Club, it shall become memorable to all times and lands. Glance into the interior, strongly yet modestly benched and seated, as many as thirteen hundred chosen patriots, assembly members not a few. Barnav, the two Lamets, are seen there, occasionally Mirabeau, perpetually Robespierre, also the ferret visage of Fouquier Tonville, with other attorneys, an acharsis of Prussian Scythia, and miscellaneous patriots, though all is yet in the most perfectly clean-washed state, decent, nay, dignified. President on platform, President's bell are not wanting, oratorical tribune high-raised, nor strangers' galleries, wherein also sit women, has any French antiquarian society preserved that written lease of the Jacobin's convent hall? Or was it unluckier even than Magna Carta, clipped by sacrilegious tailors? Universal history is not indifferent to it. These friends of the Constitution have met mainly, as their name may foreshadow, to look after elections when an election comes, and procure fit men but likewise to consult generally that the commonweal takes no damage. One as yet sees not how, 
for indeed let two or three gather together anywhere, if it be not in church, where all are bound to the passive state, no mortal can say accurately, themselves as little as any, for what they are gathered. How often has the broached barrel proved not to be for joy and heart effusion, but for duel and head breakage, and the promised feast becomes a feast of the lapithy. This Jacobin's club, which at first shone resplendent, and was thought to be a new celestial sun for enlightening the nations, had, as things all have, to work through its appointed phases. It burned, unfortunately, more and more lurid, more sulphurous, distracted, and swam at last through the astonished heaven like a Tartarian portent and lurid burning prison of spirits and pain. Its style of eloquence? Rejoice, reader, that thou knowest it not, that thou canst never perfectly know. The Jacobins published a journal of debates where they that have the heart may examine. Impassioned, full-droning, patriotic eloquence, implacable, unfertile, save for destruction, which was indeed its work, most wearisome, though most deadly. Be thankful that oblivion covers so much, that all carrion is by and by buried in the green earth's bosom, and even makes her grow the greener. The Jacobins are buried, but their work is not. It continues making the tour of the world as it can. It might be seen lately, for instance, with bared bosom and death-defiant eye, as far on as Greek Missolonghi. And, strange enough, old slumbering Hellas was resuscitated into somnambulism, which will become clear wakefulness by a voice from the Rue Saint-Honoré. All dies, as we often say, except the spirit of man, of what man does. Thus has not the very house of the Jacobins vanished, scarcely lingering in a few old men's memories. The Saint-Honoré market has brushed it away, and now, where dull droning eloquence, like a trump of doom, once shook the world, there is pacific chaffering for poultry and greens. The sacred National Assembly Hall itself has become common ground, President's platform permeable to wane and dust cart, for the Route de Rivoli runs there. Verily, at cockcrow, of this cock or the other, all apparitions do melt and dissolve in space. The Paris Jacobin became the mother society, Société Mère, and had as many as three hundred shrill-tongued daughters in direct correspondence with her. Of indirectly corresponding, what we may call granddaughters and minute progeny, she counted forty-four thousand. But for the present, we note only two things, the first of them a mere anecdote, one night, a couple of brother Jacobins are doorkeepers, for the members take this post of duty and honour in rotation, and admit none that have not tickets. One doorkeeper was the worthy Sieur Laïs, a patriotic opera singer, stricken in years, whose windpipe is long since closed without result. The other, young, and named Louis-Philippe, d'Orléans' firstborn, has, in this latter time, after unheard-of destinies, become citizen king, and struggles to rule for a season. All flesh is grass, higher reed grass or creeping herb. The second thing we have to note is historical, that the mother society, even in this its effulgent period, cannot content all patriots. Already it must throw off, so to speak, two dissatisfied swarms, a swarm to the right, a swarm to the left. One party, which thinks the Jacobins lukewarm, constitutes itself into Club of the Cordelier, a hotter club. It is Danton's element, with whom goes de Moulin. The other party, again, which thinks the Jacobins scalding hot, flies off to the right and becomes Club of 1789, Friends of the Monarchic Constitution. They are afterwards named Fuyon Club their place of meeting being the Fuyon convent. Lafayette is, or becomes, their chief man, supported by the respectable patriot everywhere, by the mass of property and intelligence, with the most flourishing prospects. They, in these June days of 1790, do, in the Palais Royal 
dine solemnly with open windows to the cheers of the people, with toasts, with inspiring songs, with one song at least among the feeblest ever sung. They shall in due time be hooted forth over the borders into Cimmerian night. Another expressly monarchic or royalist club, Club des Monarchiens, though a club of ample funds and all sitting in damask sofas, cannot realise the smallest momentary cheer, realises only scoffs and groans, till ere long certain patriots in disorderly sufficient number proceed thither for a night or for nights, and groan it out of pain. Vivacious alone shall the mother society and her family be. The very cordelier may, as it were, return into her bosom, which will have grown warm enough. Fatal looking. Are not such societies an incipient new order of society itself? The aggregative principle, a new, at work in a society grown obsolete, cracked asunder, dissolving into rubbish and primary atoms. End of section 5section six of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point one six je les jure with these signs of the times is it not surprising that the dominant feeling all over france was still continually hope o oh, blessed hope sole boon of man whereby on his straight prison walls are painted beautiful far-stretching landscapes and into the night of very death is shed holiest dawn thou art to all an indefeasible possession in this god's world to the wise a sacred constantine's banner written on the eternal skies under which they shall conquer for the battle itself is victory to the foolish some secular mirage or shadow of still waters painted on the parched earth whereby at least their dusty pilgrimage if devious becomes cheerfuller becomes possible in the death tumults of a sinking society french hope sees only the birth struggles of a new unspeakably better society and sings with full assurance of faith her brisk melody which some inspired fiddler has in these very days composed for her, the world-famous Saira. Yes, that will go. And then there will come? All men hope, even Marat hopes, that patriotism will take muff and dirk. King Louis is not without hope. In the chapter of chances, in a flight to some bouillet, in getting popularised at Paris, but what a hoping people he had, Judge by the fact and series of facts now to be noted. Poor Louis, meaning the best, with little insight and even less determination of his own, has to follow, in that dim wayfaring of his, such signal as may be given him, by backstairs royalism, by official or backstairs constitutionalism, whichever for the month may have convinced the royal mind. If flight to Bouillé and horrible to think, a drawing of the civil sword do hang as theory, portentous in the background, much nearer is this fact of these twelve hundred kings who sit in the salle de manege, kings uncontrollable by him, not yet irreverent to him. Could kind management of these but prosper, how much better were it than armed emigrants, Turin intrigues, and the help of Austria? Nay, are the two hopes inconsistent? Rides in the suburbs, we have found, cost little, yet they always brought viva. Still cheaper is a soft word, such as has many times turned away wrath. In these rapid days, while France is all getting divided into departments, clergy about to be remodelled, popular societies rising, and feudalism, and so much ever, is ready to be hurled into the melting pot, might one not try? On the 4th of February, accordingly, Monsieur le Président reads to his National Assembly a short autograph announcing that His Majesty will step over, quite in an unceremonious way, probably about noon. 
think therefore monsieur what it may mean especially how you will get the hall decorated a little the secretary's bureau can be shifted down from the platform on the president's chair be slipped this cover of velvet of a violet colour sprigged with gold fleur-de-lis for indeed monsieur le president has had previous notice underhand and taken counsel with dr guillotin then some fraction of velvet carpet of like texture and colour cannot that be spread in front of the chair where the secretaries usually sit so has judicious guillotin advised and the effect is found satisfactory moreover as it is probable that his majesty in spite of the fleur-de-lis velvet will stand and not sit at all the president himself in the interim presides standing and so while some honourable member is discussing say the division of a department ushers announce his majesty in person with small suite enter majesty the honourable member stops short the assembly starts to its feet the twelve hundred kings almost all and the galleries no less do welcome the restorer of french liberty with loyal shouts his majesty's speech in diluted conventional phraseology expresses this mainly that he most of all frenchmen rejoices to see france getting regenerated is sure at the same time that they will deal gently with her in the process and not regenerate her roughly such was his majesty's speech the feat he performed was coming to speak it and going back again surely except to a very hoping people there was not much here to build upon yet what did they not build the fact that the king has spoken that he has voluntarily come to speak how inexpressibly encouraging did not the glance of his royal countenance like concentrated sunbeams kindle all hearts in an august assembly nay thereby in an inflammable enthusiastic france to move deputation of thanks can be the happy lot of but one man to go in such deputation the lot of not many the deputed have gone and returned with what highest flown compliment they could whom also the queen met dauphin in hand and still do not our hearts burn with insatiable gratitude and to one other man a still higher blessedness suggests itself to move that we all renew the national oath happiest honourable member with his word so in season as word seldom was magic fugelman of the whole national assembly which sat there bursting to do somewhat fugelman of a whole onlooking france the president swears declares that every one shall swear indistinct je les jure nay the very gallery sends him down a written slip signed with their oath on it and as the assembly now casts an eye that way the gallery all stands up and swears again and then out of doors consider at the hotel de vie how b the great tennis court swearer again swears towards nightfall with all the municipals and heads of districts assembled there towards nightfall and m danton suggests that the public would like to partake whereupon b with escort of twelve steps forth to the great outer staircase sways the ebullient multitude with stretched hand takes their oath with a thunder of rolling drums with shouts that rend the welkin and on all streets the glad people with moisture and fire in their eyes spontaneously formed groups and swore one another and the whole city was illuminated this was the fourth of february seventeen ninety a day to be marked white in constitutional annals nor is the illumination for a night only but partially or totally it lasts a series of nights for each district the electors of each district will swear specially and always as the district swears it illuminates itself behold them district after district in some open square where the non-electing people can all see and join with their uplifted right hands and je les jure 
with rolling drums, with embracings, and that infinite hurrah of the enfranchised, which any tyrant that there may be can consider. Faithful to the king, to the law, to the constitution which the National Assembly shall make. Fancy, for example, the professors of universities parading the streets with their young France and swearing in an enthusiastic manner, not without tumult. By a larger exercise of fancy, expand duly this little word. The like was repeated in every town and district of France. Nay, one patriot mother, in Lannion, of Brittany, assembles her ten children, and with her own aged hand swears them all herself, the high-souled, venerable woman, of all which, moreover, a national assembly must be eloquently apprised. Such three weeks of swearing. Saw the sun ever such a swearing people? Have they been bit by a swearing tarantula? No, but they are men and Frenchmen. They have hope, and, singular to say, they have faith, were it only in the gospel, according to Jean-Jacques. Oh, my brothers, would to heaven it were even as ye think and have sworn. But there are lovers' oaths, which, had they been true as love itself, cannot be kept, not to speak of dicers' oaths, also a known sort. End of section 6《Section 7 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.17 Prodigies To such length had the contrat social brought it in believing hearts. Man, as is well said, lives by faith. Each generation has its own faith, more or less, and laughs at the faith of its predecessor, most unwisely. Grant, indeed, that this faith in the social contract belongs to the stranger sorts, that an unborn generation may very wisely, if not laugh, yet stare at it and piously consider. For, alas, what is contrat? If all men were such that a mere spoken or sworn contract would bind them, all men were then true men, and government a superfluity. Not what thou and I have promised to each other, but what the balance of our forces can make us perform to each other. That, in so sinful a world as ours, is the thing to be counted on. But above all, a people and a sovereign promising to one another as if a whole people, changing from generation to generation, nay, from hour to hour, could ever by any method be made to speak or promise, and to speak mere solecisms, we, by the heaven's witness, which heavens, however, do no miracles now, we, ever-changing millions, will allow thee, changeful unit, to force us or govern us. The world has perhaps seen few faiths comparable to that. So, nevertheless, had the world then construed the matter. Had they not so construed it, how different had their hopes been, their attempts, their results. But so, and not otherwise, did the upper powers will it to be, freedom by social contract. Such was verily the gospel of that era, and all men had believed in it as in a heaven's glad tidings men should, and with overflowing heart and uplifted voice clave to it, and stood fronting time and eternity on it, nay smile not, or only with a smile sadder than tears. This too was a better faith than the one it had replaced, than faith merely in the everlasting nothing, and man's digestive power, lower than which no faith can go. Not that such universally prevalent, universally durant feeling of hope could be a unanimous one. Far from that. The time was ominous. Social dissolution near and certain. Social renovation still a problem. Difficult and distant, even though sure. But if ominous to some clearest onlooker, whose faith stood not with one side or with the other, nor in the ever-vexed jarring of Greek with Greek at all. 
how unspeakably ominous to dim royalist participators, for whom royalism was mankind's palladium, for whom, with the abolition of most Christian kingship and most Talleyrand bishopship, all loyal obedience, all religious faith was to expire, and final night envelop the destinies of man. On serious hearts of that persuasion, the matter sinks down deep, prompting, as we have seen, to backstairs plots, to emigration with pledge of war, to monarchic clubs, nay, to still madder things. The spirit of prophecy, for instance, had been considered extinct for some centuries. Nevertheless, these last times, as indeed is the tendency of last times, do revive it. That so, of French mad things, we might have sample also of the maddest, in remote rural districts, whether philosophism has not yet radiated, where a heterodox constitution of the clergy is bringing strife round the altar itself, and the very church bells are getting melted into small money coin, it appears probable that the end of the world cannot be far off. Deep musing, atrabiliar old men, especially old women, hint in an obscure way that they know what they know. The Holy Virgin, silent so long, has not gone dumb. And truly now, if ever more in this world, were the time for her to speak. One prophetess, though careless historians have omitted her name, condition, and whereabout, becomes audible to the general ear, credible to not a few, credible to Friar Gerl, poor patriot Chartreux, in the National Assembly itself. She, in Pythoness's recitative, with wild staring eye, sings that there shall be a sign, that the heavenly sun himself will hang out a sign, or mock sun, which many say shall be stamped with the head of hanged Favras. List, Dom Gerl, with that poor adult Paul of thine, list, O oh, list, and hear nothing. Notable, however, was the magnetic vellum, vellin magnétique, of the sieur Dozier and Petit Jean, parliamentiers of Rouen. Sweet young Dozier, bred in the faith of his missile and of parchment genealogies, and of parchment generally. A dust, melancholic, middle-aged Petit Jean. Why came these two to Saint Cloud? where his majesty was hunting on the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul, and waited there in antechambers, a wonder to whispering Swiss the livelong day, and even waited without the grates when turned out, and had dismissed their valets to Paris, as with purpose of endless waiting. They have a magnetic vellum, these two, whereon the virgin, wonderfully clothing herself in mesmerian, caliostric, occult philosophy, has inspired them to jot down instructions and predictions for a much straitened king, to whom by higher order they will this day present it and save the monarchy and world. An accountable pair of visual objects. You should be men and of the 18th century, but your magnetic vellum forbids us so to interpret. Say, are ye aught? Thus ask the guardhouse captains, the mayor of saint Cloud. Nay, at great length, thus asks the Committee of Researches, and not the Municipal, but the National Assembly one. No distinct answer for weeks. At last it becomes plain that the right answer is negative. Go, ye chimeras, with your magnetic vellum, sweet young chimera, a dust middle-aged one. The prison doors are open. Hardly again shall ye preside the Rouen Chamber of Accounts but vanish obscurely into limbo. End of section 7。section 8 of the French Revolution, volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.18 Solemn League and Covenant such dim masses, and specks of even deepest black, work in that white-hot glow of the French mind, now wholly in fusion and confusion. 
old women here swearing their ten children on the new evangel of Jean-Jacques, old women there looking up for Favras's heads in the celestial luminary. These are preternatural signs, prefiguring somewhat. In fact, to the patriot children of hope themselves, it is undeniable that difficulties exist. Emigrating seigneur, parlement, in sneaking but most malicious mutiny, though the rope is round their neck. Above all, the most decided deficiency of grains. Sorrowful, but to a nation that hopes, not irremediable. To a nation which is in fusion and ardent communion of thought, which, for example, on signal of one fugleman, will lift its right hand, like a drilled regiment, and swear and illuminate, till every village from Ardenne to the Pyrenees has rolled its village drum, and sent up its little oath, and glimmer of tallow illumination, some fathoms into the reign of night. If grains are defective, the fault is not of nature or national assembly, but of art and anti-national intriguers. Such malign individuals, of the scoundrel species, have power to vex us, while the constitution is a-making. Endure it, ye heroic patriots. Nay, rather, why not cure it? Grains do grow, they lie extant there in sheaf or sack. Only that re-graters and royalist plotters, to provoke the people into illegality, obstruct the transport of grains. Quick, ye organised patriot authorities, armed national guards, meet together, unite your goodwill. In union is tenfold strength. Let the concentred flash of your patriotism strike stealthy scoundrelism blind, paralytic, as with a coup de soleil. Under which hat or nightcap of the twenty-five millions this pregnant idea first rose, for in some one head it did rise, no man can now say, a most small idea, near at hand, for the whole world, but a living one, fit, and which waxed, whether into greatness or not, into immeasurable size. When a nation is in this state, that the fugleman can operate on it, what will the word in season, the act in season, not do? It will grow verily, like the boy's bean in the fairy tale, heaven high, with habitations and adventures on it, in one night. It is nevertheless, unfortunately, still a bean, for your long-lived oak grows not so. And the next night it may lie felled, horizontal, trodden into common mud. But remark at least how natural to any agitated nation which has faith this business of covenanting is. The Scotch, believing in a righteous heaven above them, and also in a gospel, far other than the Jean-Jacques one, swore in their extreme need a solemn league and covenant, as brothers on the forlorn hope and imminence of battle, who embrace looking Godward, and got the whole isle to swear it, and even in their tough, old Saxon, Hebrew, Presbyterian way, to keep it more or less. For the thing as such things are was heard in heaven, and partially ratified there. Neither is it yet dead, if thou wilt look, nor like to die. The French, too, with their Gallic, ethnic excitability and effervescence, have, as we have seen, real faith of a sort. They are hard bestead, though in the middle of hope. A national solemn league and covenant there may be in France, too, under how different conditions, with how different development and issue. Note accordingly the small commencement, first spark of a mighty firework, for if the particular hat cannot be fixed upon, the particular district can. On the twenty-ninth day of last November were National Guards by the thousand seen filing from far and near, with military music, with municipal officers in tricolour sashes, towards and along the Rhone stream, to the little town of Etoile. There, with ceremonial evolution and manoeuvre, with fanfaronading, musketry salvos, and what else the patriot genius could devise, they made oath and obtestation to stand faithfully by one another under law and king, in particular to have all manner of grains, while grains there were, freely circulated, in spite both of robber and regrater. 
This was the meeting of Etoile in the mild end of November 1789. But now, if a mere empty review, followed by a review dinner, ball, and such gesticulation and flirtation as there may be, interests the happy county town and makes it the envy of surrounding county towns, how much more might this? In a fortnight, larger Montelimar, half ashamed of itself, will do as good and better. On the plain of Montelimar, or what is equally sonorous, under the walls of Montelimar, the 13th of December sees new gathering and obtestation, 6,000 strong. And now indeed with these three remarkable improvements, as unanimously resolved on there. First that the men of Montelimar do federate with the already federated men of Etoile. Second, that implying not expressing the circulation of grain, they swear in the face of God and their country, with much more emphasis and comprehensiveness, to obey all decrees of the National Assembly and see them obeyed till death, jusqu'à la mort. Third, and most important, that official record of all this be solemnly delivered into the National Assembly, to Monsieur de Lafayette, and to the restorer of French liberty, who shall all take what comfort from it they can. Thus does larger Montelimar vindicate its patriot importance and maintain its rank in the municipal scale. And so, with the new year, the signal is hoisted, for is not a national assembly and solemn deliverance there, at lowest a national telegraph? Not only grain shall circulate, while there is grain, on highways or the Rhone waters over all that southeastern region, where also if Monseigneur d'Artois saw good to break in from Turin, hot welcome might wait him. But whatsoever province of France is straitened for grain or vexed with a mutinous parliament, unconstitutional plotters, monarchic clubs, or any other patriot ailment can go and do likewise, or even do better. And now, especially when the February swearing has set them all agog. From Brittany to Burgundy, on most plains of France, under most city walls, it is a blaring of trumpets, waving of banners, a constitutional manoeuvring. Under the vernal skies, while nature too is putting forth her green hopes, under bright sunshine defaced by the stormful east, like patriotism victorious, though with difficulty, over aristocracy and defect of grain. There march and constitutionally wheel to the saira in mood of fife and drum under their tricolor municipals, our clear gleaming phalanxes, or halt with uplifted right hand and artillery salvos that imitate Jove's thunder. And all the country, and metaphorically all the universe, is looking on, wholly in their best apparel, brave men and beautifully dizened women, most of whom have lovers there, swearing by the eternal heavens and this green growing all nutritive earth that France is free. Sweetest days when, astonishing to say, mortals have actually met together in communion and fellowship, and man, were it only once through long despicable centuries, is for moments verily the brother of man. And then the deputations to the National Assembly, with high-flown descriptive harangue, to Monsieur de Lafayette and the Restorer, very frequently, moreover, to the mother of patriotism, sitting on her stout benches in that hall of the Jacobins. The general ear is filled with federation. New names of patriots emerge, which shall one day become familiar, Boyer Fonfred, eloquent denunciator of a rebellious Bordeaux Parliament, Max Isna, eloquent reporter of the Federation of Draguignan, eloquent pair, separated by the whole breadth of France, who are nevertheless to meet. Ever wider burns the flame of Federation, ever wider and also brighter. Thus the Brittany and Anjou brethren mention a fraternity of all true Frenchmen, and go the length of invoking perdition and death on any renegade. Moreover, if in their National Assembly harangue they glance plaintively at the Marc d'Argent, which makes so many citizens passive, 
they over in the mother society ask being henceforth themselves neither breton nor angevin but french why all france has not one federation and universal oath of brotherhood once for all a most pertinent suggestion dating from the end of march which pertinent suggestion the whole patriot world cannot but catch and reverberate and agitate till it become loud which in that case the town hall municipals had better take up and meditate some universal federation seems inevitable the where is given clearly paris only the when the how these also productive time will give is already giving for always as the federative work goes on it perfects itself and patriot genius adds contribution after contribution thus at lyon in the end of the may month we behold as many as fifty or some say sixty thousand met to federate and a multitude looking on which it would be difficult to number from dawn to dusk for our lyon guardsmen took rank at five in the bright dewy morning came pouring in bright gleaming to the quai de rhone to march thence to the federation field amid waving of hats and lady handkerchiefs glad shoutings of some two hundred thousand patriot voices and hearts the beautiful and brave among whom courting no notice and yet the notablest of all what queen-like figure is this with her escort of house friends and champagne the patriot editor come abroad with the earliest radiant with enthusiasm are those dark eyes is that strong minerva face looking dignity and earnest joy joyfulest she where all are joyful it is roland de la patrière's wife strict elderly roland king's inspector of manufactures here and now likewise by popular choice the strictest of our new lyon municipals a man who has gained much if worth and faculty be gain but above all things has gained to wife philippon the paris engraver's daughter reader mark that queen-like burgher woman beautiful amazonian graceful to the eye more so to the mind unconscious of her worth as all worth is of her greatness of her crystal clearness genuine the creature of sincerity and nature in an age of artificiality pollution and cant there in her still completeness in her still invincibility she if thou knew it is the noblest of all living frenchwomen and will be seen one day o oh, blessed rather while unseen even of herself for the present she gazes nothing doubting into this grand theatricality and thinks her young dreams are to be fulfilled from dawn to dusk as we said it lasts and truly a sight like few flourishes of drums and trumpets are something but think of an artificial rock fifty feet high all cut into crag steps not without the similitude of shrubs the interior cavity for in sooth it is made of deal stands solemn a temple of concord on the outer summit rises a statue of liberty colossal seen for miles with her pike and phrygian cap and civic column at her feet a country's altar hotel de la patrie on all which neither deal timber nor lath and plaster with paint of various colours have been spared but fancy then the banners all placed on the steps of the rock high mass chaunted and the civic oath of fifty thousand with what volcanic outburst of sound from iron and other throats enough to frighten back the very son and Rouen, and how the brightest fireworks and balls and even repasts closed in that night of the gods and so the lyon federation vanishes too swallowed of darkness and yet not wholly for our brave fair roland was there also she though in the deepest privacy writes her narrative of it in champagneux courrier de lyon 
a piece which circulates to the extent of sixty thousand, which one would like now to read. But on the whole, Paris, we may see, will have little to devise, will only have to borrow and apply. And then, as to the day, what day of all the calendar is fit, if the Bastille anniversary be not? The particular spot, too, it is easy to see, must be the Champ de Mars, where many a Julian the Apostate has been lifted on bucklers to France's or the world's sovereignty. And Iron Franks, loud clanging, have responded to the voice of a Charlemagne, and from of old mere sublimities have been familiar. End of section 8section nine of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point one nine symbolic how natural in all decisive circumstances is symbolic representation to all kinds of men nay what is man's whole terrestrial life but a symbolic representation and making visible of the celestial invisible force that is in him. By act and word he strives to do it, with sincerity if possible, failing that with theatricality, which latter also may have its meaning. An almanac's masquerade is not nothing. In more genial ages, your Christmas guisings, feasts of the ass, abbots of unreason, were a considerable something, since sport they were, as almanacs may still be sincere wish for sport. But what, on the other hand, must not sincere earnest have been, say, a Hebrew feast of tabernacles have been, a whole nation gathered in the name of the highest, under the eye of the highest, imagination herself flagging under the reality. And all noblest ceremony, as yet not grown ceremonial, but solemn, significant to the outmost fringe. Neither in modern private life are theatrical scenes of tearful women wetting whole ells of cambric in concert, of impassioned bushy-whiskered youth threatening suicide, and such like, to be so entirely detested. Drop thou a tear over them thyself, rather. At any rate, one can remark that no nation will throw by its work, and deliberately go out to make a scene, without meaning something thereby. For indeed no scenic individual, with knavish hypocritical views, will take the trouble to soliloquise a scene. And now consider, is not a scenic nation placed precisely in that predicament of soliloquising, for its own behoof alone, to solace its own sensibilities, maudlin or other? Yet in this respect, of readiness for scenes, the difference of nations, as of men, is very great. If our Saxon Puritanic friends, for example, swore and signed their national covenant without discharge of gunpowder or the beating of any drum in a dingy covenant close of the Edinburgh High Street in a mean room where men now drink mean liquor, it was consistent with their ways so to swear it. Our Gallic encyclopedic friends, again, must have a champ de mars, scene of all the world, or universe. And such a scenic exhibition, to which the Colosseum Amphitheatre was but a stroller's barn, as this old globe of ours had never or hardly ever beheld. Which method also we reckon natural, then and there. Nor perhaps was the respective keeping of these two oaths far out of due proportion to such respective display in taking them, inverse proportion, namely. For the theatricality of a people goes in a compound ratio, ratio indeed of their trustfulness, sociability, fervency, but then also of their excitability, of their porosity, not continent, or say, of their explosiveness, hot flashing, but which does not last. How true also, once more, is it that no man or nation of men, conscious of doing a great thing, was ever, in that thing, doing other than a small one. Oh, Chandemars, 
federation with three hundred drummers twelve hundred wind musicians and artillery planted on height after height to boom the tidings of it all over france in few minutes could no atheist nejon contrive to discern eighteen centuries off those thirteen most poor mean-dressed men at frugal supper in a mean jewish dwelling with no symbol but hearts god initiated into the divine depth of sorrow and do this in remembrance of me and so cease that small difficult crowing of his if he were not doomed to it end of section nine Section 10 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.1.10 Mankind Pardonable are human theatricalities, nay perhaps touching, like the passionate utterance of a tongue with which sincerity stammers, of a head with which insincerity babbles, having gone distracted. Yet in comparison with unpremeditated outbursts of nature, such as an insurrection of women, how foisonless, unedifying, undelightful, like small ale palled, like an effervescence that has effervesced. Such scenes coming of forethought, were they world great and never so cunningly devised, are at bottom mainly pasteboard and paint. But the others are original, emitted from the great ever-living heart of nature herself. What figure they will assume is unspeakably significant. To us, therefore, let the French National Solemn League and Federation be the highest recorded triumph of the thespian art. Triumphant, surely, since the whole pit, which was of twenty-five millions, not only claps hands, but does itself spring on the boards, and passionately set to playing there. And being such, be it treated as such. With sincere, cursory admiration, with wonder from afar. A whole nation gone mumming deserves so much, but deserves not that loving minuteness a monadic insurrection did. Much more let prior and, as it were, rehearsal scenes of federation come and go, henceforward, as they list, and on plains and under city walls, innumerable regimental bands blare off into the inane without note from us. One scene, however, the hastiest reader will momentarily pause on, that of Anacharsis Clutes and the collective sinful posterity of Adam for a patriot municipality has now on the 4th of June got its plan concocted and got it sanctioned by National Assembly, a patriot king assenting, to whom were he even free to dissent, federative harangues, overflowing with loyalty, have doubtless a transient sweetness. There shall come deputed National Guards, so many in the hundred, from each of the 83 departments of France, Likewise, from all naval and military king's forces shall deputed quotas come. Such federation of national with royal soldier has, taking place spontaneously, been already seen and sanctioned. For the rest, it is hoped, as many as 40,000 may arrive, the expenses to be borne by the deputing district, of all which let district and department take thought and elect fit men whom the Paris brethren will fly to meet and welcome. Now, therefore, judge if our patriot artists are busy, taking deep counsel how to make the scene worthy of a look from the universe. As many as 15,000 men, spade men, barrow men, stone builders, rammers, with their engineers, are at work on the Champ de Mars, following it out into a natural amphitheatre, fit for such solemnity for one may hope it will be annual and perennial, a feast of pikes, fête de pique, notablest among the high tides of the year. In any case, ought not a scenic free nation to have some permanent national amphitheatre? 
the Champ de Mar, is getting hollowed out, and the daily talk and the nightly dream in most Parisian heads is of federation, and that only. Federate deputies are already under way. National Assembly, what with its natural work, what with hearing and answering harangues of federates, of this federation, will have enough to do. Harangue of American Committee, among whom is that faint figure of Paul Jones, as with the stars dim twinkling through it, come to congratulate us on the prospect of such auspicious day. Harangue of Bastille conquerors, come to renounce any special recompense, any peculiar place at the solemnity, since the centre grenadiers rather grumble. Harangue of Tennis Court Club, who enter with far-gleaming brass plate aloft on a pole, and the tennis court oath engraved thereon, which far-gleaming brass plate they purpose to affix solemnly in the Versailles original locality, on the 20th of this month, which is the anniversary, as a deathless memorial, for some years. They will then dine, as they come back, in the Bois de Boulogne, cannot, however, do it without apprising the world. To such things does the august National Assembly ever and anon cheerfully listen, suspending its regenerative labours, and with some touch of impromptu eloquence make friendly reply, as indeed the want has long been, for it is a gesticulating, sympathetic people, and has a heart, and wears it on its sleeve. In which circumstances it occurred to the mind of Anacharsis Klutz that while so much was embodying itself into club or committee, and perorating applauded, there yet remained a greater and greatest, of which, if it also took body and perorated, what might not the effect be? Humankind, namely, le genre humain, itself. In what rapt creative moment the thought rose in Anarchus's soul, all his throes while he went about giving shape and birth to it, how he was sneered at by cold worldlings, but did sneer again, being a man of polished sarcasm, and moved to and fro persuasive in coffee-house and soiree, and dived down assiduous obscure in the great deep of Paris, making his thought a fact. Of all this, the spiritual biographies of that period say nothing. Enough that on the 19th evening of June, 1790, the sun's slant rays lighted a spectacle such as our foolish little planet has not often had to show. Anacharsis Klutz entering the august Salle de Manege, with the human species at his heels. Swedes, Spaniards, Polacks, Turks, Chaldeans, Greeks, dwellers in Mesopotamia. Behold them all, they have come to claim place in the Grand Federation, having an undoubted interest in it. Our ambassador titles, said the fervid Klutz, are not written on parchment, but on the living hearts of all men. These whiskered Polacks, long-flowing turbaned Ishmaelites, astrological Chaldeans, who stand so mute here, let them plead with you, august senators, more eloquently than eloquence could. They are the mute representatives of their tongue-tied, befettered, heavy-laden nations, who from out of that dark bewilderment gaze wistful, amazed, with half-incredulous hope towards you, and this your bright light of a French federation, bright particular day-star, the herald of universal day. We claim to stand there as mute monuments, pathetically adumbrative of much. From bench and gallery comes repeated applause. For what august senator but is flattered even by the very shadow of human species depending on him? From President C.S., who presides this remarkable fortnight, in spite of his small voice, there comes eloquent, though shrill, reply. Anacharsis and the Foreigners' Committee shall have place at the Federation, on condition of telling their respective peoples what they see there. In the meantime, we invite them to the honours of the sitting, honneur de la séance. A long-flowing Turk, for rejoinder, bows with Eastern solemnity, 
and utters articulate sounds but owing to his imperfect knowledge of the french dialect his words are like spilt water the thought he had in them remains conjectural to this day anacharsis and mankind accept the honours of the sitting and have forthwith as the old newspapers still testify the satisfaction to see several things first and chief on the motion of lamet lafayette saint fargeau and other patriot nobles let the others repugn as they will all titles of nobility from duke to esquire or lower are henceforth abolished then in like manner livery servants or rather the livery of servants neither for the future shall any man or woman self-styled noble be incensed foolishly fumigated with incense in church as the wont has been in a word feudalism being dead these ten months why should her empty trappings and scutcheons survive the very coat of arms will require to be obliterated and yet cassandra marat on this and the other coach panel notices that they are but painted over and threaten to peer through again so that henceforth de lafayette is but the sur motier and saint fargeau is plain michel le pelletier and mirabeau soon after has to say huffingly with your riquetti you have set europe at cross purposes for three days for his counthood is not indifferent to this man which indeed the charming people treat him with to the last but let extreme patriotism rejoice and chiefly anacharsis and mankind for now it seems to be taken for granted that one adam is father of us all such was in historical accuracy the famed feat of anacharsis thus did the most extensive of public bodies find a sort of spokesman whereby at least we may judge of one thing what a humour the once sniffing mocking city of paris and baron clutz had got into when such exhibition could appear a propriety next door to a sublimity it is true envy did in after times pervert the success of anacharsis making him from incidental speaker of the foreign nations committee claim to be official permanent speaker orateur of the human species which he only deserved to be and alleging calumniously that his astrological chaldeans and the rest were a mere french tag-rag and bobtail disguised for the nonce and in short sneering and fleering at him in her cold barren way all which however he the man he was could receive on thick enough panoply or even rebound therefrom and also go his way most extensive of public bodies we may call it and also the most unexpected for who could have thought to see all nations in the tuileries riding hall but so it is and truly as strange things may happen when a whole people goes mumming and miming has not thou thyself perchance seen diademed cleopatra daughter of the ptolemies pleading almost with bended knee in unheroic tea parlour or dim-lit retail shop to inflexible gross burgle dignitary for leave to reign and die being dressed for it and moneyless with small children while suddenly constables have shut the thespian barn and her antony pleaded in vain such visual spectra flit across this earth if the thespian stage be rudely interfered with but much more when as was said pitt jumps on stage then is it verily as in her drama a verkehrte welt of world topsy-turvied having seen the human species itself to have seen the dean of the human species ceased now to be a miracle such doyen de jean humain eldest of men had shown himself there in these weeks jean claude jacob a born serf deputed from his native jura mountains to thank the national assembly for enfranchising them on his bleached worn face are ploughed the furrowings of one hundred and twenty years he has heard dim patois talk 
of immoral grand monarch victories of a blunt palatinate as he toiled and moiled to make a little speck of this earth greener of seven dragoonings of marlborough going to the war four generations have bloomed out and loved and hated and rustled off he was forty-six when louis fourteenth died the assembly as one man spontaneously rose and did reverence to the eldest of the world old jean is to take seance among them honourably with covered head he gazes feebly there with his old eyes on that new wonder scene dreamlike to him and uncertain wavering amid fragments of old memories and dreams for time is all growing unsubstantial dreamlike john's eyes and mind are weary and about to close and open on a far other wonder scene which shall be real patriot subscription royal pension was got for him and he returned home glad but in two months more he left it all and went on his unknown way End of section 10section eleven of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point one eleven as in the age of gold meanwhile to paris ever going and returning day after day and all day long towards that field of mars it becomes painfully apparent that the spade work there cannot be got done in time. There is such an area of it, 300,000 square feet, for from the École Militaire, which will need to be done up in wood with balconies and galleries, westward to the gate by the river, where also shall be wood in triumphal arches, we count some thousand yards of length and for breadth from this umbrageous avenue of eight rows on the south side to that corresponding one on the north some thousand feet more or less all this to be scooped out and wheeled up in slope along the sides high enough for it must be rammed down there and shaped stairwise into as many as thirty ranges of convenient seats firm trimmed with turf covered with enduring timber and then our huge pyramidal fatherland's altar, Hôtel de la Patrie, in the centre, also to be raised and stair-stepped. Force work with a vengeance. It is a world's amphitheatre. There are but fifteen days good, and at this language rate it might take half as many weeks. What is singular, too, the spademen seem to work lazily. They will not work double tides, even for offer of more wages, though their tide is but seven hours. They declare angrily that the human tabernacle requires occasional rest. Is it aristocrats secretly bribing? Aristocrats were capable of that. Only six months since did not evidence get afloat that subterranean Paris, for we stand over quarries and catacombs, dangerously, as it were midway between heaven and the abyss and our hollow underground, was charged with gunpowder, which should make us leap. Till the Cordelier's deputation actually went to examine, and found it carried off again. An accursed, incurable brood, all asking for passports in these sacred days. Trouble of rioting, chateau burning, is in the Limousin, and elsewhere, for they are busy, between the best of peoples and the best of restorer kings, they would sow grudges. With what a fiend's grin would they see this federation, looked for by the universe, fail? Fail for want of spade work, however, it shall not. He that has four limbs and a French heart can do spade work and will. On the first July Monday, scarcely has the signal cannon boomed, Scarcely have the languescent mercenary fifteen thousand laid down their tools, and the eyes of onlookers turn sorrowfully of the still high sun, when this and the other patriot, fire in his eye, snatches barrow and mattock, and himself begins indignantly wheeling, whom scores and then hundreds follow, 
and soon a volunteer fifteen thousand are shovelling and trundling with the heart of giants and all in right order with that extemporaneous adroitness of theirs whereby such a lift has been given worth three mercenary ones which may end when the late twilight thickens in triumph shouts heard or heard off beyond montmartre a sympathetic population will wait next day with eagerness till the tools are free or why wait spades elsewhere exist and so now bursts forth that effulgence of parisian enthusiasm good-heartedness and brotherly love such if chroniclers are trustworthy as was not witnessed since the age of gold paris male and female precipitates itself towards its south-west extremity spade on shoulder streams of men without order or in order as ranked fellow craftsmen as natural or accidental reunions march towards the field of mars three deep these march to the sound of stringed music preceded by young girls with green boughs and trickler streamers they have shouldered soldier-wise their shovels and picks and with one throat are singing ça ira yes par dieu ça ira cry the passengers on the streets all corporate guilds and public and private bodies of citizens from the highest to the lowest march the very hawkers one finds have ceased bawling for one day the neighbouring villages turn out their able men come marching to village fiddle or tambourine and triangle under their mayor or mayor and curate who also walk bespaded and in trickler sash as many as one hundred and fifty thousand workers nay at certain seasons as some count two hundred and fifty thousand for in the afternoon especially what mortal but finishing his hasty day's work would run a stirring city from the time you reach the place louis quinze southward over the river by all avenues it is one living throng so many workers and no mercenary mock workers but real ones that lie freely to it each patriot stretches himself against the stubborn glebe hews and wheels with the whole weight that is in him amiable infants aimables enfants they do the police de l'atelier too the guidance and governance themselves with that ready will of theirs with that extemporaneous adroitness it is a true brethren's work all distinctions confounded abolished as it was in the beginning when adam himself delved long-frocked tonsured monks with short-skirted water-carriers with swallow-tailed well-frizzled incroyable of a patriot turn dark charcoalmen meal-white peruke-makers or peruke-wearers for advocate and judge are there and all heads of districts sober nuns sister-like with flaunting nymphs of the opera and females in common circumstances named unfortunate the patriot rag-picker and perfumed dweller in palaces for patriotism like new birth and also like death levels all the printers have come marching prudhommes all in paper caps with revolution de paris printed on them as camille notes wishing that in these great days there should be a pacte des écrivains too or federation of able editors beautiful to see the snowy linen and delicate pantaloon alternates with the soiled check shirt and bushel breeches for both have cast their coats and under both are four limbs and a set of patriot muscles there do they pick and shovel or bend forward yoked in long strings to box-barrow or overloaded tumbril joyous with one mind abbe c s is seen pulling wiry vehement if too light for draught by the side of beauharnais who shall get kings though he be none abbe maury did not pull but the charcoalman brought a mummer guised like him so he had to pull in effigy let no august senator disdain the work may obey generalissimo lafayette are there 
and alas shall be there again another day the king himself comes to see sky-rending vive le roi and suddenly with shouldered spades they form a guard of honour round him whosoever can come comes to work or to look and bless the work whole families have come one whole family we see clearly of three generations the father picking the mother shovelling the young ones wheeling assiduous old grandfather hoary with ninety-three years holds in his arms the youngest of all frisky not helpful this one who nevertheless may tell it to his grandchildren and how the future and the past alike looked on and with failing or with half-formed voice faltered there ça ira a vintner has wheeled in on patriot truck beverage of wine drink not my brothers if ye are not dry that your cask may last the longer neither did any drink but men evidently exhausted a dapper abbe looks on sneering to the barrow cry several whom he lest a worse thing befall him obeys nevertheless one wiser patriot barrowman arriving now interposes his arrêté setting down his own barrow he snatches the abbe's trundles it fast like an infected thing forth of the champ de mars circuit and discharges it there thus too a certain person of some quality or private capital to appearance entering hastily flings down his coat waistcoat and two watches and is rushing to the thick of the work but your watches cries the general voice does one distrust his brothers answers he nor were the watches stolen how beautiful is noble sentiment like gossamer gauze beautiful and cheap which will stand no tear and wear beautiful cheap gossamer gauze thou film shadow of a raw material of virtue which art not woven nor likely to be into duty thou art better than nothing and also worse young boarding-school boys college students shout vive la nation and regret that they have yet only their sweat to give what say we of boys beautifulest hebes the loveliest of paris in their light air robes with riband girdle of tricolor are there shovelling and wheeling with the rest their hebe eyes brighter with enthusiasm and long hair in beautiful dishevelment hard pressed are their small fingers but they make the patriot barrow go and even force it to the summit of the slope with a little tracing which what man's arm were not too happy to lend then bound down with it again and go for more with their long locks and tricolours blown back graceful as the rosy hours oh as that evening sun fell over the champ de mars and tinted with fire the thick umbrageous boscage that shelters it on this hand and on that and struck direct on those domes and two-and-forty windows of the école militaire and made them all of burnished gold saw he on his wide zodiac road other such sight a living garden spotted and dotted with such flowerage all colours of the prism the beautifulest blent friendly with the usefulest all growing and working brother-like there under one warm feeling were it but for days once and no second time but night is sinking these nights too into eternity the hastiest traveller versailles word has drawn bridle on the heights of chaillot and looked for moments over the river reporting at versailles what he saw not without tears meanwhile from all points of the compass federates are arriving fervid children of the south who glory in their mirabeau considerate north-blooded mountaineers of jura sharp bretons with their gallic suddenness normans not to be overreached in bargain all now animated with one noblest fire of patriotism whom the paris brethren march forth to receive with military solemnities with fraternal embracing and a hospitality worthy of the heroic ages they assist at the assembly's debates these federates the galleries are reserved for them 
They assist in the toils of the Champ de Mars. Each new troop will put its hand to the spade, lift a hod of earth on the altar of the fatherland. But the flourishes of rhetoric, for it is a gesticulating people, the moral sublime of those addresses to an august assembly, to a patriot restorer. Our Breton captain of federates kneels even in a fit of enthusiasm and gives up his sword. He wet-eyed to a king wet-eyed. Poor Louis. These, as he said afterwards, were among the bright days of his life. Reviews also there must be. Royal federate reviews, with king, queen, and trickler court looking on. At lowest, if, as is too common, it rains, our federate volunteers will file through the inner gateways, royalty standing dry. Nay, there, should some stop occur, the beautifulest fingers in France may take you softly by the lapel, and in mild flute voice ask, Monsieur, of what province are you? Happy he who can reply, chivalrously lowering his sword's point, Madam, from the province your ancestors reigned over. He, that happy provincial advocate, now provincial federate, shall be rewarded by a sun smile, and such melodious glad words addressed to a king. Sire, these are your faithful Lorrainers. Cheerier, verily, in these holidays is this sky-blue faced with red of a national guardsman than the dull black and grey of a provincial advocate, which in workdays one was used to. For the same thrice-blessed Lorrainer shall this evening stand sentry at a queen's door and feel that he could die a thousand deaths for her. Then again at the outer gate, and even a third time, she shall see him. Nay, he will make her do it, presenting arms with emphasis, making his musket jingle again, and in her salute there shall again be a sun-smile, and that little blonde-locked too hasty dauphin shall be admonished. Salute then, monsieur, don't be unpolite. And therewith she, like a bright sky-wanderer, or planet with her little moon, issues forth peculiar. But at night, when patriot spadework is over, figure the sacred rites of hospitality. Le Peltier saint Fargeau, a mere private senator, but with great possessions, has daily his hundred dinner guests. The table of Generalissimo Lafayette may double that number. In lowly parlour, as in lofty saloon, the wine cup passes round, crowned by the smiles of beauty, be it of lightly tripping grisette or of high-sailing dam, for both equally have beauty and smiles precious to the brave. End of section 11section 12 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.112 sound and smoke and so now in spite of plotting aristocrats lazy hired spademen and almost of destiny itself for there has been much rain the Champ de Mars, on the 13th of the month, is fairly ready, trimmed, rammed, buttressed with firm masonry, and patriotism can stroll over it admiring, and, as it were, rehearsing, for in every head is some unutterable image of the morrow. Pray heaven there be not clouds. Nay, what far worse cloud is this of a misguided municipality that talks of admitting patriotism to the solemnity? by tickets. Was it by tickets you were admitted to the work, and to what brought the work? Did we take the Bastille by tickets? A misguided municipality sees the error. At late midnight, rolling drums announce to patriotism, starting half out of its bedclothes, that it is to be ticketless. Pull down thy nightcap, therefore, and with demi-articulate grumble, significant of several things, Go pacify to sleep again. Tomorrow is Wednesday morning, unforgettable among the fasti of the world. The morning comes, 
cold for a July one, but such a festivity would make Greenland smile. Through every inlet of that national amphitheatre, for it is a league in circuit, cut with openings at due intervals, floods in the living throng, covers without tumult space after space. The École Militaire has galleries and over-vaulting canopies where carpentry and painting have vied for the upper authorities. Triumphal arches at the gate by the river bear inscriptions, if weak yet well meant and orthodox. Far aloft over the altar of the fatherland, on their tall crane standards of iron, swing pensile our antique cassolette, or pans of incense dispensing sweet incense fumes, unless for the heathen mythology one sees not for whom. Two hundred thousand patriotic men, and twice as good one hundred thousand patriotic women, all decked and glorified as one can fancy, sitting waiting in this Champ de Mars. What a picture! That circle of bright-eyed life spread up there on its thirty-seated slope, leaning, one would say, on the thick umbrage of those avenue trees, for the stems of them are hidden by the height, and all beyond it mere greenness of summer earth, with the gleams of waters, or white sparklings of stone edifices, little circular enamel picture in the centre of such a vase of emerald, a vase not empty. The invalides cupolas want not their population, nor the distant windmills of the Montmartre. On remotest steeple and invisible village belfry stand men with spy-glasses. On the heights of Chaillot are many-coloured undulating groups, round and far on, over all the circling heights that embosom Paris. It is as one more or less peopled amphitheatre, which the eye grows dim with measuring. Nay, heights, as was before hinted, have cannon, and a floating battery of cannon is on the sin. When eye fails, ear shall serve. And all France properly is but one amphitheatre, for in paved town and unpaved hamlet men walk listening, till the muffled thunder sound audible on their horizon, that they too may begin swearing and firing. But now, to streams of music, come federates enough, for they have assembled on the boulevard Saint-Antoine, or thereby, and come marching through the city, with their eighty-three department banners, and blessings not loud but deep. Comes National Assembly, and takes seat under its canopy. Comes Royalty, and takes seat on a throne beside it. And Lafayette, on white charger, is here, and all the civic functionaries. And the Federates form dances, till their strictly military evolutions and manoeuvres can begin. Evolutions and manoeuvres? Task not the pen of mortal to describe them. Truant imagination droops. Declares that it is not worth while. There is wheeling and sweeping, to slow, to quick, and double-quick time. Sieur Mottier, or Generalissimo Lafayette, for they are one and the same. And he is General of France, in the King's stead, for four and twenty hours. Sieur Mottier, must step forth with that sublime chivalrous gait of his, solemnly ascend the steps of the fatherland's altar in sight of heaven and of the scarcely breathing earth, and under the creak of those swinging cassolette, pressing his sword's point firmly there, pronounce the oath to king, to law, and nation, not to mention grains with their circulating, in his own name and that of armed France whereat there is waving of banners and a claim sufficient. The National Assembly must swear, standing in its place. The King himself audibly. The King swears, and now be the welkin split with vivats. Let citizens enfranchised embrace, each smiting heartily his palm into his fellows, and armed federates clang their arms. Above all, that floating battery speak. It has spoken to the four corners of France. From eminence to eminence bursts the thunder, faint heard, loud repeated. What a stone cast into what a lake, in circles that do not grow fainter. From Arras to Avignon, from Metz to Bayonne, 
over Orléans and Blois. It rolls in canon recitative. Puy bellows of it amid his granite mountains. Po, where is the shell cradle of great Henri? At far Marseille, one can think, the ruddy evening witnesses it. Over the deep blue Mediterranean waters, the castle of If, ruddy tinted, darts forth from every cannon's mouth its tongue of fire, and all the people shout, Yes, France is free! O oh, glorious France that has burst out so into universal sound and smoke, and attained the Phrygian cap of liberty. In all towns, trees of liberty also may be planted, with or without advantage. Said we not it is the highest stretch attained by the thespian art on this planet, or perhaps attainable? The thespian art, unfortunately, one must still call it, for behold there, on this field of Mars, the national banners, before there could be any swearing, were to be all blessed, a most proper operation, since surely without heaven's blessing bestowed, say even audibly or inaudibly sought, no earthly banner or contrivance can prove victorious. But how the means of doing it? By what thrice divine Franklin thunder rod shall miraculous fire be drawn out of heaven, and descend gently, life-giving, with health to the souls of men? Alas, by the simplest, by two hundred shaven-crowned individuals, in snow-white albs with tricolour girdles, arranged on the steps of Fatherland's altar, and at their head for spokesman, souls overseer Talleyrand Perigord. These shall act as miraculous thunder-rod to such length as they can. O ye deep azure heavens, and thou green all-nursing earth, ye streams ever-flowing, deciduous forests that die and are born again, continually like the sons of men, stone mountains that die daily with every rain-shower, yet are not dead and levelled for ages of ages, nor born again, it seems, but with new world explosions, and such tumultuous seething and tumbling steam half-way to the moon. O thou unfathomable, mystic all, garment and dwelling-place of the unnamed, O spirit, lastly, of man, who mouldest and modelest that unfathomable, unnameable, even as we see, is not there a miracle, that some French mortal should, we say not have believed, but pretended to imagine that he believed, that Talleyrand and two hundred pieces of white calico could do it. Here, however, we are to remark with the sorrowing historians of that day, that suddenly, while Episcopus Talleyrand, long stoled with mitre and tricolor belt, was yet but hitching up the altar steps to do his miracle, the material heaven grew black, a north wind, moaning cold moisture, began to sing, and there descended a very deluge of rain. Sad to see. The thirty stared seats, all round our amphitheatre, get instantaneously slated with mere umbrellas, fallacious when so thick-set. Our antique cassolette become water-pots, their incense smoke gone hissing in a whiff of muddy vapour. Alas, instead of vivats, there is nothing now but the furious peppering and rattling. From three to four hundred thousand human individuals feel that they have a skin, happily impervious. The general's sash runs water. How all military banners droop and will not wave, but lazily flap, as if metamorphosed into painted tin banners. Worse, far worse, these hundred thousand, such is the historian's testimony, of the fairest of France. Their snowy muslins all splashed and draggled. The ostrich feather shrunk shamefully to the backbone of a feather. All caps are ruined, innermost pasteboard molten into its original pap. Beauty no longer swims decorated in her garniture, like love goddess hidden revealed in her paphian clouds, but struggles in disastrous imprisonment in it, for the shape was noticeable. And now only sympathetic interjections, titterings, tee-heings, and resolute good humour will avail. A deluge, an incessant sheet or fluid column of rain. 
such that our overseer's very mitre must be filled, not a mitre, but a filled and leaky fire bucket on his reverend head, regardless of which overseer Talleyrand performs his miracle, the blessing of Talleyrand, another than that of Jacob, is on all the eighty-three departmental flags of France, which wave or flap with such thankfulness as needs. Towards three o'clock the sun beams out again. The remaining evolutions can be transacted under bright heavens, though with decorations much damaged. On Wednesday our federation is consummated, but the festivities last out the week and over into the next. Festivities such as no Baghdad caliph or Aladdin with the lamp could have equalled. There is a jousting on the river, with its water somersets, splashing and ha ha Abbe Fauché, Te Deum Fauché, preaches for his part in the rotunda of the corn market, a harangue on Franklin, for whom the National Assembly has lately gone three days in black. The Mottier and the Peltier tables still groan with viands, roofs ringing with patriotic toasts. On the fifth evening, which is the Christian Sabbath, there is a universal ball. Paris, out of doors and in, man, woman and child, is jigging it to the sound of harp and four-stringed fiddle. The hoariest headed man will tread one other measure under this nether moon. Speechless nurslings, infants as we call them, nepia tecna, crow in arms, and sprawl out numb plumb little limbs, impatient for muscularity they know not why. The stiffest bulk bends more or less, all joints creak. Or out on the earth's breast itself, behold the ruins of the Bastille, all lamplit, allegorically decorated, a tree of liberty sixty feet high, and Phrygian cap on it, of size enormous, under which King Arthur and his round table might have dined. In the depths of the background is a single lugubrious lamp, rendering dim visible one of your iron cages, half buried, and some prison stones, tyranny vanishing downwards, all gone but the skirt, the rest wholly lamp festoons, trees real or of pasteboard, in the similitude of a fairy grove, with this inscription, readable to runner, Ici non danse, dancing here, as indeed had been obscurely foreshadowed by Cagliostro, prophetic quack of quacks, when he four years ago quitted the grim durance to fall into a grimmer of the Roman Inquisition and not quit it. But after all, what is this Bastille business to that of the Champs-Élysées? Thither to these fields well-named Elysian, all feet tend. It is radiant as day with festooned lamps, little oil cups, like variegated fireflies, daintily illumine the highest leaves. Trees there are all sheeted with variegated fire, shedding far a glimmer into the dubious wood. There, under the free sky, do tight-limbed federates with fairest new-found sweethearts, elastic as Diana, and not of that coyness and tart humour of Diana, thread their jocund mazes all through the ambrosial night, and hearts were touched and fired, and seldom surely had our old planet in that huge conic shadow of hers which goes beyond the moon and is named night, curtained such a ballroom. Oh, if, according to Seneca, the very gods look down on a good man struggling with adversity and smile, what must they think of five and twenty million indifferent ones victorious over it for eight days and more? In this way, and in such ways, however, has the Feast of Pikes danced itself off, gallant federates wending homewards towards every point of the compass, with feverish nerves, heart and head much heated. Some of them indeed, as Don Martin's elderly respectable friend from Strasbourg, quite burnt out with liquors, and flickering towards extinction. The Feast of Pikes has danced itself off and become defunct, and the ghost of a feast, nothing of it now remaining but this vision in men's memory, and the place that knew it, for the slope of that Champ de Mars is crumbled to half the original height, now knowing it no more. 
undoubtedly one of the memorablest national high tides. Never, or hardly ever, as we said, was oath sworn with such heart effusion, emphasis, and expenditure of joyance, and then it was broken irremediably within year and day. Ah, why? When the swearing of it was so heavenly joyful, bosom clasped to bosom, and five and twenty million hearts all burning together. O ye inexorable destinies, why? Partly because it was sworn with such overjoyance, but chiefly indeed for an older reason, that sin had come into the world, and misery by sin. These five and twenty millions, if we will consider it, have now henceforth, with that Phrygian cap of theirs, no force over them, to bind and guide, neither in them, more than heretofore, is guiding force or rule of just living. How then, while they all go rushing at such a pace, on unknown ways, with no bridle, towards no aim, can hurly-burly unutterable fail? For verily, not federation rose-pink is the colour of this earth and her work, not by outbursts of noble sentiment, but with far other ammunition shall a man front the world. But how wise, in all cases, to husband your fire, to keep it deep down, rather, as genial radical heat. The explosions, the forcibilist, and never so well directed, are questionable, far oftenest futile, always frightfully wasteful. But think of a man, of a nation of men, spending its whole stock of fire in one artificial firework. So have we seen fond weddings, for individuals like nations have their high tides, celebrated with an outburst of triumph and deray, at which the elderly shook their heads. Better had a serious cheerfulness been, for the enterprise was great. Fond pair, the more triumphant ye feel, and victorious over terrestrial evil, which seems all abolished, the wider-eyed will your disappointment be to find terrestrial evil still extant. And why extant? will each of you cry. Because my false mate has played the traitor. Evil was abolished. I meant faithfully, and did, or would have done. Whereby the oversweet moon of honey changes itself into long years of vinegar, perhaps divulsive vinegar, like Hannibal's. Shall we say, then, the French nation has led royalty, or wooed and teased poor royalty, to lead her to the hymeneal fatherland's altar, in such oversweet manner, and has most thoughtlessly, to celebrate the nuptials with due shine and demonstration, burnt her bed. End of section 12section thirteen of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry book two point two nancy chapter two point two one bouillet dimly visible at metz on the north-eastern frontier a certain brave bouillet last refuge of royalty in all straits and meditations of flight, has for many months hovered occasionally in her eye, some name or shadow of a brave bouillet. Let us now for a little look fixedly at him, till he become a substance and person for us. The man himself is worth a glance. His position and procedure there, in these days, will throw light on many things." for it is with Bouillet as with all French commanding officers, only in a more emphatic degree. The Grand National Federation, we already guess, was but empty sound, or worse. A last, loudest, universal, hip hip hurrah, with full bumpers, in that national lapithy feast of constitution-making, as in loud denial of the palpably existing, as if with hurrahings, you would shut out notice of the inevitable already knocking at the gates. Which new national bumper, one may say, can but deepen the drunkenness, and so the louder it swears brotherhood, will the sooner and the more surely lead to cannibalism. 
Ah, under that fraternal shine and clangour, what a deep world of irreconcilable discords lies momentarily assuaged, damped down for one moment. Respectable military federates have barely got home to their quarters, and the inflammablest, dying burnt up with liquors and kindness, has not yet got extinct. The shine is hardly out of men's eyes, and still blazes, filling all men's memories, when your discords burst forth again very considerably darker than ever. Let us look at Bouillet and see how. Bouillet, for the present, commands in the garrison of Metz, and far and wide over the east and north, being indeed, by a late act of government, with sanction of National Assembly, appointed one of our four supreme generals, Rochambeau and May, men and marshals of note in these days, though to us of small moment, are two of his colleagues, tough old babbling Luckner, also of small moment for us, will probably be the third. Marquis de Bouillet is a determined loyalist, not indeed disinclined to moderate reform, but resolute against immoderate. A man long suspect to patriotism, who has more than once given the august assembly trouble, who would not, for example, take the national oath, as he was bound to do, but always put it off, on this or the other pretext, till an autograph of majesty requested him to do it as a favour. There, in this post, if not of honour, yet of eminence and danger, he waits, in a silent, concentred manner, very dubious of the future. Alone, as he says, or almost alone, of all the old military notabilities, he has not emigrated, but thinks always, in atrabiliar moments, that there will be nothing for him too but to cross the marches. He might cross, say, to Treve or Koblenz, where exiled princes will be one day ranking, or say, over into Luxembourg, where old Brogli loiters and languishes. Or is there not the great dim deep of European diplomacy, where your Calon, your Breteuil, are beginning to hover, dimly discernible. With immeasurable confused outlooks and purposes, with no clear purpose, but this of still trying to do His Majesty a service, Bouillet waits, struggling what he can to keep his district loyal, his troops faithful, his garrisons furnished. He maintains as yet, with his cousin Lafayette, some thin diplomatic correspondence by letter and messenger, chivalrous constitutional professions on the one side, military gravity and brevity on the other, which thin correspondence one can see growing ever the thinner and hollower towards the verge of entire vacuity. A quick, choleric, sharply discerning, stubbornly endeavouring man, with suppressed explosive resolution, with valour, nay, headlong audacity, a man who was more in his place, lion-like defending those windward isles, or, as with military tiger-spring, clutching Nevis and Montserrat from the English, than here, in this suppressed condition, muzzled and fettered by diplomatic pack-threads, looking out for a civil war which may never arrive. Few years ago, Bouillet was to have led a French East Indian expedition, and reconquered, or conquered, Pondicherry and the kingdoms of the sun. But the whole world is suddenly changed, and he with it. Destiny willed it not in that way, but in this. End of section 13section 14 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.2 2 arrears and aristocrats indeed as to the general outlook of things bouillet himself augurs not well of it the french army ever since those old bastille days and earlier has been universally in the questionablest state, and growing daily worse. 
Discipline, which is at all times a kind of miracle and works by faith, broke down then. One sees not with that near prospect of recovering itself. The Garde Francaise played a deadly game, but how they won it, and where the prizes of it, all men know. In that general overturn, we saw the hired fighters refuse to fight. The very Swiss of Châteauvieux, which indeed is a kind of French Swiss from Geneva and the Pays de Vaux, are understood to have declined. Deserters glided over. Royal Allemand itself looked disconsolate, though staunch of purpose. In a word, we there saw military rule in the shape of poor Bussenval, with that convulsive, unmanageable camp of his, passed two martyr days on the Champ de Mars, and then veiling itself, so to speak, under the cloud of night, depart down the left bank of the Seine, to seek refuge elsewhere, this ground having clearly become too hot for it. But what new ground to seek, what remedy to try? Quarters that were uninfected, this, doubtless, with judicious strictness of drilling, were the plan. Alas, in all quarters and places, from Paris onward to the remotest hamlet, is infection, is seditious contagion, inhaled, propagated by contact and converse, till the dullest soldier catch it. There is speech of men in uniform with men not in uniform. Men in uniform read journals and even write in them. There are public petitions or remonstrances, private emissaries and associations. There is discontent, jealousy, uncertainty, sullen, suspicious humour. The whole French army, fermenting in dark heat, glooms ominous, boding good to no one. So that, in the general social dissolution and revolt, we are to have, this deepest and dismalest kind of it, a revolting soldiery? Barren, desolate to look upon, is this same business of revolt under all its aspects. But how infinitely more so when it takes the aspect of military mutiny, the very implement of rule and restraint, whereby all the rest was managed and held in order, has become precisely the frightfulest immeasurable implement of misrule. Like the element of fire, our indispensable all-ministering servant, when it gets the mastery, and becomes conflagration. Discipline we called a kind of miracle. In fact, is it not miraculous how one man moves hundreds of thousands, each unit of whom, it may be, loves him not, and singly fears him not, yet has to obey him, to go hither or go thither, to march and halt, to give death, and even to receive it, as if a fate had spoken. And the word of command becomes, almost in the literal sense, a magic word. Which magic word again, if it be once forgotten, the spell of it once broken. The legions of assiduous ministering spirits rise on you now as menacing fiends. Your free, orderly arena becomes a tumult place of the nether pit, and the hapless magician is rent limb from limb. Military mobs are mobs with muskets in their hands and also with death hanging over their heads, for death is the penalty of disobedience, and they have disobeyed. And now, if all mobs are properly frenzies, and work frenetically with mad fits of hot and cold, fierce rage alternating so incoherently with panic terror, consider what your military mob will be, with such a conflict of duties and penalties, whirled between remorse and fury, and, for the hot fit, loaded firearms in its hand. To the soldier himself, revolt is frightful, and often is perhaps pitiable, and yet so dangerous, it can only be hated, cannot be pitied. An anomalous class of mortals, these poor hired killers, with a frankness which to the moralist in these times seems surprising, they have sworn to become machines, and nevertheless they are still partly men. Let no prudent person in authority remind them of this latter fact, but always let force, let injustice above all, stop short clearly on this side of the rebounding point. 
soldiers as we often say do revolt were it not so several things which are transient in this world might be perennial over and above the general quarrel which all sons of adam maintain with their lot here below the grievances of the french soldiery reduce themselves to two first that their officers are aristocrats secondly that they cheat them of their pay two grievances or rather we might say one capable of becoming a hundred for in that single first proposition that the officers are aristocrats what a multitude of corollaries lie ready it is a bottomless ever-flowing fountain of grievances this what you may call a general raw material of grievance wherefrom individual grievance after grievance will daily body itself forth nay there will even be a kind of comfort in getting it from time to time so embodied speculation of one's pay it is embodied made tangible made denounceable exhalable if only in angry words for unluckily that grand fountain of grievances does exist aristocrats almost all our officers necessarily are they have it in the blood and bone by the law of the case no man can pretend to be the pitifulest lieutenant of militia till he have first verified to the satisfaction of the lion king a nobility of four generations not nobility only but four generations of it this latter is the improvement hit upon in comparatively late years by a certain war minister much pressed for commissions an improvement which did relieve the overpressed war minister but which split france still further into yawning contrasts of commonalty and nobility nay of new nobility and old as if already with your new and old and then with your old older and oldest there were not contrasts and discrepancies enough the general clash whereof men now see and hear and in the singular whirlpool all contrasts gone together to the bottom gone to the bottom or going with uproar without return going everywhere save in the military section of things and there it may be asked can they hope to continue always at the top apparently not it is true in a time of external peace when there is no fighting but only drilling this question how you rise from the ranks may seem theoretical rather but in reference to the rights of man it is continually practical the soldier has sworn to be faithful not to the king only but to the law and the nation do our commanders love the revolution ask all soldiers unhappily no they hate it and love the counter-revolution young epauletted men with quality blood in them poisoned with quality pride do sniff openly with indignation struggling to become contempt at our rights of man as at some new-fangled cobweb which shall be brushed down again old officers more cautious keep silent with closed uncurled lips but one guesses what is passing within nay who knows how under the plausiblest word of command might lie counter-revolution itself sail to exiled princes and the austrian kaiser treacherous aristocrats hoodwinking the small insight of us common men in such manner works that general raw material of grievance disastrous instead of trust and reverence breeding hate endless suspicion the impossibility of commanding and obeying and now when this second more tangible grievance has articulated itself universally in the mind of the common man peculation of his pay peculation of the despicablest sort does exist and has long existed but unless the new declared rights of man and all rights whatsoever be a cobweb it shall no longer exist the french military system seems dying a sorrowful suicidal death nay more citizen as is natural ranks himself against citizen in this cause the soldier finds audience of numbers and sympathy unlimited among the patriot lower classes nor are the higher wanting to the officer the officer still dresses and perfumes himself 
for such sad, unemigrated soirée as there may still be, and speaks his woes. Which woes are they not majesties and natures? Speaks at the same time his gay defiance, his firm-set resolution. Citizens, still more citizenesses, see the right and the wrong. Not the military system alone will die by suicide, but much along with it. As was said, there is yet possible a deepest overturn than any yet witnessed, that deepest upturn of the black-burning sulphurous stratum, whereon all rests and grows. But how these things may act on the rude soldier mind with its military pedantries, its inexperience of all that lies off the parade ground, inexperience as of a child, yet fierceness of a man and vehemence of a Frenchman. It is long that secret communings in mess-room and guard-room, sour looks, thousandfold petty vexations between commander and commanded, measure everywhere the weary military day. Ask Captain Don Martin, an authentic, ingenious, literary officer of horse, who loves the reign of liberty after a sort, yet has had his heart grieved to the quick many times, in the hot southwestern region and elsewhere, and has seen riot, civil battle by daylight and by torchlight, and anarchy hatefuler than death. How insubordinate troopers, with drink in their heads, meet Captain Don Martin and another on the ramparts where there is no escape or side path, and make military salute punctually, for we look calm on them, yet make it in a snappish, almost insulting manner. How one morning they leave all their chamois shirts and superfluous buffs, which they are tired of, laid in piles at the captain's doors, whereat we laugh, as the ass does, eating thistles. Nay, how they knot two forage cords together with universal noisy cursing, with evident intent to hang the quartermaster. All this the worthy captain, looking on it through the ruddy and sable of fond regretful memory, has flowingly written down. Men growl in vague discontent, Officers fling up their commissions and emigrate in disgust. Or let us ask another literary officer, not yet captain, sub-lieutenant only, in the artillery Regiment La Ferre. A young man of twenty-one, not unentitled to speak. The name of him is Napoleon Bonaparte. To such height of sub-lieutenancy has he now got promoted, from Brienne School, five years ago, being found qualified in mathematics by Laplace. He is lying at Auxon, in the west, in these months, not sumptuously lodged, in the house of a barber to whose wife he did not pay the customary degree of respect, or even over at the pavilion, in a chamber with bare walls, the only furniture, an indifferent bed without curtains, two chairs, and in the recess of a window, a table covered with books and papers. His brother Louis sleeps on a coarse mattress in an adjoining room. However, he is doing something great, writing his first book or pamphlet. Eloquent, vehement, letter to Monsieur Matteo Butafuoco, our Corsican deputy, who is not a patriot but an aristocrat, unworthy of deputyship. Joly of Dole is publisher. The literary sub-lieutenant corrects the proofs, sets out on foot from Auxon every morning at four o'clock for Dole. After looking over the proofs, he partakes of an extremely frugal breakfast with Joly, and immediately prepares for returning to his garrison, where he arrives before noon, having thus walked above twenty miles in the course of the morning. This sub-lieutenant can remark that in drawing rooms, on streets, on highways, at inns, everywhere, men's minds are ready to kindle into a flame. That a patriot, if he appear in the drawing room or amid a group of officers, is liable enough to be discouraged, so great is the majority against him. But no sooner does he get into the street or among the soldiers than he feels again as if the whole nation were with him that after the famous oath to the king, to the nation and law, there was a great change, that before this, if ordered to fire on the people, 
he for one would have done it in the king's name, but that after this, in the nation's name, he would not have done it. Likewise that the patriot officers, more numerous too in the artillery and engineers than elsewhere, were few in number, yet that having the soldiers on their side, they ruled the regiment, and did often deliver the aristocrat brother officer out of peril and strait. One day, for example, a member of our own mess roused the mob by singing from the windows of our dining room, O oh Richard, O oh my King, and I had to snatch him from their fury. All which let the reader multiply by ten thousand, and spread it, with slight variations, over all the camps and garrisons of France. The French army seems on the verge of universal mutiny. Universal mutiny? There is in that what may well make patriot constitutionalism and an august assembly shudder. Something behoves to be done, yet what to do no man can tell. Mirabeau proposes even that the soldiery, having come to such a pass, be forthwith disbanded, the whole two hundred and eighty thousands of them, and organised anew. Impossible this in so sudden a manner, cry all men, and yet literally, answer we, it is inevitable, in one manner or another. Such an army, with its four-generation nobles, its peculated pay, and men knotting forage cords to hang their quartermaster, cannot subsist beside such a revolution. Your alternative is a slow-pining chronic dissolution and new organisation, or a swift, decisive one. The agonies spread over years or concentrated into an hour. With a Mirabeau for minister or governor, the latter had been the choice. With no Mirabeau for governor, it will naturally be the former. End of section 14section 15 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.23 bouillet at metz to bouillet in his northeastern circle none of these things are altogether hid many times flight over the marches gleams out on him as a last guidance in such bewilderment. Nevertheless, he continues here, struggling always to hope the best, not from new organisation, but from happy counter-revolution, and return to the old. For the rest, it is clear to him that this same national federation and universal swearing and fraternising of people and soldiers has done incalculable mischief so much that fermented secretly has hereby got vent and become open, national guards and soldiers of the line solemnly embracing one another on all parade fields, drinking, swearing patriotic oaths, fall into disorderly street processions, constitutional unmilitary exclamations and harangues, on which account the regiment Picardy, for one, has to be drawn out in the square of the barracks here at Metz, and sharply harangued by the general himself, but expresses penitence. Far and near, as accounts testify, insubordination has begun grumbling louder and louder. Officers have been seen shut up in their mess rooms, assaulted with clamorous demands, not without menaces. The insubordinate ringleader is dismissed with yellow furlough, yellow infamous thing they call cartouche jaune. But ten new ringleaders rise in his stead, and the yellow cartouche ceases to be thought disgraceful. Within a fortnight, or at furthest a month, of that sublime feast of pikes, the whole French army, demanding arrears, forming reading clubs, frequenting popular societies, is in a state which Bouillet can call by no name but that of mutiny. Bouillet knows it as few do, and speaks by dire experience. Take one instance instead of many. It is still an early day of August, the precise date now undiscoverable, when Bouillet, about to set out for the waters of Aix-la-Chapelle, is once more suddenly summoned to the barracks of Metz. 
the soldiers stand ranked in fighting order muskets loaded the officers all there on compulsion and require with many voiced emphasis to have their arrears paid picardy was penitent but we see it has relapsed the wide space bristles and lowers with mere mutinous armed men brave bouillet advances to the nearest regiment opens his commanding lips to harangue obtains nothing but querulous indignant discordance and the sound of so many thousand livres legally due the moment is trying there are some ten thousand soldiers now in metz and one spirit seems to have spread among them bouillet is firm as the adamant but what shall he do a german regiment named of salm is thought to be of better temper nevertheless salm too may have heard of the precept thou shalt not steal salm too may know that money is money bouillet walks trustfully towards the regiment de salm speaks trustful words but here again is answered by the cry of forty four thousand livres odd sous a cry waxing more and more vociferous as sam's humour mounts which cry as it will produce no cash or promise of cash ends in the wide simultaneous whir of shouldered muskets and a determined quick-time march on the part of sam towards its colonel's house in the next street there to seize the colours and military chest thus does sam for its part strong in the faith that meum is not tuum that fair speeches are not forty four thousand livres odd sous unrestrainable sam tramps to military time quick consuming the way bouillet and the officers drawing sword have to dash into double quick pas de charge or unmilitary running to get the start to station themselves on the outer staircase and stand there with what of death defiance and sharp steel they have sam truculently coiling itself up rank after rank opposite them in such humour as we can fancy which happily has not yet mounted to the murder pitch there will bouillet stand certain at least of one man's purpose in grim calmness awaiting the issue what the intrepidest of men and generals can do is done bouillet though there is a barricading picket at each end of the street and death under his eyes contrives to send for a dragoon regiment with orders to charge the dragoon officers mount the dragoon men will not hope is none there for him the street as we say barricaded the earth all shut out only the indifferent heavenly vault overhead perhaps here or there a timorous householder peering out of window with prayer for bouillet copious rascality on the pavement with prayer for salm there do the two parties stand like chariots locked in a narrow thoroughfare like locked wrestlers at a death grip for two hours they stand bouillet's sword glittering in his hand adamantine resolution clouding his brows for two hours by the clocks of metz moody silent stands salm with occasional clangour but does not fire rascality from time to time urges some grenadier to level his musket at the general who looks on it as a bronze general would and always some corporal or other strikes it up in such remarkable attitude standing on that staircase for two hours does brave bouillet long a shadow dawn on us visibly out of the dimness and become a person for the rest since salm has not shot him at the first instant and since in himself there is no variableness the danger will diminish the mayor a man infinitely respectable with his municipals and trickler sashes finally gains entrance remonstrates perorates promises gets salm persuaded home to its barracks next day our respectable mayor lending the money the officers pay down the half of the demand in ready cash with which liquidation salm pacifies itself and for the present all is hushed up as much as may be such scenes as this of metz or preparations and demonstrations towards such are universal over france 
Dommartin, with his knotted forage cords and piled chamois jackets, is at Strasbourg in the southeast. In these same days, or rather nights, Royal Champagne is shouting, Vive la nation! Au diable les aristocrates! with some thirty lit candles. At Edan, in the far northwest, the garrison of Beach, Deputy Rubel, is sorry to state, went out of the town with drums beating, deposed its officers, and then returned into the town, sabre in hand. Ought not a national assembly to occupy itself with these objects? Military France is everywhere full of sour inflammatory humour, which exhales itself fuliginously, this way or that. A whole continent of smoking flax, which, blown on here or there by any angry wind, might so easily start into a blaze, into a continent of fire. Constitutional patriotism is in deep natural alarm at these things. The august assembly sits diligently deliberating, dare no wise resolve with Mirabeau on an instantaneous disbandment and extinction, finds that a course of palliatives is easier. But at least, and lowest, this grievance of the arrears shall be rectified. A plan, much noised off in those days, under the name Decree of the 6th of August, has been devised for that. Inspectors shall visit all armies, and with certain elected corporals and soldiers able to write, verify what arrears and peculations do lie due, and make them good. Well, if in this way the smoky heat be cooled down, if it be not, as we say, ventilated over much, or by sparks and collision somewhere sent up. End of section 15section 16 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter 2.24 arrears at nancy we are to remark however that of all districts this of bouillet's seems the inflammablest it was always to bouillet and metz that royalty would fly Austria lies near. Here, more than elsewhere, must the disunited people look over the borders into a dim sea of foreign politics and diplomacies with hope or apprehension, with mutual exasperation. It was but in these days that certain Austrian troops marching peaceably across an angle of this region seemed an invasion realised, and there rushed towards Steny with musket on shoulder from all the winds, some 30,000 National Guards, to inquire what the matter was. A matter of mere diplomacy, it proved. The Austrian Kaiser, in haste to get to Belgium, had bargained for this shortcut. The infinite dim movement of European politics waved a skirt over these spaces, passing on its way, like the passing shadow of a condor. And such a winged flight of 30,000 with mixed cackling and crowing, rose in consequence. For, in addition to all, this people, as we said, is much divided. Aristocrats abound. Patriotism has both aristocrats and Austrians to watch. It is Lorraine, this region, not so illuminated as old France. It remembers ancient feudalisms. Nay, within man's memory, it had a court and a king of its own or indeed the splendour of a court and king, without the burden. Then, contrariwise, the mother society, which sits in the Jacobins' church at Paris, has daughters in the towns here, shrill-tongued, driven acrid. Consider how the memory of good King Stanislaus and ages of imperial feudalism may comport with this new acrid evangel, and what a virulence of discord there may be. In all which the soldiery, officers on one side, private men on the other, takes part, and now indeed principal part. A soldiery, moreover, all the hotter here, as it lies the denser, the frontier province requiring more of it. So stands Lorraine. But the capital city, more especially so, the pleasant city of Nancy, 
which faded feudalism loves, where King Stanislaus personally dwelt and shone, has an aristocrat municipality, and then also a daughter society. It has some 40,000 divided souls of population, and three large regiments, one of which is Swiss Chateau Vieux, dear to patriotism ever since it refused fighting, or was thought to refuse, in the Bastille days. Here, unhappily, all evil influences seem to meet concentred. Here, of all places, may jealousy and heat evolve itself. These many months, accordingly, man has been set against man, washed against unwashed, patriot soldier against aristocrat captain, ever the more bitterly, and a long score of grudges has been running up. Nameable grudges, and likewise unnameable, for there is a punctual nature in wrath, and daily, were there but glances of the eye, tones of the voice, and minutest commissions or omissions, it will jot down somewhat to account under the head of sundries, which always swells the sum total. For example, in April last, in those times of preliminary federation, when national guards and soldiers were everywhere swearing brotherhood, and all France was locally federating, preparing for the grand national feast of pikes, it was observed that these nonce officers threw cold water on the whole brotherly business, that they first hung back from appearing at the nonce federation, then did appear, but in mere redingote and undress, with scarcely a clean shirt on, nay that one of them, as the national colours flaunted by in that solemn moment, did, without visible necessity, take occasion to spit. Small, sundries as per journal, but then incessant ones. The aristocrat municipality, pretending to be constitutional, keeps mostly quiet. Not so the daughter society, the five thousand adult male patriots of the place, still less the five thousand female. Not so the young, whiskered or whiskerless, four-generation noblesse in epaulettes, the grim patriot Swiss of Chateau Vieux, effervescent infantry of Regiment du Roi, hot troopers of Mestre des Camps, walled Nancy, which stands so bright and trim, with its straight streets, spacious squares, and Stanislaus' architecture, on the fruitful alluvium of the Meurthe, so bright amid the yellow cornfields in these reaper months, is inwardly but a den of discord, anxiety, inflammability, not far from exploding. Let Bouillet look to it. If that universal military heat, which we liken to a vast continent of smoking flax, do anywhere take fire, his beard, here in Lorraine and Nancy, may the most readily of all get singed by it. Bouillet, for his part, is busy enough, but only with the general superintendence, getting his pacified psalm and all other still tolerable regiments marched out of Metz to southward towns and villages, to rural cantonments, as at Vic, Marsal, and thereabout, by the still waters, where is plenty of horse forage, sequestered parade ground, and the soldier's speculative faculty can be stilled by drilling. Salm, as we said, received only half payment of arrears, naturally not without grumbling. Nevertheless, that scene of the drawn sword may, after all, have raised Bouillet in the mind of Salm. For men and soldiers love intrepidity and swift, inflexible decision, even when they suffer by it. As indeed, is not this fundamentally the quality of qualities for a man? A quality which, by itself, is next to nothing, since inferior animals, asses, dogs, even mules have it, Yet, in due combination, it is the indispensable basis of all. Of Nancy and its heats, Bouillet, commander of the whole, knows nothing special, understands generally that the troops in that city are perhaps the worst. The officers there have it all, as they have long had it, to themselves, and unhappily seem to manage it ill. Fifty yellow furloughs, given out in one batch, do surely betoken difficulties. But what was patriotism to think of certain light-fencing fusiliers set on 
or supposed to be set on, to insult the Grenadier Club, consider its speculative grenadiers, and that reading room of theirs. With shoutings, with hootings, till the speculative grenadier drew his side-arms too, and there ensued battery and duels. Nay, more, are not swashbucklers of the same stamp sent out visibly, or sent out presumably now in the dress of soldiers, to pick quarrels with the citizens, now disguised as citizens, to pick quarrels with the soldiers? For a certain Roussier, expert in fence, was taken in the very fact, four officers, presumably of tender years, hounding him on, who thereupon fled precipitately. Fence-master Roussier hailed to the guard-house, had sentence of three months' imprisonment. But his comrades demanded yellow furlough for him of all persons. Nay, thereafter, they produced him on parade, capped him in paper helmet inscribed Iscariot, marched him to the gate of the city, and there sternly commanded him to vanish for evermore. On all which suspicions, accusations, and noisy procedure, and on enough of the like continually accumulating, the officer could not but look with disdainful indignation, perhaps disdainfully express the same in words, and soon after fly over to the Austrians. So that when it here as elsewhere comes to the question of arrears, the humour and procedure is of the bitterest. Regiment Mestre de Con, getting, amid loud clamour, some three gold louis a man, which have as usual to be borrowed from the municipality. Swiss Chateau Vieux applying for the like, but getting instead instantaneous curroir, or cat o' nine tails, with subsequent unsufferable hisses from the women and children. Regiment de Loire, sick of hope deferred, at length seizing its military chest and marching it to quarters, but next day marching it back again, through streets all struck silent. Unordered paradings and clamours not without strong liquor, objurgation, insubordination. Your military-ranked arrangement going all, as the typographers say of set types in a similar case, rapidly to pie. Such is Nancy in these early days of August, the sublime feast of pikes not yet a month old. Constitutional patriotism, at Paris and elsewhere, may well quake at the news. War Minister La Tour de Pain runs breathless to the National Assembly, with a written message that all is burning. Tout brûle, tout presse. The National Assembly, on spur of the instant, renders such décret and order to submit and repent, as he requires, if it will avail anything. On the other hand, journalism, through all its throats, gives hoarse outcry, condemnatory, elegiac, applausive. The 48 sections lift up voices. Sonorous Brewer, or call him now Colonel Santerre, is not silent in the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. For meanwhile, the Nancy soldiers have sent a deputation of ten, furnished with documents and proofs, who will tell another story than the all-is-burning one, which deputed ten, before ever they reach the assembly hall, assiduous La Tour de Pain picks up, and on warrant of Mayor Bailly, claps in prison, most unconstitutionally, for they had officers' furloughs. Whereupon Saint-Antoine, in indignant uncertainty of the future, closes its shops. Is Bouillet a traitor, then, sold to Austria? In that case, these poor private sentinels have revolted mainly out of patriotism. New deputation, deputation of National Guardsmen now, sets forth from Nancy to enlighten the Assembly. It meets the old deputed ten returning, quite unexpectedly, unhanged and proceeds thereupon with better prospects, but effects nothing. Deputations, government messengers, orderlies at hand gallops, alarms, thousand-voiced rumours, go vibrating continually, backwards and forwards, scattering distraction. Not till the last week of August does Monsieur de Malseigne, selected as inspector, get down to the scene of mutiny, with authority, with cash and decree of the 6th of August. He now shall see these arrears liquidated, 
justice done, or at least tumult quashed. End of section 16《Section 17 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.25 Inspector Malsain Of Inspector Malsain, we discern by direct light that he is of Herculean stature, and infer with probability that he is of truculent mustachioed aspect, for royalist officers now leave the upper lip unshaven, that he is of indomitable bull heart, and also, unfortunately, of thick bull head. On Tuesday, the 24th of August, 1790, he opens session as inspecting commissioner, meets those elected corporals and soldiers that can write, he finds the accounts of Chateau Vieux to be complex, to require delay and reference. He takes to haranguing, to reprimanding, ends amid audible grumbling. Next morning he resumes session, not at the town hall as prudent municipals counselled, but once more at the barracks. Unfortunately, Chateau Vieux, grumbling all night, will now hear of no delay or reference. From reprimanding on his part, it goes to bullying, answered with continual cries of Jugez tout de suite! Judge it at once. Whereupon Monsieur de Malsain will off in a huff. But lo, Chateau Vieux, swarming all about the barrack court, has sentries at every gate. Monsieur de Malsain, demanding egress, cannot get it, though Commandant de Noux backs him, can get only Jugez tout de suite. Here is a nodus. Bull-hearted Monsieur de Malsain draws his sword and will force egress. Confused splutter. Monsieur de Malsain's sword breaks. He snatches Commandant de Nose. The sentry is wounded. Monsieur de Malsain, whom one is loath to kill, does force egress, followed by Chateauvieux all in disarray. A spectacle to Nancy. Monsieur de Malsain walks at a sharp pace, yet never runs, wheeling from time to time with menaces and movements of fence, and so reaches de Nau's house unhurt, which house Chateau Vieux, in an agitated manner, invests, hindered as yet from entering by a crowd of officers formed on the staircase. Monsieur de Malsain retreats by back ways to the town hall, flustered though undaunted amid an escort of national guards from the town hall he on the morrow emits fresh orders fresh plans of settlement with chateau vieux to none of which will chateau vieux listen whereupon finally he amid noise enough emits orders that chateau vieux shall march on the morrow morning and quarter at saint louis chateau vieux flatly refuses marching Monsieur de Malsain takes act, due notarial protest, of such refusal, if happily that may avail him. This is end of Thursday, and indeed of Monsieur de Malsain's inspectorship, which has lasted some fifty hours. To such length in fifty hours has he unfortunately brought it. Mestre de Con and Regiment de Roi hang, as it were, fluttering. Chateauvieux is clean gone in what way we see. Overnight, an aide-de-camp of Lafayette's, stationed here for such emergency, sends swift emissaries far and wide to summon national guards. The slumber of the country is broken by clattering hoofs, by loud fraternal knockings. Everywhere the constitutional patriot must clutch his fighting gear and take the road for Nancy. And thus the Herculean inspector has sat all Thursday among terror-struck municipals, a centre of confused noise. All Thursday, Friday, and till Saturday towards noon. Chateauvieux, in spite of the notarial protest, will not march a step. As many as 4,000 National Guards are dropping or pouring in, uncertain what is expected of them. 
still more uncertain what will be obtained of them. For all is uncertainty, commotion, and suspicion. There goes a word that Bouillet, beginning to bestir himself in the rural cantonments eastward, is but a royalist traitor, that Chateauvieux and patriotism are sold to Austria, of which latter Monsieur de Malsaigne is probably some agent. Mestre de Caen and Roy flutter still more questionably. Chateauvieux, far from marching, waves red flags out of two carriages in a passionate manner along the streets, and next morning answers its officers, Pay us then, and we will march with you to the world's end. Under which circumstances, towards noon on Saturday, Monsieur de Malsaigne thinks it were good perhaps to inspect the ramparts, on horseback. He mounts accordingly, with escort of three troopers. At the gate of the city he bids two of them wait for his return, and with the third, a trooper to be depended upon, he gallops off for Luneville, where lies a certain carabineer regiment not yet in a mutinous state. The two left troopers soon get uneasy, discover how it is, and give the alarm. Mestre de Caen, to the number of a hundred, saddles in frantic haste, as if sold to Austria, gallops out pell-mell in chase of its inspector, and so they spur, and the inspector spurs, careering with noise and jingle up the valley of the river Meurthe, towards Luneville and the midday sun, through an astonished country, indeed almost their own astonishment. What a hunt, Actian-like, which Actian de Malsaigne happily gains. To arms, ye carabineers of Luneville, to chastise mutinous men, insulting your general officer, insulting your own quarters. Above all things, fire soon, lest there be parleying, and you refuse to fire. The carabiners fire soon, exploding upon the first stragglers of Mestre de Caen, who shrink at the very flash, and fall back hastily on Nancy, in a state not far from distraction, panic and fury, sold to Austria without an if. So much per regiment, the very sums can be specified, and traitorous Malsaigne is fled. Help, O heaven, help, thou earth, ye unwashed patriots, ye too are sold like us. Effervescent Regiment de Roi primes its firelocks, Mestre de Caen saddles wholly, Commandant de Nau is seized, is flung in prison with a canvas shirt, Sarrault de Toile about him. Chateauvieux bursts up the magazines, distributes three thousand fusils to a patriot people. Austria shall have a hot bargain. Alas, the unhappy hunting dogs, as we said, have hunted away their huntsmen, and do now run howling and baying on what trail they know not, nigh rabid. And so there is tumultuous march of men through the night, with halt on the heights of Flanval, whence Luneville can be seen all illuminated. Then there is parley at four in the morning, and re-parley. Finally there is agreement. The carabiners give in. Malsaigne is surrendered, with apologies on all sides. After weary, confused hours, he is even got under way. The Lunevillers all turning out in the idle Sunday to see such departure, home going of mutinous Mestre de Caen, with its inspector captive. Mestre de Caen accordingly marches. The Lunevillers look. See, at the corner of the first street, our inspector bounds off again, fool hearted as he is amid the slash of sabres, the crackle of musketry, and escapes full gallop with only a ball lodged in his buff jerkin, the Herculean man. And yet it is an escape to no purpose, for the carabiners, to whom after the hardest Sunday's ride on record he has come circling back, stand deliberating by their nocturnal watchfires, deliberating of Austria, of traitors, and the rage of Mestre de Caen. So that, on the whole, the next sight we have is that of Monsieur de Malsaigne, on the Monday afternoon, faring bull-hearted through the streets of Nancy, in open carriage, 
a soldier standing over him with drawn sword, amid the furies of the women, hedges of national guards, and confusion of Babel, to the prison beside Commandant de Nau. That, finally, is the lodging of Inspector Malsain. Surely it is time Bouillet were drawing near, the country all round, alarmed with watch-fires, illuminated towns, and marching and rout, has been sleepless these several nights. Nancy, with its uncertain national guards, with its distributed fusils, mutinous soldiers, black panic, and red-hot ire, is not a city, but a bedlam. End of section 17《Section 18 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.26 Bouillet at Nancy Haste with help, thou brave Bouillet. If swift help come not, all is now verily burning, and may burn, to what lengths and breadths. Much in these hours depends on Bouillet. As it shall now fare with him, the whole future may be this way or be that. If, for example, he were to loiter jubitating and not come, if he were to come and fail, the whole soldiery of France to blaze into mutiny, national guards going some this way, some that, and royalism to draw its rapier, and sansculottism to snatch its pike, and the spirit of Jacobism, as yet young, girt with sun rays, to grow instantaneously mature, girt with hell-fire, as mortals, in one night of deadly crisis, have had their heads turned grey. Brave Bouillet is advancing fast, with the old inflexibility, gathering himself, unhappily in small affluences, from east, from west, and north. And now, on Tuesday morning, the last day of the month, he stands all concentred, unhappily still in small force, at the village of Fruard, within some few miles. Son of Adam, with a more dubious task before him, is not in this world this Tuesday morning. A weltering, inflammable sea of doubt and peril, and Bouillet sure of simply one thing, his own determination. Which one thing, indeed, may be worth many. He puts a most firm face on the matter. Submission or unsparing battle and destruction, twenty-four hours to make your choice. This was the tenor of his proclamation, thirty copies of which he sent yesterday to Nancy, all which we find were intercepted and not posted. Nevertheless, at half-past eleven this morning, seemingly by way of answer, there does wait on him at Fruard some deputation from the mutinous regiments, from the Nancy municipals, to see what can be done. Bouillet receives this deputation in a large open court adjoining his lodging. Pacified Sam and the rest attend also, being invited to do it, all happily still in the right humour. The mutineers pronounce themselves with a decisiveness which to Bouillet seems insolence, and happily to Sam also. Sam, forgetful of the Met's staircase and sabre, demands that the scoundrels be hanged there and then. Bouillet represses the hanging, but answers that mutinous soldiers have one course, and not more than one, to liberate with heartfelt contrition Monsieur Donneau and de Malsain, to get ready forthwith for marching off, whither he shall order, and submit and repent, as the National Assembly has decreed, as he yesterday did in thirty printed placards proclaim. These are his terms, unalterable as the decrees of destiny, which terms as they, the mutineer deputies, seemingly do not accept. It were good for them to vanish from this spot, and even promptly. With him too, in few instants, the word will be forward. The mutineer deputies vanish, not unpromptly. The municipal ones, anxious beyond right for their own individualities, prefer abiding with Bouillet. Brave Bouillet, though he puts a most firm face on the matter, knows his position full well, how at Nancy, what with rebellious soldiers, with uncertain national guards, and so many distributed fusils, 
there rage and roar some ten thousand fighting men, while with himself is scarcely the third part of that number, in national guards also uncertain, in mere pacified regiments, for the present full of rage and clamour to march, but whose rage and clamour may next moment take such a fatal new figure, on the top of one uncertain billow therewith to calm billows. Bouillet must abandon himself to fortune, who is said sometimes to favour the brave. At half-past twelve, the mutineer deputies having vanished, our drums beat, we march, for Nancy. Let Nancy bethink itself, then, for Bouillet has thought and determined. And yet how shall Nancy think? Not a city, but a bedlam. Grim Chateauvieux is for defence to the death forces the municipality to order by tap of drum all citizens acquainted with artillery to turn out and assist in managing the cannon on the other hand effervescent regiment du roi is drawn up in its barracks quite disconsolate hearing the humour salmazin and ejaculates dolefully from its thousand throats le roi le roi law law Mestre de Camp blusters with profane swearing in mixed terror and furore. National guards look this way and that, not knowing what to do. What a bedlam city! As many plans as heads. All ordering, none obeying. Quiet none, except the dead, who sleep underground, having done their fighting. And behold, Bouillet proves as good as his word. At half-past two, scouts report that he is within half a league of the gates, rattling along with cannon and array, breathing nothing but destruction. A new deputation, municipals, mutineers, officers, goes out to meet him, with passionate entreaty for yet one other hour. Bouillet grants an hour. Then, at the end thereof, no de no or malsaigne, appearing as promised, he rolls his drums and again takes the road. Towards four o'clock, the terror-struck townsmen may see him face to face. His cannons rattle there in their carriages. His vanguard is within thirty paces of the gate Stanislaus. Onward like a planet, by appointed times, by law of nature. What next? Lo, flag of truce and chamade. Conjuration to halt. Malsen and Dunot are on the street, coming hither, the soldiers all repentant, ready to submit and march. Adamantine, Bouillet's look alters not, yet the word halt is given. Gladder moment he never saw, joy of joys. Malsain and Dunot do verily issue, escorted by national guards, from streets all frantic, with sail to Austria and so forth. They salute Bouillet unscathed. Bouillet steps aside to speak with them, and with other heads of the town there having already ordered by what gates and routes the mutineer regiments shall file out. Such colloquy with these two general officers and other principal townsmen was natural enough. Nevertheless, one wishes Bouillet had postponed it, and not stepped aside. Such tumultuous, inflammable masses, tumbling along, making way for each other, this of keen nitrous oxide, that of sulphurous fire-damp, were it not well to stand between them, keeping them well separate, till the space be cleared? Numerous stragglers of Chateauvieux and the rest have not marched with their main columns, which are filing out by the appointed gates, taking station in the open meadows. National guards are in a state of nearly distracted uncertainty. The populace, armed and unharmed, roll openly delirious, betrayed, sold to the Austrians, sold to the aristocrats. There are loaded cannons with lit matches among them, and Bouillet's vanguard is halted within thirty paces of the gate. Command dwells not in that mad, inflammable mass, which smoulders and tumbles there in blind, smoky rage, which will not open the gate when summoned, says it will open the cannon's throat sooner. Cannonade not, O oh friends, or be it through my body, cries heroic young de C young captain of Roy, clasping the murderous engine in his arms and holding it, Chateauvieux, Swiss, by main force, with oaths and menaces, wrench off the heroic youth, who, undaunted, amid still louder oaths, seats himself on the touch-hole, amid still louder oaths, with ever louder clangour, 
and alas, with the loud crackle of first one and then three other muskets, which explode into his body, which roll it in the dust, and do also, in the loud madness of such moment, bring lit cannon match to ready priming, and so, with one thunderous belch of grape shot, blast some fifty of Bouillet's vanguard into air. Fatal. That sputter of the first musket shot has kindled such a cannon shot, such a death blaze, and all is now red hot madness. Conflagration as of Tophet. With demoniac rage, the Bouillet vanguard storms through that gate Stanislaus, with fiery sweep, sweeps mutiny clear away to death or into shelters and cellars, from which latter again mutiny continues firing. The right regiment hear it in their meadow. They rush back again through the nearest gates. Bouillet gallops in, distracted, inaudible, and now has begun in Nancy, as in that doomed hall of the Nibelungen, a murder grim and great. Miserable. Such scene of dismal, aimless madness as the anger of heaven but rarely permits among men. From cellar or from garret, from open street in front, from successive corners of cross streets on each hand, Chateau View and patriotism keep up the murderous rolling fire on murderous, not unpatriotic fires. Your blue national captain, riddled with balls, one hardly knows on whose side fighting, requests to be laid on the colours to die. The patriotic woman, name not given, deed surviving, screams to Chateau View that it must not fire the other cannon, and even flings a pail of water on it, since screaming avails not. Thou shalt fight, thou shalt not fight. And with whom shalt thou fight? Could tumult awaken the old dead? Burgundian Charles the Bold might stir from under that rotunda of his, never since he, raging, sank in the ditches and lost life and diamond, was such a noise heard here. Three thousand, as some count, lie mangled, gory. The half of Chateau View has been shot, without need of court-martial. Cavalry of Messo de Camp, or their foes, can do little. Regiment de Roi was persuaded to its barracks, stands there palpitating. Bouillet, armed with the terrors of the law and favoured of fortune, finally triumphs. In two murderous hours he has penetrated to the grand squares, dauntless, though with loss of forty officers and five hundred men. The shattered remnants of Chateauvieux are seeking covert. Regiment de Roi, not effervescent now, alas, no, but having effervesced, will offer to ground its arms, will march in a quarter of an hour. Nay, these poor effervesced require escort to march with and get it, though they are thousands strong and have thirty ball cartridges a man. The sun is not yet down when peace, which might have come bloodless, has come bloody. The mutinous regiments are on march, doleful, on their three routes. And from Nancy rises wail of women and men, the voice of weeping and desolation, the city weeping for its slain who awaken not. These streets are empty but for victorious patrols. Thus has fortune, favouring the brave, dragged Bouillet, as himself says, out of such a frightful peril by the hair of the head. An intrepid adamantine man, this Bouillet. Had he stood in old Broglie's place in those Bastille days, it might have been all different. He has extinguished mutiny and immeasurable civil war. Not for nothing, as we see yet at a rate which he and constitutional patriotism considers cheap. Nay, as for Bouillet, he, urged by subsequent contradiction which arose, declares coldly it was rather against his own private mind and more by public military rule of duty that he did extinguish it, immeasurable civil war being now the only chance. Urged, we say, by subsequent contradiction. Civil war, indeed, is chaos and in all vital chaos there is new order shaping itself free. But what a faith this, that of all new orders out of chaos and possibility of man and his universe. Louis Sixteenth and two-chamber monarchy were precisely the one that would shape itself. 
It is like undertaking to throw deuce ace, say only five hundred successive times, and any other throw to be fatal, for Bouillet. Rather thank fortune and heaven, always, thou intrepid Bouillet, and let contradiction of its way. Civil war, conflagrating universally over France at this moment, might have led to one thing or to another thing. Meanwhile, to quench conflagration, wheresoever one finds it, wheresoever one can. This, in all times, is the rule for man and general officer. But at Paris, so agitated and divided, fancy how it went, when the continually vibrating orderlies vibrated thither, at hard gallop, with such questionable news. High is the gratulation, and also deep the indignation. An august assembly, by overwhelming majorities, passionately thanks Bouillet, a king's autograph, the voices of all loyal, all constitutional men, run to the same tenor. A solemn national funeral service for the law defenders slain at Nancy is said and sung in the Champ de Mars. Bouillet, Lafayette, and National Guards, all except the few that protested, assist. With pomp and circumstance, with episcopal calicoes in tricolor girdles, altar of fatherland smoking with catalettes or incense kettles, the vast Champ de Mars wholly hung round with black mort cloth, which mort cloth and expenditure Marat thinks had better have been laid out in bread in these dear days and given to the hungry living patriot. On the other hand, living patriotism and Saint Antoine, which we have seen noisily closing its shops and such like, assembles now to the number of 40,000, and with loud cries under the very windows of the thanking National Assembly, demands revenge for murdered brothers, judgment on Bouillet, and instant dismissal of War Minister La Tour du Pin. At sound and sight of which things, if not War Minister La Tour, yet adored Minister Necker, sees good on the 3rd of September 1790, to withdraw softly, almost privily, with an eye to the recovery of his health, home to native Switzerland, not as he last came, lucky to reach it alive. Fifteen months ago we saw him coming with escort of horse, with sound of clarion and trumpet, and now at arcis sur Alp, while he departs unescorted soundless, the populace and municipals stop him as a fugitive, are not unlike massacring him as a traitor. The National Assembly, consulted on the matter, gives him free egress as a nullity. Such an unstable drift-mould of accident is the substance of this lower world, for them that dwell in houses of clay. So, especially in hot regions and times, do the proudest palaces we build of it take wings and become Sahara sand palaces, spinning many pillared in the whirlwind and bury us under their sand. In spite of the 40,000, the National Assembly persists in its thanks, and Royalist La Tour du Pin continues minister. The 40,000 assemble next day as loud as ever, roll towards La Tour's hotel, find cannon on the porch steps with flambeau lit, and have to retire elsewhither and digest their spleen or reabsorb it into the blood. Over in Lorraine, meanwhile, they of the distributed fusils, ringleaders of Mestre de Camp, of Roi, have got marked out for judgment, yet shall never get judged. Briefer is the doom of Chateau Vieux. Chateau Vieux is, by Swiss law, given up for instant trial in court martial of its own officers which court-martial, with all brevity, in not many hours, has hanged some twenty-three on conspicuous gibbets, marched some three-score in chains to the galleys, and so, to appearance, finished the matter off. Hanged men do cease for ever from this earth, but out of chains and the galleys there may be resuscitation in triumph, resuscitation for the chained hero and even for the chained scoundrel or semi-scoundrel, Scottish John Knox, such world hero as we know, sat once nevertheless pulling grim taciturn at the oar of French galley in the water of lore, and even flung their Virgin Mary over instead of kissing her, as a pented bread or timber virgin who could naturally swim. 
so ye of Chateau View tug patiently, not without hope. But indeed, at Nancy generally, aristocracy rides triumphant, rough. Bouillet is gone again the second day. An aristocratic municipality with free course is as cruel as it had been before cowardly. The daughter society, as the mother of the whole mischief, lies ignominiously suppressed. The prisons can hold no more. Bereaved, downbeaten patriotism murmurs, not loud but deep. Here, and in the neighbouring towns, flattened balls picked from the streets of Nancy are worn as buttonholes, balls flattened in carrying death to patriotism. Men wear them there in perpetual memento of revenge. Mutineer deserters roam the woods, have to demand charity at the musket's end. All is dissolution, mutual rancour, gloom and despair till National Assembly commissioners arrive with a steady, gentle flame of constitutionalism in their hearts, who gently lift up the downtrodden, gently pull down the two uplifted, reinstate the daughter society, recall the mutineer deserter, gradually levelling, strive in all wise ways to smooth and soothe. With such gradual mild levelling on the one side, as with solemn funeral service, Cassolette, Courts martial, national thanks. All that officiality can do is done. The buttonhole will drop its flat ball. The black ashes, so far as may be, get green again. This is the affair of Nancy, by some called the massacre of Nancy. Properly speaking, the unsightly wrong side of that thrice glorious feast of pikes, the right side of which formed a spectacle for the very gods right side and wrong, lie always so near. The one was in July, in August the other. Theatres, the theatres over in London, are bright with their pasteboard simulacrum of that federation of the French people brought out as drama. This of Nancy, we may say, though not played in any pasteboard theatre, did for many months enact itself and even walk spectrally in all French heads for the news of it fly peeling through all France, awakening in town and village, in club-room, mess-room, to the utmost borders, some mimic reflex or imaginative repetition of the business, always with the angry, questionable assertion, it was right, it was wrong. Whereby come controversies, duels, embitterment, vain jargon, the hastening forward, the augmenting and intensifying, of whatever new explosions lie in store for us. Meanwhile, at this cost or at that, the mutiny, as we say, is stilled. The French army has neither burst up in universal, simultaneous delirium, nor been at once disbanded, put an end to, and made new again. It must die in the chronic manner, through years, by inches, with partial revolts, as of breast sailors or the like, which dare not spread with men unhappy, insubordinate, officers unhappier, in royalist mustachios, taking horse, singly, or in bodies, across the Rhine. Sick dissatisfaction, sick disgust on both sides, the army moribund, fit for no duty, till it do, in that unexpected manner, phoenix-like, with long throws, get both dead and new-born. Then start forth strong, nay stronger, and even strongest. Thus much was the brave Bouillet hitherto fated to do, wherewith let him fade again into dimness, and at Metz or the rural cantonments, assiduously drilling, mysteriously diplomatising, in scheme within scheme, hover as formerly a faint shadow, the hope of royalty. End of section 18section 19 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Book 2.3, The Tuileries. Chapter 2.3.1, Epimenides. How true that there is nothing dead in this universe, 
that what we call dead is only changed, its forces working in inverse order. The leaf that lies rotting in moist winds, says one, has still force, else how could it rot? Our whole universe is but an infinite complex of forces, thousandfold, from gravitation up to thought and will, man's freedom environed with necessity of nature, in all which nothing at any moment slumbers, but all is for ever awake and busy. The thing that lies isolated, inactive, thou shalt nowhere discover. Seek everywhere from the granite mountain, slow mouldering since creation, to the passing cloud vapour, to the living man, to the action, to the spoken word of man. The word that is spoken, as we know, flies irrevocable, not less but more the action that is done. The gods themselves, sings Pindar, cannot annihilate the action that is done. No, this, once done, is done always, cast forth into endless time, and, long conspicuous or soon hidden, must verily work and grow for ever there, an indestructible new element in the infinite of things. Or indeed, what is this infinite of things itself, which men name universe, but an action, a sum total of actions and activities, the living ready-made sum total of these three, which calculation cannot add, cannot bring on its tablets. Yet the sum, we say, is written visible. All that has been done, all that is doing, all that will be done. Understand it well, the thing thou beholdest, that thing is an action, the product and expression of exerted force. The all of things is an infinite conjugation of the verb to do. Shoreless fountain ocean of force, of power to do, wherein force rolls and circles, billowing, many streamed, harmonious, wide as immensity, deep as eternity, beautiful and terrible, not to be comprehended. This is what man names existence and universe, this thousand-tinted flame image, at once veil and revelation, reflex such as he in his poor brain and heart can paint, of one unnameable, dwelling in inaccessible light. From beyond the star galaxies, from before the beginning of days, it billows and rolls, round thee, nay, thyself art of it, in this point of space where thou now standest, in this moment which thy clock measures. Or apart from all transcendentalism, is it not a plain truth of sense, which the duller mind can even consider as a truism, that human things wholly are in continual movement, and action and reaction, working continually forward, phases after phases, by unalterable laws, towards prescribed issues. How often must we say, and yet not rightly lay to heart, the seed that is sown, it will spring. Given the summer's blossoming, then there is also given the autumnal withering. So is it ordered not with seed fields only, but with transactions, arrangements, philosophies, societies, French revolutions, whatsoever man works with in this lower world. The beginning holds in it the end, and all that leads thereto, as the acorn does the oak and its fortunes. Solemn enough did we think of it, which unhappily and also happily we do not very much. Thou there canst begin, the beginning is for thee and there, but where, and of what sort, and for whom, will the end be? All grows, and seeks, and endures its destinies. Consider likewise how much grows as the trees do, whether we think of it or not. So that when your Epimenides, your somnolent Peter Klaus, since named Rip Van Winkle, awakens again, he finds it a changed world. In that seven years' sleep of his, so much has changed. All that is without us will change while we think not of it, much even that is within us. The truth that was yesterday a restless problem has today grown a belief burning to be uttered. On the morrow, contradiction has exasperated it into mad fanaticism. Obstruction has dulled it into sick inertness. It is sinking towards silence, of satisfaction or of resignation. 
Today is not yesterday, for man or for thing. Yesterday there was the oath of love. Today has come the curse of hate. Not willingly, ah, no, but it could not help coming. The golden radiance of youth. Would it willingly have tarnished itself into the dimness of old age? Fearful, how we stand enveloped, deep sunk, in that mystery of time, and are sons of time, fashioned and woven out of time, and on us, and on all that we have, or see, or do, is written, Rest not, continue not, forward to thy doom. But in seasons of revolution, which indeed distinguish themselves from common seasons, by their velocity mainly, your miraculous seven-sleeper might, with miracle enough, wake sooner. Not by the century, or seven years, need he sleep. Often not by the seven months. Fancy, for example, some new Peter Klaus, sated with the jubilee of that Federation Day, had lain down, say directly after the blessing of Talleyrand, and reckoning it all safe now, had fallen composedly asleep under the timber-work of the Fatherland's altar, to sleep there not twenty-one years, but, as it were, year and day. The cannonading of Nancy, so far off, does not disturb him, nor does the black mortcloth, close at hand, nor the requiems chanted, and minute guns, incense pans, and concourse right over his head. None of these, but Peter sleeps through them all. Through one circling year, as we say, from July 14th, 1790, till July the 17th of 1791. But on that latter day, no Klaus, nor most leaden Epimenides, only the dead could continue sleeping. And so our miraculous Peter Klaus awakens. With what eyes, O oh Peter? Earth and sky have still their joyous July look, and the Champ de Mars is multitudinous with men. But the jubilee huzzahing has become bedlam shrieking, of terror and revenge, not blessing of Talleyrand, or any blessing, but cursing, imprecation, and shrill wail. Our cannon salvos are turned to sharp shot, for swinging of incense pans and eighty-three departmental banners, we have waving of the one sanguinous drapeau rouge. Thou foolish Klaus, the one lay in the other, the one was the other, minus time. Even as Hannibal's rock-rending vinegar lay in the sweet new wine. That sweet federation was of last year. This sour divulsion is the self-same substance, only older by the appointed days. No miraculous Klaus or Epimenides sleeps in these times, and yet may not many a man, if of due opacity and levity, act the same miracle in a natural way. We mean, with his eyes open. Eyes has he, but he sees not, except what is under his nose. With a sparkling briskness of glance, as if he not only saw, but saw through, such a one goes whisking, assiduous, in his circle of officialities, not dreaming but that it is the whole world, as indeed, where your vision terminates, does not inanity begin there? and the world's end clearly declares itself to you, whereby our brisk, sparkling, assiduous, official person, call him, for instance, Lafayette, suddenly startled, after year and day, by huge grape-shot tumult, stares not less astonished at it than Peter Klaus would have done. Such natural miracle Lafayette can perform, and indeed not he only, but most other officials, non-officials, and generally the whole French people can perform it, and do bounce up ever and anon, like amazed seven sleepers awakening, awakening amazed at the noise they themselves make. So strangely is freedom, as we say, environed in necessity. Such a singular somnambulism of conscious and unconscious, of voluntary and involuntary, is this life of man. If anywhere in the world there was astonishment that the Federation Oath went into grape-shot, surely of all persons the French, first swearers and then shooters, 
felt astonished the most. Alas, offences must come. The sublime feast of pikes, with its effulgence of brotherly love, unknown since the age of gold, has changed nothing. That prurient heat in twenty-five millions of hearts is not cooled thereby, but is still hot, nay, hotter. Lift off the pressure of command from so many millions, all pressure or binding rule, except such melodramatic federation oath as they have bound themselves with. For thou shalt was from of old the condition of man's being, and his weal and blessedness was in obeying that. Woe for him when, were it on hest of the clearest necessity, rebellion, disloyal isolation, and mere I will, becomes his rule. But the gospel of Jean-Jacques has come, and the first sacrament of it has been celebrated. All things, as we say, are got into hot and hotter prurience, and must go on pruriently fermenting in continual change, noted or unnoted. Worn out with disgusts, captain after captain in royalist mustachios mounts his war-horse, or his rosinante, war garon, and rides minutary across the Rhine, till all have ridden. Neither does civic emigration cease. Seigneur after seigneur must in like manner ride or roll, impelled to it, and even compelled. For the very peasants despise him, in that he dare not join his order and fight. Can he bear to have a distaff, a canoe, sent to him, say in copperplate shadow by post, or fixed up in wooden reality over his gate lintel, as if he were no Hercules, but an omphalae? Such scutcheon they forward to him diligently from behind the Rhine till he too bestir himself and march, and, in sour humour, another lord of land is gone, not taking the land with him. Nay, what of captains and emigrating seigneurs? There is not an angry word on any of those twenty-five million French tongues, and indeed not an angry thought in their hearts, but is some fraction of the great battle. Add many successions of angry words together, you have the manual brawl. Add brawls together, with the festering sorrows they leave, and they rise to riots and revolts. One reverend thing after another ceases to meet reverence. Invisible material combustion, chateau after chateau, mounts up. In spiritual invisible combustion, one authority after another. With noise and glare, or noisily and unnoted, a whole old system of things is vanishing piecemeal. On the morrow thou shalt look, and it is not. End of section 19「20 of the French Revolution, Volume 2 by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.3 2. The Wakeful. Sleep who will, cradled in hope and short vision, like Lafayette, who always in the danger done, sees the last danger that will threaten him. Time is not sleeping, nor time's seed field. That sacred herald's college of a new dynasty we mean the sixty and odd bill stickers with their leaden badges are not sleeping daily they with paste pot and cross staff new clothe the walls of paris in colours of the rainbow authoritative heraldic as we say or indeed almost magical thaumaturgic for no placard journal that they paste but will convince some soul or souls of man the hawkers ball and the ballad singers Great journalism blows and blusters through all its throats, forth from Paris towards all corners of France, like an Aeolus cave, keeping alive all manner of fires. Throats or journals there are, as men count, to the number of some hundred and thirty-three, of various calibre, from your Chenier, Gorsaz, Camille, down to your Marat, 
down now to your incipient émère of the père du chêne these blow with fierce weight of argument or quick light banter for the rights of man Drossoy, Royaux, Pelletier, Soulou. Equally with mixed tactics, inclusive, singular to say, of much profane parody, are blowing for altar and throne. As for Marat, the people's friend, his voice is as that of the bullfrog, or bittern, by the solitary pools. He, unseen of men, croaks harsh thunder, and that alone continually, of indignation, suspicion, incurable sorrow. The people are sinking towards ruin, near starvation itself. My dear friends, cries he, your indigence is not the fruit of vices nor of idleness. You have a right to life, as good as Louis the Sixteenth, or the happiest of the century. What man can say he has a right to dine when you have no bread? The people, sinking on the one hand, on the other hand, nothing but wretched Sieur Mottier, treasonous Riquetti Mirabeau, traitors or else shadows, and simulacra of quacks, to be seen in high places, look where you will. Men that go mincing, grimacing, with plausible speech and brushed raiment, hollow within. Quacks political, quacks scientific, academical, all with a fellow feeling for each other, and kind of quack public spirit. Not great Lavoisier himself, or any of the forty, can escape this rough tongue, which wants not fanatic sincerity, nor, strangers of all, a certain rough caustic sense. And then the three thousand gaming houses that are in Paris, cesspools for the scoundrelism of the world, sinks of iniquity and debauchery, whereas without good morals liberty is impossible. There, in these dens of Satan, which one knows and perseveringly denounces, do Sieur Mottier's mouchard consort and colleague, battening vampire-like on a people next door to starvation. O oh, peuple, cries he oft times with heart-rending accent, treason, delusion, vampirism, scoundrelism, from Dan to Beersheba. The soul of Marat is sick with the sight, but what remedy? To erect eight hundred gibbets in convenient rows and proceed to hoisting Riquetti on the first of them. Such is the brief recipe of Marat, friend of the people. So blow and bluster the hundred and thirty-three, nor, as would seem, are these sufficient, for there are benighted nooks in France to which newspapers do not reach and everywhere is such an appetite for news as was never seen in any country. Let an expeditious Don Martin, on furlough, set out to return home from Paris, he cannot get along for peasants stopping him on the highway, overwhelming him with questions. The maître de poste will not send out the horses till you have well nigh quarrelled with him, but asks always, What news? At Autun in spite of the rigorous frost, for it is now January 1791, nothing will serve but you must gather your wear-worn limbs and thoughts and speak to the multitudes from a window opening into the marketplace. It is the shortest method. This, good Christian people, is verily what an august assembly seemed to me to be doing. This and no other is the news. Now in my weary lips I close, Leave me, leave me to repose. The good Don Martin. But on the whole, are not nations astonishingly true to their national character, which indeed runs in the blood? Nineteen hundred years ago, Julius Caesar, with his quick, sure eye, took note how the Gauls waylaid men. It is a habit of theirs, says he, to stop travellers, were it even by constraint, and inquire whatsoever each of them may have heard or known about any sort of matter. In their towns the common people beset the passing trader, demanding to hear from what regions he came, what things he got acquainted with there. Excited by which rumours and hearsays, they will decide about the weightiest matters, and necessarily repent next moment that they did it, on such guidance of uncertain reports and many a traveller answering with mere fictions to please them and get off. 
nineteen hundred years, and good Dammartin, wayworn in winter frost, probably with scant light of stars and fish oil, still perorates from the inn window. This people is no longer called Gaulish, and it has wholly become racketous, has got breeches and suffered change enough. Certain fierce German Franken came storming over and, so to speak, vaulted on the back of it, and always after, in their grim, tenacious way, have ridden it bridled. For German is, by his very name, Germann, or man that wars and gars. And so the people, as we say, is now called French or Frankish. Nevertheless, does not the old Gaulish and Gallic Celthood, with its vehemence, effervescent promptitude, and what good and ill it had, still vindicate itself, little adulterated? For the rest, that in such prurient confusion, clubism thrives and spreads, need not be said. Already the mother of patriotism, sitting in the Jacobin, shines supreme over all, and has paled the poor lunar light of that monarchic club near to fatal extinction. She, we say, shines supreme, girt with sunlight, not yet with infernal lightning, reverenced, not without fear, by municipal authorities, counting her Barnave, Lamette, Pétion, of a national assembly, most gladly of all her Robespierre. Cordelier, again, your Hébert, Vincent, bibliopolist Momoro, grown audibly, that a tyrannous mayor and Sieur Mottier harrow them with the sharp tribula of law, intent, apparently, to suppress them by tribulation. How the Jacobin Mother Society, as hinted formerly, sheds forth Cordelier on this hand, and then Fouillant on that, the Cordelier an elixir or double distillation of Jacobin patriotism, the other a widespread weak dilution thereof. How she will reabsorb the former into her mother bosom and stormfully dissipate the latter into nonentity. How she breeds and brings forth three hundred daughter societies, her rearing of them, her correspondence, her endeavourings and continual travail. How, under an old figure, Jacobism shoots forth organic filaments to the utmost corners of confused, dissolved France, organising it anew. This, properly, is the grand fact of the time. To passionate constitutionalism, still more to royalism, which see all their own clubs fail and die, clubism will naturally grow to seem the root of all evil. Nevertheless, clubism is not death but rather new organisation and life out of death, destructive indeed of the remnants of the old, but to the new, important, indispensable. That man can cooperate and hold communion with man, herein lies his miraculous strength. In hut or hamlet, patriotism mourns not now like voice in the desert. It can walk to the nearest town, and there in the daughter society, make its ejaculation into an articulate oration, into an action, guided forward by the mother of patriotism herself. All clubs of constitutionalists and such like fail, one after another, as shallow fountains. Jacobism alone has gone down to the deep subterranean lake of waters, and may, unless filled in, flow there, copious, continual, like an artesian well till the great deep have drained itself up, and all be flooded and submerged, and Noah's deluge out-deluged. On the other hand, Claude Fauché, preparing mankind for a golden age, now apparently just at hand, has opened his Cercle Social, with clerks, corresponding boards, and so forth, in the precincts of the Palais Royal. It is Te Deum Fauché, the same who preached on Franklin's death in that huge Medicean rotunda of the Allo Bled. He there this winter, by printing press and melodious colloquy, spreads bruit of himself to the utmost city barriers. Ten thousand persons of respectability attend there and listen to this procureur général de la vérité, attorney-general of truth. So has he dubbed himself. 
to his sage, Condorcet, or other eloquent coadjutor. Eloquent attorney general, he blows out from him, better or worse, what crude or ripe thing he holds, not without result to himself, for it leads to a bishopric, though only a constitutional one. Fauché approves himself a glib-tongued, strong-lunged, whole-hearted human individual. Much flowing matter there is, and really of the better sort, about right, nature, benevolence, progress, which flowing matter, whether it is pantheistic or is pot-theistic, only the greener mind in these days need read. Busy Brizot was long ago of purpose to establish precisely some such regenerative social circle. Nay, he had tried it in Newman Street, Oxford Street, of the Fog Babylon, and failed, as some say, surreptitiously pocketing the cash. Fauché, not Brissot, was fated to be the happy man, whereat, however, generous Brissot will, with sincere heart, sing a timber-toned, Nunc domine. But ten thousand persons of respectability, what a bulk, have many things in proportion to their magnitude. This cercle social, for which Brizot chants in sincere timber tones, such nunc domine, what is it? Unfortunately, wind and shadow. The main reality one finds in it now is perhaps this, that an attorney general of truth did once take shape of a body, as son of Adam, on our earth, though but for months or moments, and ten thousand persons of respectability attended, ere yet chaos and knocks had reabsorbed him. 133 Paris Journals Regenerative Social Circle Oratory in Mother and Daughter Societies From the Balconies of Inns By Chimney Nook at Dinner Table Polemical, ending many times in duel. Add ever, like a constant growling accompaniment of base discord, scarcity of work, scarcity of food. The winter is hard and cold. Ragged baker's cues, like a black tattered flag of distress, wave out ever and anon. It is the third of our hunger years, this new year of a glorious revolution. The rich man, when invited to dinner, in such distress seasons, feels bound in politeness to carry his own bread in his pocket. How the poor dine! And your glorious revolution has done it, cries one. And our glorious revolution is subtlety, by black traitors worthy of the lamp-iron, perverted to do it, cries another. Who will paint the huge whirlpool wherein France, all shivered into wild incoherence, whirls? the jarring that went on under every French roof, in every French heart, the diseased things that were spoken, done, the sum total whereof is the French Revolution, tongue of man cannot tell, nor the laws of action that work unseen in the depths of that huge blind incoherence. With amazement, not with measurement, men look on the immeasurable, not knowing its laws, seeing, with all different degrees of knowledge, what new phases and results of event its laws bring forth. France is as a monstrous galvanic mass, wherein all sorts of far stranger than chemical galvanic or electric forces and substances are at work, electrifying one another, positive and negative, filling with electricity your laden jars, twenty-five millions in number. As the jars get full, there will from time to time be, on slight hint, an explosion. End of section 20。section 21 of the French Revolution, volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.33 Sword in Hand On such wonderful basis, however, has law, royalty, authority, and whatever yet exists of visible order, to maintain itself while it can. Here, as in that commixture of the four elements, did the anarch old, 
as an august assembly spread its pavilion curtained by the dark infinite of discords founded on the wavering bottomless of the abyss and keeps continual hubbub time is around it and eternity and the inane and it does what it can what is given it to do glancing reluctantly in once more we discern little that is edifying a constitutional theory of defective verbs struggling forward with perseverance amid endless interruptions mirabeau from his tribune with the weight of his name and genius awing down much jacobin violence which in return vents itself the louder over in its jacobin's hall and even reads him sharp lectures there this man's path is mysterious questionable difficult and he walks without companion in it pure patriotism does not now count him among her chosen pure royalism abhors him yet his weight with the world is overwhelming let him travel on companionless unwavering whither he is bound while it is yet day with him and the night has not come but the chosen band of pure patriot brothers is small counting only some thirty seated now on the extreme tip of the left separate from the world a virtuous petillon an incorruptible robespierre most consistent incorruptible of thin acrid men triumvirs bernave duport lamet great in speech thought action each according to his kind a lean old goupil de prefel on these and what will follow them has pure patriotism to depend there too conspicuous among the thirty if seldom audible philippe d'orleon may be seen sitting in dim fuliginous bewilderment having one might say arrived at chaos gleams there are at once of a lieutenancy and regency debates in the assembly itself of succession to the throne in case the present branch should fail and philippe they say walked anxiously in silence through the corridors till such high argument were done but it came all to nothing mirabeau glaring into the man and through him had to ejaculate in strong untranslatable language ce je blank f blank ne vaut pas le pain qu'on se donne pour lui it came all to nothing and in the meanwhile philippe's money they say is gone could he refuse a little cash to the gifted patriot in want only of that he himself in want of all but that not a pamphlet can be printed without cash or indeed written without food purchasable by cash without cash your hopefulest projector cannot stir from the spot individual patriotic or other projects require cash how much more do widespread intrigues which live and exist by cash lying widespread with dragon appetite for cash fit to swallow princedoms and so prince philippe amid his sillaries la close and confused sons of night has rolled along the centre of the strangest cloudy coil out of which has visibly come as we often say an epic preternatural machinery of suspicion and within which there has dwelt and worked what specialties of treason stratagem aimed or aimless endeavour towards mischief no party living if it be not the presiding genius of it prince of the power of the air has now any chance to know camille's conjecture is the likeliest that poor philippe did mount up a little way in treasonable speculation as he mounted formerly in one of the earliest balloons but frightened that the new position he was getting into had soon turned the cock again and come down more fool than he rose to create preternatural suspicion this was his function in the revolutionary epos but now if he have lost his cornucopia of ready money what else had he to lose in thick darkness inward and outward he must welter and flounder on 
in that piteous death helmet, the hapless man. Once, or even twice, we shall still behold him emerged, struggling out of the thick death element in vain. For one moment, it is the last moment, he starts aloft, or is flung aloft, even into clearness and a kind of memorability, to sink then for evermore. The Côté droit persists no less, nay, with more animation than ever, though hope has now well nigh fled. Tough Abbe Maury, when the obscure country royalist grasps his hand with transport of thanks, answers, rolling his indomitable brazen head, Hélas, monsieur, all that I do here is as good as simply nothing. Gallant Faucigny, visible this one time in history, advances frantic into the middle of the hall, exclaiming, There is but one way of dealing with it, and that is to fall sword in hand on those gentry here. Sabre le main sous ce gaillard-là. Frantically indicating our chosen thirty on the extreme tip of the left, whereupon is clangor and clamour, debate, repentance, evaporation. Things ripen towards downright incompatibility, and what is called scission. That fierce theoretic onslaught of Faucigny's was in August 1790. Next August will not have come till a famed 292, the chosen of royalism, make solemn final scission from an assembly given up to faction and depart shaking the dust of their feet. Connected with this matter of sword in hand, there is yet another thing to be noted. Of duels we have sometimes spoken, how in all parts of France innumerable duels were fought, and argumentative men and messmates, flinging down the wine cup and weapons of reason and repartee, met in the measured field to part bleeding, or perhaps not to part, but to fall mutually skewered through with iron, their wrath and life alike ending, and die as fools die. Long has this lasted, and still lasts, but now it would seem as if in an august assembly itself, traitorous royalism, in its despair, has taken to a new course, that of cutting off patriotism by systematic duel. Bully swordsman, Spadassin, of that party, go swaggering, or indeed they can be had for a trifle of money. Twelve Spadassin were seen by the yellow eye of journalism, arriving recently out of Switzerland. Also a considerable number of assassins, nombre considérable d'assassins, exercising in fencing schools and at pistol targets. Any patriot deputy of Mark can be called out. Let him escape one time or ten times, a time there necessarily is when he must fall and France mourn. How many cartels has Mirabeau had, especially while he was the people's champion? Cartels by the hundred, which he, since the constitution must be made first, and his time is precious, answers now always with a kind of stereotype formula. Monsieur, you are put upon my list, but I warn you that it is long, and I grant no preferences. Then, in autumn, had we not the duel of Casales and Barnave, the two chief masters of tongue-shot, meeting now to exchange pistol-shot? For Casales, chief of the royalists, whom we call blacks or noir, said in a moment of passion, the patriots were sheer brigands. Nay, in so speaking, he darted, or seemed to dart, a fire-glance specially at Barnave who thereupon could not but reply by fire-glances, by adjournment to the Bois de Boulogne. Bernard's second shot took effect on Cazalis's hat, the front nook of a triangular felt, such as mortals then wore, 
deadened the ball and saved that fine brow from more than temporary injury but how easily might the lot have fallen the other way and bernave's hat not been so good patriotism raises its loud denunciation of duelling in general petitions an august assembly to stop such feudal barbarism by law barbarism and solecism for will it convince or convict any man to blow half an ounce of lead through the head of him surely not bernave was received at the jacobin with embraces yet with rebukes mindful of which and also that his reputation in america was that of headlong foolhardiness rather and want of brain not of heart charles lamette does on the eleventh day of november with little emotion decline attending some hot young gentleman from artois come expressly to challenge him nay indeed he first coldly engages to attend then coldly permits two friends to attend instead of him and shame the young gentleman out of it which they successfully do a cold procedure satisfactory to the two friends to lamet and the hot young gentleman whereby one might have fancied the whole matter was cooled down not so however lamet proceeding to his senatorial duties in the decline of the day is met in those assembly corridors by nothing but royalist brocard sniffs huffs and open insults human patience has its limits monsieur says lamette breaking silence to one le trec a man with hunchback or natural deformity but sharp of tongue and a black of the deepest tint monsieur if you were a man to be fought with i am one cries the young duke de Questries. fast as fire flash lamet replies tout à l'heure on the instant then and so as the shades of dusk thicken in that bois de boulon we behold two men with lion look with alert attitude side foremost right foot advanced flourishing and thrusting stoccado and posado in tierce and quart intent to skewer one another see with most skewering purpose headlong lamette with his whole weight makes a furious lunge but deft kestries whisks aside lamette skewers only the air and slits deep and far on kestries sword's point his own extended left arm whereupon with bleeding pallor surgeons lint and formalities the duel is considered satisfactorily done but will there be no end then beloved lamette lies deep slit not out of danger black traitorous aristocrats kill the people's defenders cut up not with arguments but with rapier slits and the twelve spadassins out of switzerland and the considerable number of assassins exercising at the pistol target so meditates and ejaculates hurt patriotism with ever deepening ever widening fervour for the space of six and thirty hours the thirty-six hours passed on saturday the thirteenth one beholds a new spectacle the rue de varennes and neighbouring boulevard des invalides covered with a mixed flowing multitude the kestris hotel gone distracted devil-ridden belching from every window beds with clothes and curtains plate of silver and gold with filigree mirrors pictures images commodes chiffonniers and endless crockery and jingle amid steady popular cheers absolutely without theft for there goes a cry he shall be hanged that steals a nail it is a plebiscitum or informal iconoclastic decree of the common people in the course of being executed the municipality sits tremulous deliberating whether they will hang out the drapeau rouge and martial law national assembly part in loud wail 
part in hardly suppressed applause abbe maury unable to decide whether the iconoclastic plebs amount to forty thousand or to two hundred thousand deputations swift messengers for it is at a distance over the river come and go lafayette and national guards though without drapeau rouge get under way apparently in no hot haste nay arrived on the scene lafayette salutes with doffed hat before ordering to fix bayonets what avails it the plebeian court of cassation as camille might punningly name it has done its work steps forth with unbuttoned vest with pockets turned inside out sack and just ravage not plunder with inexhaustible patience the hero of two worlds remonstrates persuasively with a kind of sweet constraint though also with fixed bayonets dissipates hushes down on the morrow it is once more all as usual considering which things however duke Kestris may justly write to the president justly transport himself across the marches to raise a corps or do what else is in him royalism totally abandons that bobadillian method of contest and the twelve spadassins return to switzerland or even to dreamland through the horn gate whichsoever their home is nay editor prudhomme is authorized to publish a curious thing we are authorized to publish says he dull blustering publisher that m boyer champion of good patriots is at the head of fifty spadassini seed or bully killers his address is passage du bois de boulogne faubourg saint denis one of the strangest institutes this of champion boyer and the bully killers whose services however are not wanted royalism having abandoned the rapier method as plainly impractical end of section twenty one section twenty two of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.3.4 To Fly or Not to Fly The truth is, royalism sees itself verging towards sad extremities, nearer and nearer daily. From over the Rhine, it comes asserted that the king in his Tuileries is not free. This the poor king may contradict with the official mouth, but in his heart feels often to be undeniable. Civil constitution of the clergy, decree of ejectment against dissidents from it, not even to this latter, though almost his conscience rebels, can he say nay, but after two months hesitating, signs this also. It was on January 21st of this 1790 that he signed it, to the sorrow of his poor heart. Yet on another 21st of January, whereby come dissident ejected priests, unconquerable martyrs, according to some, incurable chicaning traitors, according to others. And so there has arrived what we once foreshadowed, with religion, or with the cant and echo of religion, all France is rent asunder in a new rupture of continuity, complicating embittering all the older to be cured only by stern surgery in la vendee unhappy royalty unhappy majesty hereditary representative représentant héréditaire or however they can name him of whom much is expected to whom little is given blue national guards encircle that tuileries a lafayette thin constitutional pedant clear thin inflexible as water turned to thin ice whom no queen's heart can love national assembly its pavilion spread where we know sits near by 
keeping continual hubbub. From without, nothing but Nancy revolts, sack of Kestri's hotel, riots and seditions, riots north and south, at Aix, at Douai, at Beffort, Uze, Perpignan, at Nisme, at that incurable Avignon of the Popes, a continual crackling and sputtering of riots from the whole face of France, testifying how electric it grows. Add only the hard winter, the famished strikes of operatives, that continual running base of scarcity, ground tone and basis of all other discords. The plan of royalty, so far as it can be said to have any fixed plan, is still, as ever, that of flying towards the frontiers. In very truth, the only plan of the smallest promise for it. Fly to Bouillet, bristle yourself round with cannon, served by your forty thousand undebauched Germans. Summon the National Assembly to follow you, summon what of it is royalist, constitutional, gainable by money. Dissolve the rest, by a grape-shot if need be. Let Jacobinism and revolt, with one wild wail, fly into infinite space, driven by grape-shot. Thunder over France with the cannon's mouth, commanding, not entreating, that this riot cease, and then to rule afterwards with utmost possible constitutionality, doing justice, loving mercy, being shepherd of this indigent people, not shearer merely and shepherd's similitude. All this if ye dare. If ye dare not, then in heaven's name go to sleep. Other handsome alternative seems none. Nay, it were perhaps possible with a man to do it. For if such inexpressible whirlpool of Babylonish confusions, which our era is, cannot be stilled by man, but only by time and men, a man may moderate its paroxysms, may balance and sway, and keep himself unswallowed on the top of it, as several men and kings in these days do. Much is possible for a man. Men will obey a man that kens and cans, and name him reverently their kenning or king. Did not Charlemagne rule? Consider, too, whether he had smooth times of it, hanging thirty thousand Saxons over the Wesser Bridge at one dread swoop. So likewise, who knows, but in this same distracted fanatic France the right man may verily exist, an olive-complexioned taciturn man, for the present lieutenant in the artillery service, who once sat studying mathematics at Brienne, the same who walked in the morning to correct proof-sheets at Dole, and enjoyed a frugal breakfast with Monsieur Joly. Such a one is gone, whither also famed General Pauli, his friend, is gone, in these very days, to see old scenes in native Corsica, and what democratic good can be done there. Royalty never executes the evasion plan, yet never abandons it, living in variable hope, undecisive, till fortune shall decide. In utmost secrecy, a brisk correspondence goes on with Bouillet. There is also a plot which emerges more than once for carrying the king to Rouen. Plot after plot, emerging and submerging, like ignis fatui, in foul weather, which lead nowhither. About ten o'clock at night, the hereditary representative, in parti carré, with the queen, with brother monsieur and madame, sits playing whisk or whist. Usher Compon enters mysteriously with a message he only half comprehends. How a certain Comte Dinisdal waits anxious in the outer antechamber. National Colonel, captain of the watch for this night, is gained over. Post horses ready all the way. Party of noblesse sitting armed, determined. Will His Majesty, before midnight, Consent to go? Profound silence. Compon waiting with upturned ear. Did your majesty hear what Compon said? asks the queen. Yes, I heard, answers majesty, and plays on. 
"'Twas a pretty couplet, that of Compons, hints Monsieur, who at times showed a pleasant wit. Majesty, still unresponsive, plays whisk. After all, one must say something to Compon, remarks the Queen. Tell Monsieur Dinistal, said the King, and the Queen puts an emphasis on it, that the King cannot consent to be forced away. I see, said Dinistal, whisking round, piquing himself into flame of irritancy. We have the risk. We are to have all the blame if it fail. And vanishes, he and his plot, as will wisps do. The queen sat till far in the night, packing jewels. But it came to nothing. In that peaked frame of irritancy, the will wisp had gone out. Little hope there is in all this. Alas, with whom to fly? Our loyal garde du corps, ever since the insurrection of women, are disbanded, gone to their homes, gone many of them across the Rhine towards Coblenz and exiled princes. Brave Miomondre and brave Tardivé, these faithful two, have received in nocturnal interview with both majesties their viaticum of gold louis, of heartfelt thanks from a queen's lips, though unluckily his majesty stood back to fire, not speaking, and do now dine through the provinces, recounting hair's breadth escapes, insurrectionary horrors, great horrors, to be swallowed yet of greater. But on the whole, what a falling off from the old splendour of Versailles, here in this poor Tuileries, a national brewer colonel, sonorous sans terre, parades officially behind Her Majesty's chair. Our high dignitaries all fled over the Rhine. Nothing now to be gained at court, but hopes for which life itself must be risked. Obscure, busy men frequent the back stairs with hearsays, wind projects, unfruitful fanfaronades. Young royalists at the Théâtre de Vaudeville sing couplets, if that could do anything. Royalists enough, captains on furlough, burnt-out seigneurs, may likewise be met with in the Café de Valois and at Mayo, the Restaurateurs. There they fan one another into high, loyal glow, drink in such wine as can be procured, confusion to sansculottism, show purchased dirks of an improved structure made to order, and, greatly daring, dine. It is in these places, in these months, that the epithet sansculotte first gets applied to indigent patriotism. In the last age we had Gilbert sansculotte the indigent poet, destitute of breeches, a mournful destitution, which, however, if twenty millions share it, may become more effective than most possessions. Meanwhile, amid this vague, dim whirl of fanfaronades, wind projects, poniards made to order, there does disclose itself one punctum salience of life and feasibility, the finger of Mirabeau. Mirabeau and the Queen of France have met, have parted with mutual trust. It is strange, secret as the mysteries, but it is indubitable. Mirabeau took horse one evening and rode westward, unattended, to see friend Clavier in that country house of his. Before getting to Clavier's, the much musing horseman struck aside to a back gate of the garden of saint Cloud. Some Duke d'Arembert, or the like, was there to introduce him. The Queen was not far, on a round knoll, Rompoint, the highest of the garden of saint Cloud. He beheld the Queen's face, spake with her alone, under the void canopy of night. What an interview! Fateful secret for us, after all searching, like the colloquies of the gods. She called him a Mirabeau. Elsewhere we read that she was charmed with him the wild, submitted titan, as indeed it is among the honourable tokens of this high, ill-fated heart that no mind of any endowment, no Mirabeau, nay, no Barnave, no de Murier, ever came face to face with her, but, in spite of all prepossessions, she was forced to recognise it, 
to draw nigh to it, with trust. High imperial heart, with the instinctive attraction towards all that had any height. You know not the queen, said Mirabeau once in confidence. Her force of mind is prodigious. She is a man for courage. And so, under the void night, on the crown of that knoll, she has spoken with a Mirabeau. He has kissed loyally the queenly hand, and said with enthusiasm, Madame, the monarchy is saved. Possible? The foreign powers, mysteriously sounded, gave favourable guarded response. Bouillet is at Metz, and could find forty thousand sure Germans. With a Mirabeau for head, and a Bouillet for hand, something verily is possible if fate intervene not. But figure under what thousandfold rapages and cloaks of darkness royalty meditating these things must involve itself. There are men with tickets of entrance. There are chivalrous consultings, mysterious plottings. Consider also whether, involve as it like, plotting royalty can escape the glance of patriotism lynx eyes by the ten thousand fixed on it, which see in the dark. Patriotism knows much, knows the dirks made to order, and can specify the shops, knows Sieur Mottier's legions of mouchard, the tickets of entrée, and men in black, and how plan of evasion succeeds plan, or may be supposed to succeed it. Then conceive the couplets chanted in the Théâtre de Vaudeville, or worse, the whispers, significant nods of traitors in moustaches. Conceive, on the other hand, the loud cry of alarm that came through the hundred and thirty journals, the Dionysus' ear of each of the forty-eight sections, wakeful night and day. Patriotism is patient of much, not patient of all. The Café de Procope has sent, visibly along the streets, a deputation of patriots to expostulate with bad editors by trustful word of mouth, singular to see and hear. The bad editors promise to amend, but do not. Deputations for change of ministry were many, Mayor Bailly joining even with Cordelier Danton in such, and they have prevailed. With what profit? Of quacks, willing or constrained to be quacks, the race is everlasting. Ministers de Porté and de Tertre will have to manage much as ministers La Tour de Pin and Cissé did. So welters the confused world. But now, beaten on for ever by such inextricable contradictory influences and evidences, what is the indigent French patriot? in these unhappy days, to believe and walk by. Uncertainty all, except that he is wretched, indigent. That a glorious revolution, the wonder of the universe, has hitherto brought neither bread nor peace. Being marred by traitors, difficult to discover. Traitors that dwell in the dark, invisible there, or seen for moments in pallid, dubious twilight, stealthily vanishing thither. Preternatural suspicion once more rules the minds of men. Nobody here, writes Cara, of the Annal Patriotique, so early as the 1st of February, can entertain a doubt of the constant obstinate project these people have on foot to get the king away, or of the perpetual succession of manoeuvres they employ for that. Nobody the watchful mother of patriotism deputed two members to her daughter at Versailles to examine how the matter looked there. Well, and there? Patriotic Cara continues, The report of these two deputies we all heard with our own ears last Saturday. They went with others of Versailles to inspect the king's stables, also the stables of the Wylam, Garde du Corps, they found there from seven to eight hundred horses, standing always saddled and bridled, ready for the road at a moment's notice. The same deputies, moreover, saw with their own two eyes several royal carriages, 
which men were even then busy loading with large, well-stuffed luggage bags. Leather cows, as we call them, vaches de cuir. The royal arms on the panels almost entirely effaced. Momentous enough. Also, on the same day, the whole marais chaussée or cavalry police, did assemble with arms, horses, and baggage, and disperse again. They want the king over the marches, that so Emperor Leopold and the German princes, whose troops are ready, may have a pretext for beginning. This, adds Cara, is the word of the riddle. This is the reason why our fugitive aristocrats are now making levies of men on the frontiers, expecting that one of these mornings the executive chief magistrate will be brought over to them and the civil war commence. If indeed the executive chief magistrate, bagged, say, in one of those leather cows, were once brought safe over to them. But the strangest thing of all is that patriotism, whether barking at a venture or guided by some instinct of preternatural sagacity, is actually barking aright this time at something, not at nothing. Bouillet's secret correspondence, since made public, testifies as much. Nay, it is undeniable, visible to all, that mesdames, the king's aunts, are taking steps for departure, asking passports of the ministry, safe conducts of the municipality, which Marat warns all men to beware of. They will carry gold with them, these old Beguine. Nay, they will carry the little Dauphin, having nursed a changeling for some time to leave in his stead. Besides, they are as some light substance flung up to show how the wind sits, a kind of proof kite to fly off to ascertain whether the grand paper kite, evasion of the king, may mount. In these alarming circumstances, patriotism is not wanting to itself. Municipality deputes to the king. Sections depute to the municipality. A national assembly will soon stir. Meanwhile, behold, on the 19th of February, 1791, Mesdames, quitting Bellevue and Versailles, with all privacy, are off. Towards Rome, seemingly, or one knows not whither. They are not without king's passports, countersigned, and, what is more to the purpose, a serviceable escort. The patriotic mayor, or mayorlet, of the village of Moray tried to detain them, but brisk Louis de Narbonne of the escort dashed off at hand gallop, returned soon with thirty dragoons, and victoriously cut them out. And so the poor ancient women go their way, to the terror of France and Paris, whose nervous excitability is become extreme. Who else would hinder poor Locke and Grey, now grown so old and fallen into such unexpected circumstances, when gossip itself, turning only on terrors and horrors, is no longer pleasant to the mind, and you cannot get so much as an orthodox confessor in peace, from going what way soever the hope of any solacement might lead them? They go, poor ancient dames whom the heart were hard that does not pity. They go with palpitations, with unmelodious suppressed screechings, all France screeching and cackling, in loud unsuppressed terror, behind and on both hands of them. Such mutual suspicion is among men. At arnay le duc above halfway to the frontiers, a patriotic municipality and populace again takes courage to stop them. Louis Narbonne must now back to Paris, must consult the National Assembly. National Assembly answers, not without an effort, that Madame may go. Whereupon Paris rises worse than ever, screeching half-distracted. Tuileries and precincts are filled with women and men, while the National Assembly debates this question of questions. Lafayette is needed at night for dispersing them, and the streets are to be illuminated. Commandant Berthier, a Berthier before whom are great things unknown, 
lies for the present under blockade at Bellevue in Versailles. By no tactics could he get Madame's luggage stirred from the courts there. Frantic Versailles women came screeching about him. His very troops cut the wagon traces. He retired to the interior, waiting better times. Nay, in these same hours, while Madame, hardly cut off from Moray by the sabre's edge, are driving rapidly to foreign parts, and not yet stopped at Arnay, their august nephew, poor monsieur, at Paris, has dived deep into his cellars of the Luxembourg for shelter, and according to Montgaillard, can hardly be persuaded up again. Screeching multitudes environ that Luxembourg of his, drawn thither by report of his departure. But at sight and sound of Monsieur, they become crowing multitudes, and escort Madame and him to the Tuileries with vivats. It is a state of nervous excitability such as few nations know. End of section 22「Section 23 of the French Revolution, Volume 2, by Thomas Carlyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Chapter 2.35 The Day of Poniards Or again, what means this visible reparation of the castle of Vincennes? Other jails being all crowded with prisoners, new space is wanted here that is the municipal account. For in such changing of judicatures, parliaments being abolished, and new courts but just set up, prisoners have accumulated. Not to say that in these times of discord and club law, offences and committals are at any rate more numerous. Which municipal account does it not sufficiently explain the phenomenon? Surely to repair the castle of Vincennes, was of all enterprises that an enlightened municipality could undertake, the most innocent. Not so, however, does neighbouring Saint-Antoine look on it. Saint-Antoine, to whom these peaked turrets and grim donjons, all too near her own dark dwelling, are of themselves an offence. Was not Vincennes a kind of minor Bastille? Great Diderot and philosophies have lain in durance here, great Mirabeau in disastrous eclipse for forty-two months. And now, when the old Bastille has become a dancing ground, had any one the mirth to dance, and its stones are getting built into the Pont Louis XVI, does this minor comparative insignificance of a Bastille flank itself with fresh-hewn millions, spread out tyrannous wings, menacing patriotism, New space for prisoners, and what prisoners? At Dorléans, with the chief patriots on the tip of the left? It is said there runs a subterranean passage all the way from the Tuileries hither. Who knows? Paris, mined with quarries and catacombs, does hang wondrous over the abyss. Paris was once to be blown up, though the powder, when we went to look, had got withdrawn. A Tuileries sold to Austria and Koblenz should have no subterranean passage, out of which might not Koblenz or Austria issue some morning, and with cannon of long range, foudroyer, bethunder a patriotic Saint-Antoine into smoulder and ruin. So meditates the benighted soul of Saint-Antoine, as it sees the aproned workmen in early spring busy on these towers an official-speaking municipality, a sieur Mottier, with his legions of mouchards, deserve no trust at all. Were patriot sans terre, indeed, commander. But the sonorous brewer commands only our own battalion. Of such secrets he can explain nothing, knows nothing, perhaps suspects much. And so the work goes on, and afflicted, benighted Saint-Antoine hears rattle of hammers, sees stones suspended in air. Saint-Antoine prostrated the first great Bastille. Will it falter over this comparative insignificance of a Bastille? 
friends what if we took pikes fire locks sledgehammers and helped ourselves speedier is no remedy nor so certain on the twenty eighth of february st antoine turns out as it has now often done and apparently with little superfluous tumult moves eastward to that eye sorrow of vincennes with grave voice of authority no need of bullying and shouting st antoine signifies to parties concerned there that its purpose is to have this suspicious stronghold raised level with the general soil of the country remonstrance may be proffered with zeal but it avails not the outer gate goes up drawbridges tumble iron window stanchions smitten out with sledgehammers become iron crowbars it rains furniture stone masses slates with chaotic clatter and rattle demolition clatters down and now hasty expresses rush through the agitated streets to warn lafayette and the municipal and departmental authorities rumour warns a national assembly a royal tuileries and all men who care to hear it that st antoine is up that vincennes and probably the last remaining institution of the country is coming down quick then let lafayette roll his drums and fly eastward for to all constitutional patriots this is again bad news and you ye friends of royalty snatch your poniards of improved structure made to order your sword canes secret arms and tickets of entry quick by backstairs passages rally round the son of sixty kings an effervescence probably got up by d'orleans and company for the overthrow of throne and altar it is said her majesty shall be put in prison put out of the way what then will his majesty be clay for the sans culottic potter or were it impossible to fly this day a brave noblesse suddenly all rallying peril threatens hope invites dukes de villequier de durat gentlemen of the chamber give tickets and admittance a brave noblesse is suddenly all rallying now were the time to fall sword in hand on those gentry there could it be done with effect the hero of two worlds is on his white charger blue nationals horse and foot hurrying eastward santerre with the st antoine battalion is already there apparently indisposed to act heavy laden hero of two worlds what tasks are these the jeerings provocative gamblings of that patriot suburb which is all out on the streets now are hard to endure unwashed patriots jeering in sulky sport one unwashed patriot seizing the general by the boot to unhorse him santerre ordered to fire makes answer obliquely these are the men that took the bastille and not a trigger stirs neither dare the vincennes magistracy give warrant of arrestment or the smallest countenance wherefore the general will take it on himself to arrest by promptitude by cheerful adroitness patience and brisk valour without limits the riot may be again bloodlessly appeased meanwhile the rest of paris with more or less unconcern may mind the rest of its business for what is this but an effervescence of which there are now so many the national assembly in one of its stormiest moods is debating a law against immigration mirabeau declaring aloud i swear beforehand that i will not obey it mirabeau is often at the tribune this day with endless impediments from without with the old unabated energy from within what can murmurs and clamours from left or from right do to this man like tenerife or atlas unremoved with clear thought with strong bass voice though at first low uncertain he claims audience sways the storm of men anon the sound of him waxes softens he rises into far-sounding melody of strength triumphant 
which subdues all hearts. His rude-seamed face, desolate fire-scathed, becomes fire-lit and radiates. Once again men feel in these beggarly ages what is the potency and omnipotency of man's word on the souls of men. I will triumph or be torn in fragments, he was once heard to say. Silence, he cries now, in strong word of command, in imperial consciousness of strength. Silence, the thirty voices, silence aux trente voix. And Robespierre and the thirty voices die into mutterings, and the law is once more as Mirabeau would have it. How different, at the same instant, is General Lafayette's street eloquence, wrangling with sonorous brewers, with an ungrammatical Saint Antoine. Most different, again, from both, is the Café de Valois eloquence, and suppressed fanfaronade of this multitude of men with tickets of entry, who are now inundating the corridors of the Tuileries. Such things can go on simultaneously in one city. How much more in one country, in one planet, with its discrepancies, every day a mere crackling infinitude of discrepancies, which nevertheless do yield some coherent net product, though an infinitesimally small one. Be this as it may, Lafayette has saved Vincennes, and is marching homewards with some dozen of arrested demolitionists. Royalty is not yet saved, nor indeed specially endangered. But to the king's constitutional guard, to these old garde Francaise, or centre grenadiers, as it chanced to be, this affluence of men with tickets of entry is becoming more and more unintelligible. Is his majesty verily for Metz, then, to be carried off by these men on the spur of the instant? That revolt of Saint Antoine, got up by traitor royalists for a stalking horse? Keep a sharp outlook, ye centre grenadiers on duty here. Good never came from the men in black. Nay, they have cloaks, redangot, some of them leather breeches, boots, as if for instant riding. Or what is this that sticks visible from the lapel of Chevalier de Cour, too like the handle of some cutting or stabbing instrument? He glides and goes, and still the dudgeon sticks from his left lapel. Hold, monsieur! A centre grenadier clutches him, clutches the protrusive dudgeon, whisks it out in the face of the world. By heaven, a very dagger, hunting knife, or whatsoever you call it, fit to drink the life of patriotism. So fared it with Chevalier de Corps early in the day, not without noise, not without commentaries. And now this continually increasing multitude at nightfall, have they daggers too? Alas, with them too, after angry parleyings, there has begun a groping and a rummaging. All men in black, spite of their tickets of entry, are clutched by the collar and groped. Scandalous to think of, for always, as the dirk, sword cane, pistol, or were it but the tailor's bodkin, is found on him, and with loud scorn drawn forth from him, he, the hapless man in black, is flung all too rapidly downstairs, flung, and ignominiously descends, head foremost, accelerated by ignominious shovings from sentry after sentry, nay, as is written, by smitings, twitchings, spurnings, a posteriori, not to be named. In this accelerated way, emerges, uncertain which end uppermost, man after man in black, through all issues, into the Tuileries garden. Emerges, alas, into the arms of an indignant multitude, now gathered and gathering there, in the hour of dusk, to see what is toward, and whether the hereditary representative is carried off or not. Hapless men in black, at last convicted of poniards made to order convicted chevalier of the poniard. Within is as the burning ship, without is as the deep sea. Within is no help. His majesty, looking forth one moment from the interior sanctuaries, coldly bids all visitors 
give up their weapons, and shuts the door again. The weapons given up form a heap. The convicted chevalier of the poniard keep descending pell-mell with impetuous velocity, and at the bottom of all staircases the mixed multitude receives them, hustles, buffets, chases, and disperses them. Such sight meets Lafayette in the dusk of the evening as he returns, successful with difficulty at Vincennes. Sans culotte Scylla, hardly weathered, here is aristocrat Charybdis gurgling under his lee. The patient hero of two worlds almost loses temper. He accelerates, does not retard, the flying chevalier, delivers indeed this or the other hunted loyalist of quality, but rates him in bitter words, such as the hour suggested, such as no saloon could pardon. Hero ill-bested, hanging, so to speak, in mid-air, hateful to rich divinities above, hateful to indigent mortals below. Duc de Vilquier, gentleman of the chamber, gets such contumelious rating in presence of all people there, that he may see good first to exculpate himself in the newspapers, then, that not prospering, to retire over the frontiers and begin plotting at Brussels. His apartment will stand vacant, usefuler, as we may find, than when it stood occupied. So fly the chevalier of the poniard, hunted of patriotic men, shamefully in the thickening dusk. A dim, miserable business, born of darkness, dying away there in the thickening dusk and dimness. In the midst of which, however, let the reader discern clearly one figure running for its life, Crispin Cataline d'Espremenil, for the last time or the last but one. It is not yet three years since these same centre grenadiers, Garde Francaise, then, marched him towards the Calypso Isles in the grey of the May morning, and he and they have got thus far. Buffeted, beaten down, delivered by popular pétillon, he might well answer bitterly, And I too, monsieur, have been carried on the people's shoulders. A fact which popular pétillon, if he like, can meditate. But happily, one way and another, the speedy night covers up this ignominious day of poniards, and the chevalier escape, though maltreated, with torn coat skirts and heavy hearts to their respective dwelling houses. Riot twofold is quelled, and little blood shed, if it be not insignificant blood from the nose. Vincennes stands undemolished, reparable, and the hereditary representative has not been stolen, nor the queen smuggled into prison. A day long remembered, commented on with loud ha ha's and deep grumblings, with bitter scornfulness of triumph, bitter rancour of defeat. Royalism, as usual, imputes it to d'Orléans and the anarchists intent on insulting majesty. Patriotism, as usual, to royalists, and even constitutionalists, intent on stealing majesty to Metz. We also, as usual, to preternatural suspicion, and Phoebus Apollo having made himself like the knight. Thus, however, has the reader seen, in an unexpected arena, on this last day of February 1791, the three long-contending elements of French society dashed forth into singular comico-tragical collision, acting and reacting openly to the eye. Constitutionalism, at once quelling sans culottic riot at Vincennes, and royalist treachery from the Tuileries, is great this day, and prevails. As for poor royalism, tossed to and fro in that manner, its daggers all left in a heap, what can one think of it? Every dog, the adage says, has its day, has it, has had it, or will have it. For the present, the day is Lafayette's and the Constitution's. Nevertheless, hunger and Jacobism, fast-growing fanatical, still work. Their day, were they once fanatical, will come. Hitherto, in all tempests, Lafayette, like some divine sea-ruler, raises his serene head, 
the upper aeolus blasts fly back to their caves like foolish unbidden winds the under sea billows they had vexed into froth allay themselves but if as we often write the submarine titanic fire powers came into play the ocean bed from beneath being burst if they hurled poseidon lafayette and his constitution out of space and in the titanic melee sea were mixed with sky End of section 23section twenty four of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point three six mirabeau the spirit of france waxes ever more acrid fever sick towards the final outburst of dissolution and delirium suspicion rules all minds contending parties cannot now commingle stand separated sheer asunder eyeing one another in most anguish mood of cold terror or hot rage counter-revolution days of poniards kestris jewels flight of mesdames of monsieur and royalty journalism shrills ever louder its cry of alarm the sleepless dionysius's ear of the forty-eight sections how feverishly quick has it grown convulsing with strange pangs the whole sick body as in such sleeplessness and sickness the ear will do since royalists get poniards made to order and assure mottier is no better than he should be shall not patriotism too even of the indigent sort have pikes second-hand firelocks in readiness for the worst the anvils ring during this march month with hammering of pikes a constitutional municipality promulgated its placard that no citizen except the active or cash citizen was entitled to have arms but there rose instantly responsive such a tempest of astonishment from club and section that the constitutional placard almost next morning had to cover itself up and die away into inanity in a second improved edition so the hammering continues as all that it betokens does mark again how the extreme tip of the left is mounting in favour if not in its own national hall yet with the nation especially with paris for in such universal panic of doubt the opinion that is sure of itself as the meagrest opinion may the soonest be is the one to which all men will rally great is belief where it's never so meagre and leads captive the doubting heart incorruptible robespierre has been elected public accuser in our new courts of judicature virtuous petion it is thought may rise to be mayor cordelier danton called also by triumphant majorities sits at the departmental council table colleague there of mirabeau of incorruptible robespierre it was long ago predicted that he might go far mean meagre mortal though he was for doubt dwelt not in him under which circumstances ought not royalty likewise to cease doubting and begin deciding and acting royalty has always that sure trump card in its hand flight out of paris which sure trump card royalty as we see keeps ever and anon clutching at grasping and swashes it forth tentatively yet never tables it still puts it back again play it o royalty if there be a chance left this seems it and verily the last chance and now every hour is rendering this a doubtfuler alas one would so fain both fly and not fly play one's card and have it to play royalty in all human likelihood will not play its trump card till the honours one after one be mainly lost and such trumping of it prove to be the sudden finish of the game here accordingly a question always arises of the prophetic sort which cannot now be answered 
Suppose Mirabeau, with whom royalty takes deep counsel, as with a prime minister that cannot yet legally avow himself as such, had got his arrangements completed. Arrangements he has, far-stretching plans that dawn fitfully on us, by fragments, in the confused darkness. Thirty departments ready to sign loyal addresses of prescribed tenor. King carried out of Paris, but only to Compiègne and Rouen, hardly to Metz, since once for all no emigrant rabble shall take the lead in it. National Assembly consenting by dint of loyal addresses, by management, by fourth of Bouillet, to hear reason and follow thither. Was it so on these terms that Jacobinism and Mirabeau were then to grapple in their Hercules and Typhon duel? Death inevitable for the one or the other. The duel itself is determined on and sure, but on what terms? Much more, with what issue, we in vain guess. It is vague darkness all, unknown what is to be, unknown even what has already been. The giant Mirabeau walks in darkness, as we said, companionless on wild ways. What his thoughts during these months were, no record of biographer, not vague fils adoptif, will now ever disclose. To us, endeavouring to cast his horoscope, it of course remains doubly vague. There is one Herculean man, in internecine duel with him, there is monster after monster. Emigrant noblesse return, sword on thigh, vaunting of their loyalty never sullied, descending from the air like harpy swarms, with ferocity, with obscene greed. Earthward there is the typhoon of anarchy, political, religious, sprawling, hundred-headed, say, with twenty-five million heads, wide as the area of France fierce as frenzy, strong in very hunger. With these shall the serpent queller do battle continually and expect no rest. As for the king, he as usual will go wavering chameleon-like, changing colour and purpose with the colour of his environment, good for no kingly use. On one royal person, on the queen only, can Mirabeau perhaps place dependence? It is possible the greatness of this man, not unskilled too in blandishments, courtiership, and graceful adroitness, might with most legitimate sorcery fascinate the volatile queen and fix her to him. She has courage for all noble daring, an eye and a heart, the soul of Teresa's daughter. Faut-il donc, is it fated then? she passionately writes to her brother, that I, with the blood I am come of, with the sentiments I have, must live and die among such mortals? Alas, poor princess, yes. She is the only man, as Mirabeau observes, whom his majesty has about him. Of one other man Mirabeau is still surer of himself. There lies his resources, sufficient or insufficient. Dim and great to the eye of prophecy looks the future, a perpetual life and death battle, confusion from above and from below, mere confused darkness for us, with here and there some streak of faint, lurid light. We see King perhaps laid aside, not tonsured, tonsuring is out of fashion now, but say sent away any whither, with handsome annual allowance and stock of smith tools. We see a queen and dauphin, regent and minor, a queen mounted on horseback in the din of battles with Maria Mor pro rege nostro. Such a day, Mirabeau writes, may come. Din of battles, wars more than civil, confusion from above and from below. In such environment, the eye of prophecy sees Comte de Mirabeau, like some Cardinal de Retz, stormfully maintain himself, with head all devising, heart all daring, if not victorious, yet unvanquished, while life is left him. 
the specialties and issues of it no eye of prophecy can guess at it is clouds we repeat and tempestuous night and in the middle of it now visible far darting now labouring in eclipse is mirabeau indomitably struggling to be cloud compeller one can say that had mirabeau lived the history of france and of the world had been different further that the man would have needed as few men ever did the whole compass of that same art of daring art d'oser which he so prized and likewise that he above all men then living would have practised and manifested it finally that some substantiality and no empty simulacrum of a formula would have been the result realised by him a result you could have loved a result you could have hated by no likelihood a result you could only have rejected with closed lips and swept into quick forgetfulness for ever had mirabeau lived one other year End of section 24section twenty five of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point three seven death of mirabeau but mirabeau could not live another year any more than he could live another thousand years men's years are numbered and the tale of mirabeau's was now complete important or unimportant to be mentioned in world history for some centuries or not to be mentioned there beyond a day or two it matters not to peremptory fate from amid the press of ruddy busy life the pale messenger beckons silently wide-spreading interests projects salvation of french monarchies what thing soever man has on hand he must suddenly quit it all and go wert thou saving french monarchies wert thou blacking shoes on the pont neuf the most important of men cannot stay did the world's history depend on an hour that hour is not to be given whereby indeed it comes that these same would have beens are mostly a vanity and the world's history could never in the least be what it would or might or should by any manner of potentiality but simply and altogether what it is. The fierce wear and tear of such an existence has wasted out the giant oaken strength of Mirabeau, a fret and fever that keeps heart and brain on fire, excess of effort, of excitement, excess of all kinds, labour incessant almost beyond credibility. If I had not lived with him, says dumont i should never have known what a man can make of one day what things may be placed within the interval of twelve hours a day for this man was more than a week or a month is for others the mass of things he guided on together was prodigious from the scheming to the executing not a moment lost monsieur le comte said his secretary to him once what you require is impossible impossible answered he starting from his chair ne me dit jamais ces petits de mots never name to me that blockhead of a word and then the social repasts the dinner which he gives as commandant of national guards which costs five hundred pounds alas and the sirens of the opera and all the ginger that is hot in the mouth down what a course is this man hurled cannot mirabeau stop cannot he fly and save himself alive no there is a nessus shirt on this hercules he must storm and burn there without rest till he be consumed human strength never so herculean has its measure herald shadows flit pale across the fire-brain of mirabeau heralds of the pale repose while he tosses and storms straining every nerve in that sea of ambition and confusion 
there comes sombre and still a monition that for him the issue of it will be swift death in january last you might see him as president of the assembly his neck wrapped in linen cloths at the evening session there was sick heat of the blood alternate darkening and flashing in the eyesight he had to apply leeches after the morning labour and preside bandaged at parting he embraced me says dumont with an emotion i had never seen in him i am dying my friend dying as by slow fire we shall perhaps not meet again when i am gone they will know what the value of me was the miseries i have held back will burst from all sides on france sickness gives louder warning but cannot be listened to on the twenty seventh day of march proceeding towards the assembly he had to seek rest and help in friend de la marque's by the road and lay there for an hour half fainted stretched on a sofa to the assembly nevertheless he went as if in spite of destiny itself spoke loud and eager five several times then quitted the tribune for ever he steps out utterly exhausted into the tuileries gardens many people press round him as usual with applications memorials he says to the friend who was with him take me out of this and so on the last day of march seventeen ninety one endless anxious multitudes beset the rue de la chaussee d'antin incessantly inquiring within doors there in that house numbered in our time forty-two the over-wearied giant has fallen down to die crowds of all parties and kinds of all ranks from the king to the meanest man the king sends publicly twice a day to inquire privately besides from the world at large there is no end of inquiring a written bulletin is handed out every three hours is copied and circulated in the end it is printed the people spontaneously keep silence no carriage shall enter with its noise there is crowding pressure but the sister of mirabeau is reverently recognized and has free way made for her the people stand mute heart-stricken to all it seems as if a great calamity were nigh as if the last man of france who could have swayed these coming troubles lay there at hand grips with the unearthly power the silence of a whole people the wakeful toil of cabany friend and physician skills not on saturday the second day of april mirabeau feels that the last of the days has risen for him that on this day he has to depart and be no more his death is titanic as his life has been lit up for the last time in the glare of coming dissolution the mind of the man is all glowing and burning utters itself in sayings such as men long remember he longs to live yet acquiesces in death argues not with the inexorable his speech is wild and wondrous unearthly phantasms dancing now their torch dance round his soul the soul itself looking out fire radiant motionless girt together for that great hour at times comes a beam of light from him on the world he is quitting i carry in my heart the death dirge of the french monarchy the dead remains of it will now be the spoil of the factious or again when he heard the cannon fire what is characteristic too have we the achilles funeral already so likewise while some friend is supporting him yes support that head would i could bequeath it thee for the man dies as he has lived self-conscious conscious of a world looking on he gazes forth on the young spring which for him will never be summer the sun has risen he says si ce n'est pas le dieu c'est de moi son cousin germain death has mastered the outworks 
power of speech is gone, the citadel of the heart still holding out, the moribund giant, passionately, by sign, demands paper and pen, writes his passionate demand for opium to end these agonies. The sorrowful doctor shakes his head. Dormir, to sleep, writes the other, passionately pointing at it. So dies a gigantic heathen and titan, stumbling blindly, undismayed, down to his rest. At half-past eight in the morning, Dr. Petit, standing at the foot of the bed, says, Il ne souffre plus. His suffering and his working are now ended. Even so, ye silent patriot multitudes, O ye men of France, this man is rapt away from you. He has fallen suddenly, without bending, till he broke, as a tower falls, smitten by sudden lightning. His word ye shall hear no more, his guidance follow no more. The multitudes depart, heart-struck, spread the sad tidings. How touching is the loyalty of men to their sovereign man! All theatres, public amusements, close. No joyful meeting can be held in these nights. Joy is not for them. The people break in upon private dancing parties and sullenly command that they cease. Of such dancing parties apparently but two came to light, and these also have gone out. The gloom is universal. Never in this city was such sorrow for one death. Never since that old night when Louis the Twelfth departed, and the crieurs de Coch went sounding their bells and crying along the streets, Le bon roi Louis, père du peuple, est mort. The good King Louis, father of the people, is dead. King Mirabeau is now the lost king, and one may say with little exaggeration, all the people mourns for him. For three days there is low, wide moan, weeping in the National Assembly itself. The streets are all mournful, orators mounted on the bong, with large silent audience, preaching the funeral sermon of the dead. Let no coachman whip fast, distractively, with his rolling wheels, or almost at all through these groups. His traces may be cut, himself and his fair, as incurable aristocrats, hurled sulkily into the kennels. The Bornstone orators speak as it is given to them. The sonscolotic people, with its rude soul, listens eager, as men will to any sermon or sermo, when it is a spoken word meaning a thing, and not a babblement meaning no thing. In the restaurateurs of the Palais Royal, the waiter remarks, Fine weather, monsieur. Yes, my friend, answers the ancient man of letters, very fine, but Mirabeau is dead. Hoarse rhythmic threnodies come also from the throats of ballad singers, are sold on grey-white paper at a sou each. But of portraits engraved, painted, hewn, and written, of eulogies, reminiscences, biographies, nay, vaudeville, dramas, and melodramas, in all provinces of France, there will through these coming months be the due immeasurable crop, thick as the leaves of spring, nor that a tincture of burlesque might be in it, is Gobel's episcopal mondement wanting. Gus Gobel, who has just been made constitutional bishop of Paris. A mondement, wherein ça ira, alternates very strangely with nomini domini, and you are, with a grave countenance, invited to rejoice at possessing in the midst of you a body of prelates created by Mirabeau, zealous followers of his doctrine, faithful imitators of his virtues. So speaks and cackles manifold the sorrow of France, wailing articulately, inarticulately, as it can, that a sovereign man is snatched away. In the National Assembly, when difficult questions are astir, all eyes will turn mechanically to the place where Mirabeau sat, and Mirabeau is absent now. 
On the third evening of the lamentation, the fourth of April, there is solemn public funeral, such as deceased mortals seldom had. Procession of a league in length, of mourners reckoned loosely at a hundred thousand. All roofs are thronged with onlookers, all windows, lamp irons, branches of trees. Sadness is painted on every countenance, many persons weep. There is double hedge of national guards, there is national assembly in a body, Jacobin society and societies, king's ministers, municipals, and all notabilities, patriot or aristocrat. Bouillet is noticeable there with his hat on, say, hat drawn over his brow, hiding many thoughts. Slow wending, in religious silence, the procession of a league in length, under the level sun-rays, for it is five o'clock, moves and marches, with its sable plumes, itself in a religious silence, but by fits, with the muffled roll of drums, by fits with some long-drawn wail of music, and strange new clangour of trombones, and metallic dirge voice, amid the infinite hum of men. In the church of St. Eustache, there is funeral oration by Ceruti, and discharge of firearms, which bring down pieces of the plaster. Thence, forward again, to the church of St. Genevieve, which has been consecrated by supreme decree, on the spur of this time, into a pantheon for the great men of the fatherland, au grands hommes la patrie reconnaissante. Hardly at midnight is the business done, and Mirabeau left in his dark dwelling, first tenant of that fatherland's pantheon. Tenant, alas, who inhabits but at will, and shall be cast out. For in these days of convulsion and disjection, not even the dust of the dead is permitted to rest. Voltaire's bones are by and by to be carried from their stolen grave in the Abbey of Cellier to an eager stealing grave in Paris, his birth city, all mortals processioning and perorating there, cars drawn by eight white horses, goadsters in classical costume with fillets and wheat ears enough though the weather is of the wettest. Evangelist Jean-Jacques, too, as is most proper, must be dug up from Hermenonville and processioned with pomp, with sensibility, to the pantheon of the fatherland, he and others, while again Mirabeau, we say, is cast forth from it, happily incapable of being replaced, and rests now irrecognisable, reburied hastily at dead of night in the central part of the churchyard Sainte Catherine, in the suburb Saint Marceau, to be disturbed no further. So blazes out, far seen, a man's life, and becomes ashes and a caput mortuum in this world pyre which we name French Revolution. Not the first that consumed itself there, nor by thousands and many millions the last. A man who had swallowed all formulas, who in these strange times and circumstances felt called to live titanically, and also to die so. As he, for his part, had swallowed all formulas, what formula is there, never so comprehensive, that will express truly the plus and the minus? give us the accurate net result of him. There is hitherto none such. Moralities not a few must shriek condemnatory over this Mirabeau. The morality by which he could be judged has not yet got uttered in the speech of men. We shall say this of him again, that he is a reality and no simulacrum, a living son of nature, our general mother, not a hollow artifice and mechanism of conventionalities, son of nothing, brother to nothing, in which little word let the earnest man, walking sorrowful in a world mostly of stuffed clothes suits that chatter and grin meaningless on him,
quite ghastly to the earnest soul. Think what significance there is. Of men who, in such sense, are alive and see with eyes, the number is now not great. It may be well if, in this huge French Revolution itself, with its all-developing fury, we find some three. Mortals driven rapid, we find, sputtering the acridest logic, bearing their breast to the battle hail, their neck to the guillotine, of whom it is so painful to say that they too are still in good part manufactured formalities, not facts but hearsays. Honour to the strong man in these ages who has shaken himself loose of shams and is something. For in the way of being worthy, the first condition surely is that one be. Let Kant cease, at all risks and at all costs. Till Kant cease, nothing else can begin. Of human criminals in these centuries, writes the moralist, I find but one unforgivable, the quack, hateful to God, as divine Dante sings, and to the enemies of God, adios piacente ed anemici sui. But whoever will, with sympathy, which is the first essential towards insight, look at this questionable Mirabeau, may find that there lay verily in him, as the basis of all, a sincerity, a great free earnestness, nay, call it honesty, for the man did before all things see, with that clear flashing vision, into what was, into what existed as fact, and did with his wild heart follow that and no other, whereby on what ways soever he travels and struggles, often enough falling, he is still a brother man, Hate him not, thou canst not hate him. Shining through such toil and tarnish, and now victorious effulgent, and oftenest struggling eclipsed. The light of genius itself is in this man, which was never yet base and hateful, but at worst was lamentable, lovable with pity. They say that he was ambitious, that he wanted to be minister. It is most true. And was he not simply the one man in France who could have done any good as minister? Not vanity alone, not pride alone, far from that. Wild burstings of affection were in this great heart, of fierce lightning, and soft dew of pity. So sunk, bemired in wretchedest defacements, it may be said of him, like the Magdalene of old that he loved much. His father, the harshest of old crabbed men, he loved with warmth, with veneration. Be it that his falls and follies are manifold, as himself often lamented even with tears. Alas, is not the life of every such man already a poetic tragedy, made up of fate and of one's own deservings, of schicksal und eigene Schuld? full of the elements of pity and fear. This brother man, if not epic for us, is tragic, if not great, is large, large in his qualities, world large in his destinies, whom other men, recognising him as such, may through long times remember, and draw nigh to examine and consider. These, in their several dialects, will say of him and sing of him, till the right thing be said, and so the formula that can judge him be no longer an undiscovered one. Here, then, the wild Gabrielle Honoré drops from the tissue of our history, not without a tragic farewell. He is gone, the flower of the wild Riquetti or Arigetti kindred which seems as if in him, with one last effort, it had done its best, and then expired or sunk down to the undistinguished level. Crabbed old Marquis Mirabeau, the friend of men, sleeps sound. The Bay Mirabeau, worthy uncle, will soon die forlorn, alone. Barrel Mirabeau, 
already gone across the Rhine, his regiment of emigrants will drive nigh desperate. Barrel Mirabeau, says a biographer of his, went indignantly across the Rhine and drilled emigrant regiments. But as he sat one morning in his tent, sour of stomach, doubtless, and of heart, meditating in Tartarian humour on the turn things took, a certain captain or subaltern demanded admittance on business. Such captain is refused, but again demands, with refusal, and then again, till Colonel Viscount Barrel Mirabeau, blazing up into a mere burning brandy barrel, clutches his sword and tumbles out on this canaille of an intruder, alas, on the canaille of an intruder's sword's point, who had drawn with swift dexterity, and dies, and the newspapers name it apoplexy and alarming accident. So die the Mirabeaus. New Mirabeaus one hears not of. The wild kindred, as we said, is gone out with this its greatest, as families and kindreds sometimes do, producing, after long ages of unnoted notability, some living quintessence of all the qualities they had, to flame forth as a man world-noted, after whom they rest as if exhausted, the sceptre passing to others. The chosen lass of the Mirabeaus is gone. The chosen man of France is gone. It was he who shook old France from its basis, and as if with his single hand has held it toppling there, still unfallen. What things depended on that one man? He is as a ship suddenly shivered on sunk rocks. Much swims on the waste waters, far from help. End of section 25section 26 of the french revolution volume 2 by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry book 2.4 varenne chapter 2.4 1 easter at saint cloud the french monarchy may now therefore be considered as in all human probability lost as struggling henceforth in blindness as well as weakness, the last light of reasonable guidance having gone out. What remains of resources, their poor majesties will waste still further in uncertain loitering and wavering. Mirabeau himself had to complain that they only gave him half confidence and always had some plan within his plan. Had they fled frankly with him, to Rouen or anywhither long ago. They may fly now with chance immeasurably lessened, which will go on lessening towards absolute zero. Decide, O oh Queen, poor Louis can decide nothing. Execute this flight project, or at least abandon it. Correspondence with Bouillet there has been enough. What profits consulting and hypothesis while all around is in fierce activity of practice. The rustic sits waiting till the river run dry. Alas, with you, it is not a common river, but a Nile inundation, snow melting in the unseen mountains, till all, and you where you sit, be submerged. Many things invite to flight. The voice journals invite. Royalist journals proudly hinting it as a threat. Patriot journals rapidly denouncing it as a terror. Mother society waxing more and more emphatic invites. So emphatic that, as was prophesied, Lafayette and your limited patriots have ere long to branch off from her and form themselves into Foyant, with infinite public controversy. The victory in which, doubtful though it look, will remain with the unlimited mother. Moreover, ever since the day of poniards, we have seen unlimited patriotism openly equipping itself with arms. Citizens denied activity, which is facetiously made to signify a certain weight of purse, cannot buy blue uniforms and be guardsmen. But man is greater than blue cloth. 
man can fight, if need be, in multiform cloth, or even almost without cloth, as sans culotte. So pikes continued to be hammered, whether those dirks of improved structure with barbs be meant for the West India market or not meant. Men beat the wrong way, their ploughshares into swords. Is there not what we may call an Austrian committee, committee autrichien, sitting daily and nightly in the Tuileries? Patriotism by vision and suspicion knows it too well. If the king fly, will there not be aristocrat Austrian invasion, butchery, replacement of feudalism, wars more than civil? The hearts of men are saddened and maddened. Dissident priests likewise give trouble enough. Expelled from their parish churches, where constitutional priests, elected by the public, have replaced them, these unhappy persons resort to convents of nuns, or other such receptacles, and there, on Sabbath, collecting assemblages of anti-constitutional individuals who have grown devout all on a sudden, they worship, or pretend to worship, in their straight-laced contumacious manner, to the scandal of patriotism. Dissident priests, passing along with their sacred wafer for the dying, seem wishful to be massacred in the streets, wherein patriotism will not gratify them. Slighter palm of martyrdom, however, shall not be denied. Martyrdom not of massacre, yet of fustigation. At the refectory places of worship, patriot men appear, patriot women with strong hazel wands which they apply. Shut thy eyes, O reader, see not this misery, peculiar to these later times, of martyrdom without sincerity, with only cant and contumacy. A dead Catholic church is not allowed to lie dead. No, it is galvanized into the detestablest death life, whereat humanity, we say, shuts its eyes. For the patriot women take their hazel wands and fustigate amid laughter of bystanders with alacrity. Broad bottom of priests, alas, nuns too reversed, and cotillon retroussé. The National Guard does what it can. Municipality invokes the principles of toleration, grants dissident worshippers the church of the Théatin, promising protection. But it is to no purpose. At the door of that Théatin church appears a placard and suspended atop, like plebeian consular fasces, a bundle of rods. The principles of toleration must do the best they may, but no dissident man shall worship contumaciously. There is a plebiscitum to that effect, which, though unspoken, is like the laws of the Medes and Persians. Dissident contumacious priests ought not to be harboured, even in private, by any man. The club of the Cordelier openly denounces Majesty himself as doing it. Many things invite to flight but probably this thing above all others, that it has become impossible. On the 15th of April, notice is given that His Majesty, who has suffered much from Qatar lately, will enjoy the spring weather for a few days at saint Cloud. Out at saint Cloud, Wishing to celebrate his Easter, his pack or Pash, there, with refractory anti-constitutional dissidents? Wishing rather to make off for Compiègne, and thence to the frontiers. As were, in good sooth, perhaps feasible, or would once have been, nothing but some two chasseurs attending you, chasseurs easily corrupted. It is a pleasant possibility, execute it or not. Men say there are thirty thousand chevaliers of the poniard lurking in the woods there. Lurking in the woods, and thirty thousand, for the human imagination is not fettered. But now, how easily might these, dashing out on Lafayette, snatch off the hereditary representative, and roll away with him, after the manner of a whirlblast, whither they listed? Enough. It were well the king did not go. Lafayette is forewarned and forearmed. But indeed, is the risk his only, or his and all France's? Monday the 18th of April is come. 
the Easter journey to St. Clos shall take effect. National Guard has got its orders. A first division, as advanced guard, has even marched and probably arrived. His Majesty's Maison Bouche, they say, is all busy stewing and frying at St. Clos, the King's dinner not far from ready there. About one o'clock, the royal carriage with its eight royal blacks shoots stately into the Place du Carousel, draws up to receive its royal burden. But hark, from the neighbouring church of St. Roche, the tocsin begins ding-donging. Is the king stolen then? He is going, gone? Multitudes of persons crowd the carousel, but royal carriage still stands there, and by heaven's strength shall stand. Lafayette comes up with aide-de-camp and oratory, pervading the groups. Taisez-vous, answer the groups. The king shall not go. Monsieur appears at an upper window. Ten thousand voices bray and shriek. Nous ne voulons pas que le roi parte. Their majesties have mounted. Crack go the whips. But twenty patriot arms have seized each of the eight bridles. There is rearing, rocking, vociferation, not the smallest headway. In vain does Lafayette fret, indignant, and perorate and strive. Patriots, in the passion of terror, bellow round the royal carriage. It is one bellowing sea of patriot terror run frantic. Will royalty fly off towards Austria, like a lit rocket, towards endless conflagration of civil war? Stop it, ye patriots, in the name of heaven. Rude voices passionately apostrophize royalty itself. Usher, Compon, and other the like official persons, pressing forward with help or advice, are clutched by the sashes and hurled and whirled in a confused, perilous manner, so that Her Majesty has to plead passionately from the carriage window. Order cannot be heard, cannot be followed. National guards know not how to act. Centre grenadiers of the Observatoire Battalion are there, not on duty, alas, in quasi-mutiny, speaking rude, disobedient words, threatening the mounted guards with sharp shot if they hurt the people. Lafayette mounts and dismounts, runs haranguing, panting, on the verge of despair. For an hour and three quarters, seven quarters of an hour by the Tuileries clock, desperate Lafayette will open a passage, were it by the cannon's mouth, if his majesty will order. Their majesties, counselled to it by royalist friends, by patriot foes, dismount, and retire in with heavy indignant heart, giving up the enterprise. Maison Bouche may eat that cooked dinner themselves. His Majesty shall not see saint Clos this day, or any day. The pathetic fable of imprisonment in one's own palace has become a sad fact, then. Majesty complains to assembly. Municipality deliberates, proposes to petition or address. Sections respond with sullen brevity of negation. Lafayette flings down his commission appears in civic pepper-and-salt frock, and cannot be flattered back again, not in less than three days, and by unheard-of entreaty, National Guards kneeling to him and declaring that it is not sycophancy, that they are free men kneeling there to the Statue of Liberty. For the rest, those centre grenadiers of the Observatoire are disbanded, yet indeed are re-enlisted, all but fourteen, under a new name and with new quarters. The king must keep his Easter in Paris, meditating much on this singular posture of things, but as good as determined now to fly from it, desire being whetted by difficulty. End of section 26section twenty seven of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point four two easter at paris for above a year ever since march seventeen ninety it would seem there has hovered a project of flight before the royal mind 
and ever and anon has been condensing itself into something like a purpose but this or the other difficulty always vaporized it again it seems so full of risks perhaps of civil war itself above all it cannot be done without effort somnolent laziness will not serve to fly if not in a leather vash one must verily stir himself better to adopt that constitution of theirs execute it so as to show all men that it is inexecutable better or not so good surely it is easier to all difficulties you need only say there is a lion in the path behold your constitution will not act for a somnolent person it requires no effort to counterfeit death as dame de Stael and friends of liberty can see the king's government long doing faisons le mort nay now when desire whetted by difficulty has brought the matter to a head and the royal mind no longer halts between two what can come of it grant that poor louis were safe with bouillet what on the whole could he look for there exasperated tickets of entry answer much all but cold reason answers little almost nothing is not loyalty a law of nature ask the tickets of entry is not love of your king and even death for him the glory of all frenchmen except these few democrats let democrat constitution builders see what they will do without their keystone and france rend its hair having lost the hereditary representative thus will king louis fly one sees not reasonably towards what as a maltreated boy shall we say who having a stepmother rushes sulky into the wide world and will wring the paternal heart poor louis escapes from known unsupportable evils to an unknown mixture of good and evil coloured by hope he goes as rabelais did when dying to seek a great maybe je vais chercher un grand peut-être as not only the sulky boy but the wise grown man is obliged to do so often in emergencies for the rest there is still no lack of stimulants and stepdame maltreatments to keep one's resolution at the due pitch factious disturbance ceases not as indeed how can they unless authoritatively conjured in a revolt which is by nature bottomless if the ceasing of faction be the price of the king's somnolence he may awake when he will and take wing remark in any case what somersets and contortions a dead catholicism is making skilfully galvanized hideous and even piteous to behold durant and dissident with their shaved crowns argue frothing everywhere or are ceasing to argue and stripping for battle in paris was scourging while need continued contrariwise in the morbihan of brittany without scourging armed peasants are up roused by pulpit drum they know not why general du Maurier, who has got missioned thitherward finds all in sour heat of darkness finds also that explanation and conciliation will still do much but again consider this that his holiness pius the sixth has seen good to excommunicate bishop tolleron surely we will say then considering it there is no living or dead church in the earth that has not the indubitablest right to excommunicate Talleyrand. Pope Pius has right and might in his way, but truly so likewise has Father Adam, ci devant, Marquis Sal Rouge, in his way. Behold, therefore, on the 4th of May, in the Palais Royal, a mixed, loud sounding multitude, in the middle of whom Father Adam, bull voiced Saint Rouge, in white hat towers visible and audible with him it is said walks journalist gorsa walk many others of the washed sort for no authority will interfere pius the sixth 
with his plush and tiara and power of the keys, they bear aloft, of natural size, made of lath and combustible gum. Huayu, the king's friend, is born too in effigy, with a pile of newspaper, king's friends, condemned numbers of the ami du roi, fit fuel of the sacrifice. Speeches are spoken, a judgment is held, a doom proclaimed, audible in bull voice towards the four winds, and thus amid great shouting the holocaust is consummated under the summer sky, and our lath and gum holiness, with the attendant victims, mounts up in flame, and sinks down in ashes. A decomposed pope, and right or might, among all the parties, has better or worse accomplished itself as it could. But on the whole, reckoning from Martin Luther in the marketplace of Wittenberg to Marquis saint Rouge in this Palais Royal of Paris, what a journey have we gone! Into what strange territories has it carried us? No authority can now interfere. Nay, religion herself, mourning for such things, may after all ask, what have I to do with them? In such extraordinary manner does dead Catholicism, Somerset and Caper, skilfully galvanised. For does the reader inquire into the subject matter of controversy in this case, what the difference between orthodoxy or my doxy and heterodoxy or thy doxy might here be? My doxy is that an august national assembly can equalise the extent of bishoprics, that an equalised bishop, his creed and formularies being left quite as they were, can swear fidelity to king, law and nation, and so become a constitutional bishop. Thy doxy, if thou be dissident, is that he cannot, but that he must become an accursed thing. Human ill-nature needs but some homoousian iota, or even the pretense of one, and will flow copiously through the eye of a needle. Thus always must mortals go jargoning and fuming, quote, and like the ancient Stoics in their porches, with fierce dispute maintain their churches, end quote. This auto da fe of saint Rouge was on the 4th of May, 1791. Royalty sees it, but says nothing. End of section 27section twenty eight of the french revolution volume two by thomas carlyle this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry chapter two point four three count fersen royalty in fact should by this time be far on with its preparations unhappily much preparation is needful could a hereditary representative be carried in leather vash how easy were it! But it is not so. New clothes are needed, as usual, in all epic transactions, were it in the grimmest Iron Ages. Consider Queen Chimhilde, with her sixty seamstresses, in that Iron Nibelungen song. No queen can stir without new clothes. Therefore, now, Dame Compon whisks assiduous to this mantua-maker and to that, and there is clipping of frocks and gowns, upper clothes and under, great and small, such a clipping and sewing as might have been dispensed with. Moreover, Her Majesty cannot go a step any whither without her nécessaire, dear nécessaire of inlaid ivory and rosewood, cunningly devised, which holds perfumes, toilet implements, infinite small queen-like furnitures, necessary to terrestrial life not without a cost of some five hundred louis, of much precious time, and difficult hoodwinking, which does not blind. Can this same necessary of life be forwarded by the Flanders carriers, never to get to hand? All which, you would say, augurs ill for the prospering of the enterprise, but the whims of women and queens must be humoured. Bouillet, on his side, is making a fortified camp at Montmédy, gathering Royal Allemand and all manner of other German and true French troops thither 
to watch the Austrians. His Majesty will not cross the frontiers unless on compulsion. Neither shall the emigrants be much employed, hateful as they are, to all people. Nor shall old war god Broglie have any hand in the business, but solely our brave Bouillet, to whom, on the day of meeting, a marshal's baton shall be delivered by a rescued king amid the shouting of all the troops. In the meanwhile, Paris being so suspicious, were it not perhaps good to write your foreign ambassadors an ostensible constitutional letter desiring all kings and men to take heed that King Louis loves the constitution, that he has voluntarily sworn, and does again swear, to maintain the same, and will reckon those his enemies who affect to say otherwise. Such a constitutional circular is dispatched by couriers, is communicated confidentially to the assembly, and printed in all newspapers, with the finest effect. Simulation and dissimulation mingle extensively in human affairs. We observe, however, that Count Fersen is often using his ticket of entry, which surely he has clear right to do. A gallant soldier and Swede, devoted to this fair queen, as indeed the highest Swede now is. Has not King Gustave, famed fiery Chevalier du Nord, sworn himself by the old laws of chivalry, her knight? He will descend on fire wings of Swedish musketry and deliver her from these foul dragons, if, alas, the assassin's pistol intervene not. But in fact, Count Fersen does seem a likely young soldier, of alert, decisive ways. He circulates widely, seen, unseen, and has business on hand. Also, Colonel the Duc de Choiseul, nephew of Choiseul the Great, of Choiseul the now deceased. He and Engineer Gugla are passing and repassing between Metz and the Tuileries, and letters go in cipher one of them a most important one, hard to decipher, Fersen having ciphered it in haste. As for Duke de Villequier, he is gone ever since the day of poniards, but his apartment is useful for Her Majesty. On the other side, poor Commandant Gouvion, watching at the Tuileries, second in national command, sees several things hard to interpret. It is the same Gouvion, who sat long months ago at the town hall, gazing helpless into that insurrection of women, motionless as the brave stabled steed when conflagration rises, till Usher Maillard snatched his drum. Sincerer patriot there is not, but many a shiftier. He, if dame compon, gossip credibly, is paying some similitude of love court to a certain false chambermaid of the palace, who betrays much to him. The necessaire, the clothes, the packing of the jewels, could he understand it when betrayed? Helpless Gouvion gazes with sincere glassy eyes into it, stirs up his sentries to vigilance, walks restless to and fro, and hopes the best. But on the whole, one finds that, in the second week of June, Colonel de Choiseul is privately in Paris, having come to see his children. Also that Fersen has got a stupendous new coach built, of the kind named Berlin, done by the first artists, according to a model. They bring it home to him, in Choiseul's presence the two friends taking a proof drive in it along the streets in meditative mood, then send it up to Madame Sullivan's in the Rue de Clichy, far north, to wait there till wanted. Apparently a certain Russian Baroness de Korff, with waiting women, valley, and two children, will travel homewards with some state, in whom these young military gentlemen take interest. A passport has been procured for her, and much assistance shown with coach-builders and such like. So helpful, polite, are young military men. Fersen has likewise purchased a chaise fit for two, at least for two waiting-maids. Further, certain necessary horses. One would say he is himself quitting France, not without outlay. 
We observe finally that their majesties, heaven willing, will assist at Corpus Christi Day, this blessed summer solstice, in Assumption Church here at Paris, to the joy of all the world. For which same day, moreover, brave Bouillet at Metz, as we find, has invited a party of friends to dinner, but indeed is gone from home in the interim over to Montmédy. These are of the phenomena or visual appearances of this wide-working terrestrial world, which truly is all phenomenal, what they call spectral, and never rests at any moment. One never at any moment can know why. On Monday night, the 20th of June, 1791, about 11 o'clock, there is many a hackney coach and glass coach, carrosse de remise, still rumbling or at rest on the streets of Paris. But of all glass coaches, we recommend this to thee, O reader, which stands drawn up in the Rue de l'Echelle, hard by the carousel and outgate of the Tuileries, in the Rue de l'Echelle that then was, opposite Ronsin, the saddler's door, as if waiting for a fair there. Not long does it wait. A hooded dame with two hooded children has issued from Villequier's door, where no sentry walks, into the Tuileries Court of Princes, into the Carousel, into the Rue de l'Echelle, where the glass coachman readily admits them, and again waits. Not long, another dame, likewise hooded or shrouded, leaning on a servant, issues in the same manner, by the glass coachman cheerfully admitted. Whither go so many dames? "'Tis his majesty's coucher, majesty just gone to bed, "'and all the palace world is retiring home. "'But the glass coachman still waits, "'his fare seemingly incomplete. "'By and by we note a thick-set individual "'in round hat and peruke, arm and arm with some servant, "'seemingly of the runner or courier sort. "'He also issues through Villequier's door, starts a shoe-buckle as he passes one of the sentries, stoops down to clasp it again, is, however, by the glass coachman still more cheerfully admitted. And now is his fare complete? Not yet. The glass coachman still waits, alas, and the false chambermaid has warned Gouvion that she thinks the royal family will fly this very night, and Gouvion, distrusting his own glazed eyes, has sent express for Lafayette and Lafayette's carriage, flaring with lights, rolls this moment through the inner arch of the carousel, where a lady shaded in broad gypsy hat and leaning on the arm of a servant, also of the runner or courier sort, stands aside to let it pass, and has even the whim to touch a spoke of it with her badine, light little magic rod which she calls badine, such as the beautiful then wore. The flare of Lafayette's carriage rolls past. All is found quiet in the court of princes, sentries at their post, Majesty's apartments closed in smooth rest. Your false chambermaid must have been mistaken. Watch thou, Gouvion, with Argus vigilance, for of a truth treachery is within these walls. But where is the lady that stood aside in gypsy hat and touched the wheel spoke with her badine? O oh, reader, that lady that touched the wheel spoke was the Queen of France. She has issued safe through that inner arch into the carousel itself, but not into the Rue de l'Echelle. Thurried by the rattle and re-encounter, she took the right hand, not the left. Neither she nor her courier knows Paris. He indeed is no courier, but a loyal, stupid, ci-devant bodyguard, disguised as one. They are off quite wrong over the Pont Royal and river, roaming disconsolate in the Rue du Bac, far from the glass coachman who still waits, waits with flutter of heart, with thoughts which he must button close up under his Jarvie surtout. Midnight clangs from all the city steeples. One precious hour has been spent so. Most mortals are asleep. The glass coachman waits. And what mood? A brother Jarvie drives up, enters into conversation, is answered cheerfully in Jarvie dialect. 
the brothers of the whip exchange a pinch of snuff, decline drinking together, and part with good night. Be the heavens blessed. Here at length is the queen lady in gypsy hat, safe after perils. She has had to inquire her way. She too is admitted. Her courier jumps aloft, as the other, who is also a disguised bodyguard, has done. And now, O glass coachman of a thousand, Count Fersen, for the reader sees it as thou, drive. Dust shall not stick to the hoofs of Fersen. Crack, crack. The glass coach rattles, and every soul breathes lighter. But is Fersen on the right road? Northeastward, to the barrier of Saint Martin and Metz Highway, thither where we bound, and lo, he drives right northward. The royal individual, in round hat and peruke, sits astonished. But right or wrong, there is no remedy. Crack, crack, we go incessant through the slumbering city. Seldom, since Paris rose out of mud, or the long-haired kings went in bullock carts, was there such a drive. Mortals on each hand of you, close by, stretched out horizontal, dormant, and we alive and quaking. Crack, crack, through the Rue de Grammont, across the boulevard, up the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. These windows, all silent, of number 42, were Mirabeau's. Towards the barrier, not of Saint-Martin, but of Clichy, on the utmost north. Patience, ye royal individuals. Fersen understands what he is about. Passing up the Rue de Clichy, he alights for one moment at Madame Sullivan's. Did Count Fersen's coachman get the Baroness de Corf's new Berlin? Gone with it an hour and a half ago, grumbles responsive the drowsy porter. C'est bien. Yes, it is well. Though had not such hour and a half been lost, it were still better. Forth, therefore, O Fersen, fast by the barrier de Clichy, then eastward along the outward boulevard, what horses and whipcord can do. Thus Fersen drives through the ambrosial night. Sleeping Paris is now all on the right hand of him, silent except for some snoring hum. And now he is eastward as far as the barrier de Saint-Martin, looking earnestly for Baroness de Corf's Berlin. This heaven's Berlin he at length does descry, drawn up with its six horses, his own German coachman waiting on the box. Right, thou good German, now haste, whither thou knowest. And as for us of the glass coach, haste too, oh haste, much time is already lost. The august glass coach fair, six insides, hastily packs itself into the new Berlin, two bodyguard couriers behind. The glass coach itself is turned adrift, it heads towards the city, to wander whither it lists, and we found next morning tumbled in a ditch. But Fersen is on the new box, with its brave new hammer-cloths, flourishing his whip. He bolts forward towards Bondi. There a third and final bodyguard courier of ours ought surely to be, with post-horses ready ordered. There, likewise, ought that purchased chaise with the two waiting-maids and their bandboxes to be, whom also Her Majesty could not travel without. Swift, thou deft Fersen, and may the heavens turn it well. Once more, by heaven's blessing, it is all well. Here is the sleeping hamlet of Bondi, chaise with waiting-women, horses all ready, and postilions with their churn boots, impatient in the dewy dawn. Brief harnessing done, the postilions with their churn boots vault into the saddles, brandish circularly their little noisy whips. Fersen, under his jarvy surtout, bends in lowly silent reverence of adieu. Royal hands wave speechless in inexpressible response. Baroness de Corf's Berlin, with the royalty of France, bounds off, forever as it proved. Deft Fersen dashes obliquely northward, through the country, towards Bougre. Gains Bougre, finds his German coachman and chariot waiting there, cracks off and drives undiscovered into unknown space. A deft, active man, we say. What he undertook to do is nimbly and successfully done.
and so the royalty of France is actually fled. This precious night, the shortest of the year, it flies and drives. Baroness de Corf is at bottom Dame de Tourzel, governess of the royal children. She, who came hooded with the two hooded little ones, little Dauphin, little Madame Royale, known long afterwards as Duchesse d'Angoulême. Baroness de Corf's waiting maid is the queen in gypsy hat. The royal individual in round hat and peruke, he is valet for the time being. That other hooded dame, styled travelling companion, is kind Sister Elizabeth. She had sworn long since, when the insurrection of women was, that only death should part her and them. And so they rush there, not too impetuously, through the wood of Bondy, over a Rubicon in their own and France's history. Great, though the future is all vague. If we reach Bouillet, if we do not reach him? O oh, Louis, and this all round thee is the great slumbering earth, and overhead the great watchful heaven, the slumbering wood of Bondy, where long-haired Childeric do nothing was struck through with iron, not unreasonably. These peaked stone towers are Renzi, towers of wicked Dorleon. All slumbers, save the multiplex rustle of our new Berlin, loose-skirted scarecrow of a herb merchant, with his ass and early greens, toilsomely plodding, seems the only creature we meet. But right ahead, the great northeast sends up evermore his grey brindled dawn. From dewy branch, birds here and there, with short deep warble, salute the coming sun. Stars fade out, and galaxies. Street lamps of the city of God. The universe, O oh my brothers, is flinging wide its portals for the levy of the great high king. Thou, poor King Louis, fairest nevertheless, as mortals do, towards orient lands of hope. And the Tuileries, with, with its levies, and France and the earth itself, is but a larger kind of dog hutch, occasionally going rabid. End of section 28